Hey everyone, welcome to the Acquisitions Masterclass. My name is Moan Pobero, I'm the founder of Acquisitions.com and we're on a mission to connect people through acquisitions. I'm super excited to get you going, so let's get right to it. So, this entire Masterclass is all about pulling back the curtain and showing you literally the black box secret of the wealthy elite people out there. Because here's the facts that few actually know. If you look at some of the big guys that you're probably following anywhere from the real ones like Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, or the less real ones like Christian Grey in Fifty Shades of Grey, or uh, the main character from Pretty Woman, the movie, right? Or even people like Shark Tank, or if you're familiar with the TV show The Prophet, right? Think about what those guys are doing to make their money. They're doing deals, they're doing acquisitions, they're buying companies, and I'm going to talk more about that. But that's how the richest people make their money. I'm going to dive into some more of the details, but everyone's following Elon Musk right now. Most people don't know that he didn't start Tesla from scratch. He went into an existing business, and that's what made him... Uh, as of this video, the fourth richest person in the world, right? So super fascinating. We're going to talk to more case studies, but uh, Zuckerberg and Facebook, right? They bought Instagram, they bought WhatsApp. There's so many different things. Even Google, they bought a lot of the companies that are now making them the most money uh, for their company. Like the, if you look at the AdWords or AdSense, which is basically uh, what makes Google most of their, their money. Those were companies that they bought and then basically rebranded. So you need to understand that what we're going to go through in this challenge is not just, you know, entry level entrepreneurship. This is what the real richest people in the world are doing. And we're going to show you how to do that on any level that you want to play at. There's no limits and there's no, there is a minimum size of a business that I'm going to talk to uh, and suggest you to start with. Uh, but you can do it on a smaller scale and at a very larger scale. There's literally no limits to where you can take it. And when you understand the world of acquisitions, you really step into being the decision maker, being the visionary and, you know, almost being the kind of like the coolest guy in the room. When you're looking at someone like Richard Branson, the guy owns equity in hundreds of businesses, right? He's doing deals. So that's the person and obviously everyone's looking at him and, uh, having in their mind his pictures or videos on a jet ski, right? So also, um, yeah, the one who worked the most, it's going to make you look like the one who worked the most, but looks like he's also having fun all the time because work is fun in the end of the day. Fun is work, meeting investors, doing deals all over the world, becoming kind of like a, you know, a world citizen, uh, which I can share with you more of kind of like what it looks like for me lately. Um, this is what's possible in this journey. It's doing fun things. It's being involved with people, with creative people, with making decisions, setting the vision, you know, versus doing menial, sometimes repeatable stuff. Um, I really want to share with you the excitement of what's possible in this space. Um, yeah, and because this stuff is so powerful, once you master this skill, it will really allow you to give back and make the world a better place, as cheesy as it sounds, versus, you know, counting on governments or your boss or your one business only, um, or the state of the economy, or the price of Bitcoin, or whatever it is for you that you're counting on to build your wealth, right? Um, all the people that I have ever talked to, and I really try to get their motive on why they're doing what they're doing, in the end of the day, I found out that it comes down to impact. Like, yeah, you want to grow as much as possible. You want to become the best version that you can be. But in the end of the day, when you have enough money, it comes down to impact, to connection with good people and to, to have the option to have enough impact on your community or on the world or whatever it is for you. And this is the skill that can you really get you there. And that's our goal here in the other day. It's really to connect between all of you um, and really help here a much larger community together while doing, in my opinion, the most enjoyable thing in business, which is acquisitions. Uh, because, I mean, mark my words, there is no better way to build wealth rather than doing acquisitions. And if you don't see it right now, in the end of this challenge, I can guarantee that you will and you'll get excited about getting to it right away. 
So if you're looking for growth, if it's personally, if it's with your money situation, income, your lifestyle, your impact, basically income, impact, lifestyle, it's all here. All you're looking for, you're in the right place. So, you know, stay focused in this challenge. Don't go out there like, you know, close your notifications on your WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram. And for once, stay focused. Most people can't focus for more than 20, 30 minutes on one thing. And I'm telling you, here, it's worth it. It's freaking worth it. Because look at the people in the pictures. That's who you're going to compare yourself into. That's the standard that you're going to set yourself into. Um, And this challenge will really allow you to step up into that level, into that position. Where you could talk to those kind of people at the same eye level. Because no one is above you, no one is below you. And I think this is... The opportunity to show you how it's possible. Uh, we're going to dive into a whole different side of business and entrepreneurship that until recently, again, only wealthy people knew about. So yeah, let's get to uh, next. And yeah, and that's not all. Just look at the richest companies in existence right now. They've understood how business world has changed, right? They're thinking differently than what everyone is telling you. And most people don't even realize that, right? I mentioned it just a little bit, but look at the biggest companies in the world, how they're growing right now. They're growing through acquisitions, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, whatever company you're looking at. They're acquiring either new product lines, customers, customer lines, um, new talent, basically new companies with amazing team members. They're not just starting new divisions from scratch. They're buying stuff that already has a proven wealth generation system and already has customers and amazing teams in place. If it's an amazing technology or whatever it is for them that they're looking for. The best practices in their sectors. And let me share with you maybe a few examples so you understand what I'm talking about. Right, so if you look here at Google, right, and if you notice with all of this that I'm going to show you here, see how much they prefer buying businesses, which is the left number, right? The number number of the left here, the 233, um, compared to investing, the number on the right. All right, look at, think about the Google. They bought YouTube. They bought the AI uh, powerhouse, DeepMind. Apple, they bought Siri and Beats. We have Amazon. That bought Whole Foods and Ring. Um, and obviously we have Facebook that bought uh, Instagram and WhatsApp. Microsoft bought LinkedIn, Skype. Those are some of the famous acquisitions that they did. So yeah, if you stay with me throughout this entire masterclass experience, it's safe to say that you'll be learning the most lucrative entrepreneurial skill in the world. Uh, because you learn how to think and behave just like the wealthy elite to do. And it's really a way, a new way that is different than what most people have told you about entrepreneurship and growing wealth. In fact, this way of thinking has been kept for secret from most people and still is. Because the truth is that of what we see in the economy right now, I mean, very few know the truth about the power of acquisitions. And I think the next few years will get more people into acquisitions than new people into starting business. And that's my mission here. I want to get people excited about this space. I think this can really change the world of an entrepreneur who's open to what's possible here. I know my vision, my mind, I know I think that buying businesses will be the new startup world. And growing by acquisitions will be the the next best marketing tool, right? Like people right now selling you to use Google ads or use Facebook ads. I think acquisition is going to be the next thing for it, even for small businesses. Because for once, it will bring, bring collaboration in the world and growth unlike anything out there. And I think the world needs that more than ever. The collaboration with other small businesses just like yours. Right. And if you're not a business owner yet, I think that's the best way to become an entrepreneur and to become someone with power who can have impact on making this world a more connected and collaborative world and a better place, as cheesy as it sounds. Right. Um, And very few at this point know about acquisitions. That's why I'm not 
scared sharing this this way for free all right i mean look at the books out there 99 percent of the books seminar courses whatever will tell you hey go and start a business go and look for product market fits i'm telling you screw that let's keep that face let's go into businesses that already have product market fit that already have clients that already have revenues and cash flow and profits and and inventory and and clients and good talent and everything you're looking for in a business and obviously already an amazing product with proven track record and those things takes time um in the end of the day people believe lies right and i call them level one lies and level two lies so level one lies are lies about the possibility of any individual actually doing acquisitions themselves overall right people don't even know they can do acquisitions they don't trust themselves they don't know if it's, it's even possible right and level two lies are misconceptions about how individuals should do acquisitions so some people know about this space of acquisitions but they've been told some lies or believed some lies on how sh they should do acquisitions now you may not have been taught or told all of this so let's see if you recognize some of those things so level one lies one you need a degree all right another thing is you need to be a business owner doing millions already before you even think about the acquisitions some people will tell you you need to be an accountant and go to have you got to have an mba or whatever degree um you got to be expert in financials right a lot of the people will tell you that um some will tell you, you got to have a law degree you got to be a lawyer and know how to do contracts otherwise you can't do acquisitions uh, some people tell you, you gotta have millions in the bank already you gotta first of all start a business from scratch sell it make a few million dollars in cash after taxes and only then maybe do investments and acquisitions all right um, some people will tell you you need an amazing network or rich parents and only then you might be able to do acquisitions because that's the only way to get access to capital to do acquisitions um, other people will tell you hey you gotta have crazy credentials and years of business experience and work in private equity firms and investment banking firms and that's maybe going to be the only way for you to do acquisitions other will tell you, you gotta be master at negotiations or have crazy you know like work in the fbi and and do hostage hostage negotiations in there first before you can ever do acquisitions um some will tell you, you gotta have an amazing credit so if you don't have amazing credit, you won't be able to do acquisitions. There's no way. You're screwed. Uh, don't get me wrong. Amazing. Having all those things is a bonus. It's good. I'm not telling you that, you know, those are not good things to have. But it's not what gonna, what's going to make or break your deal. That's what I really want to emphasize here. Like, I don't want you to have the belief that, oh, shit, if I don't have millions in the bank already, I'm screwed. End of the game. Let's go home and give up because it's not true. Or next, and like I said, it doesn't stop here, right? Because some, some of you may, may, have been, may have seen others talking about acquisitions over the last few years or a few months or a few weeks. And with anything new and exciting, the misinformation and misconceptions can really pile up and lead people down massive bunny trails that, that don't work, just literally don't work. So let me go through some of those things that just don't work that you might have been told right you might have been told that the only way to do a deal is you gotta buy a distressed company that barely makes money and is about to shut down and that's the only way for you to get a deal that someone will give you the, their business and they'll be like hey here's a really bad business take it away from me and that's the only way to do a deal that's what some people will tell you others will tell you you gotta form a board you gotta have people with 60 or hundreds of years of uh, experience and they got to be on your board and you got to put them on your team before you even find a deal and that alone is going to take you a few months or a few years just to get yourself a board and without that you can't move forward on anything and basically they're telling you go and put the responsibility on someone else and hopefully they'll do you a favor and, and help you close the deal in our acquisition others might tell you um you know no money down or seller financing is the best and only way to go and do a deal all right they'll be like no money down or seller financing that's the only and best way 
Others might tell you buying businesses is easy. It's easy money. Just go in, buy a business, in the next day, become a billionaire yesterday. Right? I've heard those things too. Um, others might tell you the, the opposite, that buying businesses is super complicated to get you over one, to get you, you know, like in the end of the day, I've heard someone saying nothing in the world is that complicated. Like even rocket science, there's, in the end of the day, it comes down to just few principles that someone need to learn how to execute well. Yes, there are nuances that you learn over time and you can learn from someone with experience, 100%, like everything in life, right? But in the end of the day, overcomplicating things for you won't help, period. So I'm about to show you the truth. So you know exactly how to use acquisitions to change your entire life. I fully believe that. It changed my life. It changed dozens of our clients' life. And I know for a fact it can change yours. If you're going to be committed, if you're going to be resourceful, if you're going to take action and be consistent and won't give up and won't listen to other beliefs and, and stories that you have in your mind because our minds like to play with us. Our minds like to tell us that you were not enough, that you're not, you know, there's, you, we got to go and work at this job or have this business and there's a limit to it and, and it's not truth. There's no limit to what you can do. And I'm telling you that acquisition is the best and fastest way to get there, to get you to your dreams, to get you to your point where money is not an issue. So you can have an impact, so you can contribute to your community or to the world. And I'm going to show you why all the stories you have in your mind, I don't care what are your stories, they're not truth. They're just not true. So, um, our goal with this masterclass, we have a few goals here, right? I just want to set the expectations to make sure that you're ready and committed. So, to begin with, we want you to have actual conversations and offers in the next five days. You're actually talking to business owners who are doing literally millions of years in sales and you're not afraid. You know how to talk to them. You know what to ask them. You know how to even find them. You know if and when and how and you can talk to them and you can make offers, in the next few days and we'll give you action steps each day to build momentum we'll give you enough information to go out there and buy your first business or first bolt on to your existing business basically to allow you and help you grow by acquisitions and we got a lot to cover so we're going to keep it 80 20 we're going to make sure that we're going to you know keep the most important things here and yeah, obviously, we want you to get excited about the opportunity. You know, we want you to get results. We want you to share it with others. Share the challenge, share the opportunity to buy businesses. So you could he- help us and help you bring more people to do more deals. You could bring people to partner with you. You can bring people to invest with you. You can bring and find some people to just, you know, manage the business for you. Or there's so many or work with you as a service provider. I'm going to share some of those things in a bit as well and what it looks like. There's just too many deals available for everyone. And what we're doing here, we're building an army, we're building a community of people who want to connect together, who want to build something massive here, who want to you know, make an impact and help business owners out there to retire and to save jobs and to create amazing companies in different locations and geographic places that you know we can. There's only so much we can do. Everyone here is in a different geographic location and background So you can all help each other. All of you watching right now, if you're watching this right now, you have a specific background, you have a specific experience, you are in a specific location, you are willing to put more time or more money. Everyone here is different and that's why everyone can add a different type of value. And you need to find each other, you can find each other. That's that's our mission here with acquisition.com, to connect all of you through acquisitions. I'm personally focused right now on doing bigger deals. And those deals that I'll show you how to do, you can do them on your own or this platform will make you want to do them with me, with us, with acquisitions.com because what we do is we invest in the ones we like. And that's another reason and agenda for why we're even doing this because you're going to find a lot of deals. Some of them you'll deal on your own. Some of them you'll come to us and be like, hey, we want help to close this deal. Like the deal that we're closing right now um, that I'm going to share with you if you're going to share the challenge, like I said before. So, to get the best results for your wealth explosion, play all in, right? Be engaged. Watch all the videos. Give yourself a week to invest in yourself for once, you know? 
A lot of us don't allow ourselves to invest in ourselves. The best investment you can make in the world is in yourself. Not in a specific stock, not in a real estate, in yourself. Especially if you're not at a point where you don't have to work right now, where you have enough money where you don't have to work. The best investment you can make is in yourself, to grow your skills, to grow your to expand your vision and view around the world and learn different things. And this is the opportunity for you this week to learn about acquisitions like never before. So forget about the destruction, you know, don't be too obsessed and, you know, lived by different dopamines. I see people are literally just attached to their phone and getting so many notifications from every email they're getting, every message they're getting and their phone like if your phone right now is not on silent and you're getting notification on your phone, please remove them. They're not going to help you with your goals, period. And when you don't have those distractions, that's where you can focus. So play only and be engaged. If you're here, let's do it. Let's get it to work for once, right? Don't give up on this. Like you're here, we're spent like 20 minutes already. It means that you're serious about this. So be all in on this. Like, you know, if you do something, do it. Be all in. Don't do it half and it will be difficult. This is not a get-rich-quick thing. Please understand that. This is a skill that will transform your entire life if you're serious, committed, consistent, and you're going to be resourceful and step up and take action and step outside your comfort zone and again and again, and then it's going to be messy, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be challenging, and you'll need to step outside your comfort zone again, and you're going to fail, and it's going to suck, and you're going to feel bad, and you're going to continue in that cycle again and again and again. And as long as you don't give up, it will be the best experience of your life. But you can't give up and you can't expect this to be easy if you like i said if you expect to be a billionaire yesterday i'm sorry i can't help you maybe you know someone else who can help you not here and like i said you'll need to be committed resourceful and take action this is not a stay on the couch and hopeful results and stay on the couch and become rich and or stay on the couch and watch netflix and you know become rich this is not this this workshop course with real work i'll go Tell you, hey, go and do work. Go and step up. Go and, you want to get results? Step up. Do the work. And you must make a real decision. Because fortune favors the bold. Nature will reward courage. In the end of the day, you've got to make a decision. This is what I want. I want to build wealth. I want to explore it by acquisitions. Because I'm going to show you why in a bit. Why this is the best way to do that. And you see, you saw it. The biggest companies in the world are doing that. So you at least, I would just at least suggest to you that you will explore it. And it's on you. We'll show you how to do it, but you'll need to take it with two hands. You'll need to do the work. I'm not here to save you. You're at the same level as me and anyone else. You're not above or below me. You'll need to do the work. I could just point you in the right direction, share with my experience, share with our community experience, but it's on you in the end of the day. If you're not going to take action... I'm sorry, we can't help. We're not going to do the work for you. It's on you to get results. And if you're serious and you're committed and you're resourceful, it will work. If not, it won't. Consistency is key. I want to see you produce at least one or two hours focused every single day on your habits. Focus on habits. Don't focus on your outcome. Again, don't focus, hey, I don't like people who say I want to be a billionaire in the next two months. No. Ask yourself, if you really want to make a lot of money, ask yourself, okay, what actions do I need to take to get there? I'm going to share with you in this challenge, in this workshop, what kind of actions you should take. But I want you to focus on your habits and make sure that you're accomplishing your habits. In the end of the day, when you finish your day, ask yourself, did I do one, two, three that I said to myself that I will do? Because those one, two, three things are helping me towards my, my goal, my vision. And patience. If you plan to become a billionaire, like I said, after this week, you're going to be disappointed. A few million after taxes, that's possible. But usually it takes a few months or a few years. And I'm going to share with you in the end of this day what it looks like, how to build your wealth plan, how to make sure that you're planning on how much money you want and what it's look what it looks like when you're doing deals. There's a way to make money at closing, during, during ownership of business and at, at exit, obviously. And I'm going to show you how it's possible to get a few millions in cash after taxes um, while by following this process. Right? But remember, things taking time. Something, anything that's worth it in life takes time. If you want to, if you're 
50 pounds or kilograms overweight and you want to lose it in a week, I'm sorry, it won't work. You got to build your habit. You got to work out as much as possible every single day. You got to eat well every single day, right? Be in a caloric deficit to lose weight every single day or whatever it is for you. But those are usually the two things you got to do to get in a better shape. And if you're not doing those things on a daily basis, I'm sorry, it won't work. If every two months you're going to tell yourself, you know what, today I'll do whatever I need to be in shape and Every two months you go to the gym and eat well, just every two months, I'm sorry, you won't get in shape. Same here. You want to be good with acquisitions. You got to follow a consistent habit on a daily basis. And I'm telling you that most people in the world can't even focus for one or two hours on one specific task. If you can get there, you're above like 50, 90% of of society most likely. It's simple, guys. It's simple, but it's not easy. That's what I want to show you in this process. And finally... Post in the group. We have an amazing group and I want you to see you encourage others and find partners and join ventures this way. You can, see, you can find lifelong partners and friends in this community. Everyone here is on the same journey to help, to give back. And those who are going to be the most engaged in the community are also going to win more prizes and more bonuses. So again, please share with others the challenge. And every end of the day, I'm going to share with you some action steps to take. So I want you to see you engage and post them in the group. We want everyone to win. And when you're posting, you're inspiring others and you're helping someone else to not give up. And it's all going to come back to you. Karma is real, you know. Go out there, help others with what you want help with. And like I said, the most selfish thing you can do in the world is to be selfless. Help others to help yourself. And if you want a great book about it, by the way, check the book, The Diamond Cutter by uh, Michael Gesher Roach. Uh, amazing book, will change your life. And it's by a guy that built a $100 million company that sold to Warren Buffett. And he's talking about how he built that following, um, let's just say, non-traditional business advice. So I highly, highly suggest. So please post in the group, help others. Post in the Facebook group. Go to acquisitions.com forward slash group to uh, uh, go through the group and post every lesson, every distinction, every... Uh, every thought, everything that you learned, post it. Teach to inspire, help others the way you wished someone helped you if you were stuck. Do that. Try it for once. If all of your life so far you focused just on yourself and it didn't work out that well, guess what? Maybe it's worth trying helping others a little bit and adding value and focusing on others rather than just yourself. Because you taking action will inspire, allow someone else to give it another chance. Right when he was about to quit. And like I said, we plan to give you amazing bonuses. If you play all out and comment and engage, we're going to surprise you in a private message. One of my team members that, hey, we love your engagement. Here's a bonus. So do it. You have a reason to. So yeah, go to acquisitions.com forward slash group uh, to post on the group, post your lessons, post your questions, post your homework, everything. And all of this is sponsored by Acquisitions University. Acquisitions University is a mentorship program that provides step-by-step detailed training on all things acquisitions, as well as 12 months of weekly Q&A calls, support, and 1,000-plus strong community of business buyers to ensure that you know exactly how to close one, two, three, heck, as many as you want seven figure businesses. So we sponsored by Acquisitions University. So let's get started with the real stuff, All right? So far it's been fun, it's been exciting. Hopefully I got the, you know, I got the fundamentals with you a little bit. I got you ready. I showed you why execution, even if the day, I don't care what idea you have, execution always win a great idea, All right? So let's get started with those things. So here's what those next days are going to look like. So first day, I'm going to talk all about the acquisition method. I'm going to share uh, some thoughts about the wealth wave that we have going on right now. Everything about the method overall, the mistakes. Day two will be all about the deal flow, right? Things like the secrets to basically finding the hidden and best deals for you specifically. 
everyone got a better deal for him. I'm going to show you how to find the best deals for you based on your experience, your contacts, your background, your passion, all those things. Day three, all about deal analysis. After we found a deal, how do we analyze those deals? How to quickly and effectively know when a deal is a good deal? Most people out there, maybe they find a deal, they don't even know how to say if a deal is a good deal or not. This is what day three is going to be all about. Day four is all about deal execution. You found a deal, how you analyze the deal, now what? This is all about closing the deal and actually getting paid without getting screwed. Remember, I'm going to share with you in a bit, but we're going to buy here multi-million dollar businesses, businesses that are doing at least seven figure a year in sales. You don't want to make mistakes, right? Every mistake can cost you a small fortune. We're going to make sure you're not making mistakes. And day five is all about being an acquisition entrepreneur and make it a lifelong journey, which is so exciting, right? So lifelong momentum and wealth. This is what day five is about. So let's start with the wealth wave, right? Or basically tapping into the biggest wealth transfer of the 21st century. So let's talk a little bit about the perfect storm. So this is what's going on right now, if you don't know. There's 2.6 trillions of dollars sitting around looking to be deployed in big companies mostly right now, right? There's a lot of money out there. And the governments all over the world seems to print even more money. So guess what's going to be easy to access if you know how to access? Money, right? Lowest interest rate ever. Money is out there waiting for you. That's one thing to know. Um, and yeah, most of that money goes to public companies, private equity, pension funds, edge funds, mutual funds, things like that. They won't invest in small businesses because it's the same time and money to do due diligence on a bigger deal. Just so you understand, this is kind of like a bit of the background of all the money in the world right now that is out there. Most of the money is out there with big institutions, big corporations. They're usually investing in very large transactions because for them to do a small deal on a big deal is basically the same amount of work. Um, Another thing you want to pay attention to, and the reason I shared with you about the capital deployed is because I'm going to show you why growing by acquisitions is the fastest way for you to get access to that, basically, capital. Like, if you're not doing acquisitions, it's going to be very difficult to access that capital. But when you're doing acquisitions, then you can immediately get it interacted with banks, with private equity firms, with those institutions that otherwise you can't if you're not doing acquisitions. Like... Go and give it a try and talk to a private equity firm to start a business from scratch. Good luck. They'll kick you out of the door. All right. Um, some more things for you to understand. Baby boomers are retiring. And lots of them own businesses. There's trillions of dollars going to change hands in the next years because of the baby boomers that are retiring. Now, most people don't buy the 1 to 20 million in revenues companies. Like I said, because for the large institutions... It's the same amount of time and effort to do big deals than a small deal. And for you, when you're at this stage, most likely, and your company or you don't have a company is up to that range or even a bit bigger. I, I work with a lot of people who have even companies doing 100, 150 million a year in revenues. And I work with people who have no business or with a lot of people who have companies doing between the one to five million a year in revenues. Um, it doesn't matter where you're at. Uh, those companies between 1 to 20 million revenues, I think that's the biggest opportunity that we have right now because there's not a lot of competition in there at all um, cause, because private equity firms usually don't go to those deals. Maybe they will start to look at companies above 10, some of them, the boutique ones, the small ones, but usually between the 1 to 10 million a year in revenues, uh, you have very little competition. Interest rates and taxes for businesses are at historical low levels and you know, it means that you can raise a lot of capital plus protect your downside if you know what you're doing. So win, 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 win for everyone. Some more things for you to know. The more profitable the business, the more someone will pay for it, right? That's something for you to understand. People ask how, what, and we're going to talk about it some more. But in general, the more profitable a business is, the more someone someone will pay for it, right? And one of the ways to value a business is just multiples of pre-tax profits. We're going to talk some more about that in the next few days, but that's kind of like a basic understanding for you. You need to understand that the more money a business makes, 
obviously the better the more it's worth uh, and there's a lot of nuances we can go into um, in the next few days now during recession multiples are lower because sellers are motivated to sell now as of the recording of this video um, it looks like we're heading towards potentially depression um, and one of the most uh, let's just say world changing times of our lives for sure right with what's going on with the virus and all that so it means that you can buy businesses at very low multiples right so remember we said that the business is usually worth multiples of pre-tax profit the more a business is worth the more a business makes usually the more someone will pay for it but in a recession you can pay much lower so we can pay and we will pay the seller a fair price a fair accounting evaluation we will save jobs we will help the economy and build wealth and profit while adding a lot of value to business owners who are struggling or just want out right so i think that's something to really understand you need to understand that what we're doing here is valuable we're adding value to those business owners we're solving problems a lot of those business owners just want to retire they made enough money they don't want to go through a recession they just want to go out and retire and want to make sure that someone is taking care of their baby of their employees of their brand right and you'll learn about that as we go as we as we go through those days um, so you need to understand what you're doing is very valuable you're adding value to those people you're not screwing them or doing anything wrong um, and obviously you know you making money by doing something good um, that's what we call business right so it's, it's all good there's nothing wrong about it i just want to make sure you have that belief and understanding that you going out there providing value to business owners that want to exit or retire is valuable there's someone who needs to do it for them and usually you'll see it's a buyer market right now there's not a lot of people that will go out there and even talk to them and by you being there and just sometimes listening to them to what they want this is super valuable alone by you bringing your energy and willing to do the work this is super valuable and yeah you must act fast this opportunity won't stay here for long we don't know for how long this opportunity is going to be out there you know there's never been a better time to do acquisitions you know baby boomers are retiring the economy is going crazy there's never been a better time to do it i don't know how long it's going to stay it's going to stay for a few more weeks few more months few more, few more years but if you're not going to act on it right now you're just going to miss out on it right and one of the biggest thing i think that is very frustrating is when you see an amazing opportunity and you just you know you just don't act on it and in a few years from now you're going to regret oh my god i had this opportunity why i didn't take action on it so you know don't say i didn't tell you this is the opportunity right now millions of baby boomers are retiring they have businesses you can take it as a very fair accounting evaluation i don't care what's your situation right now um and at the end of the day what is a big business big 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 big, big, big business sorry is many times just aggregation of lots of small businesses right if you look at some of the biggest businesses in the world many times they're just a combination of a lot of the same small businesses all under one roof of one company right and that's what we call a roll-up and we're going to talk more about it as well um, so the goal is for you here in this challenge is can we help you combine maybe a few small businesses not just one and do a roll-up and then get the big money excited then get access to even more of those trillions of dollars looking to, de to be deployed because you have a bigger business that they're excited about now here's something interesting for you to understand the average exit for a small business is 2.8 multiples of pre-tax profits that's based on biz buy sell data private equity firms p is private equity and public companies buy and trade at 10 to 30 to sometimes hundreds of multiples of pre-tax profit so let's think about this what if we bought few companies at two times multiples right you got a bit of a discount and eventually took them public or just sold it privately for 10x there's a huge arbitrage opportunity here i hope you understand you can buy a business for three million buy few businesses at three million i'm going to show you in the end of this video what it looks like when you're going to build your wealth plan and sell it to 10 times 20 times 30 times and make millions as the arbitrage this is what should get you excited combining some of those companies in the same sector together and then sell it as one group as a larger business that's where you're going to get all the private equity firms and public companies excited all right that's what you need to think about so 
some of the biggest thing people ask me is why would someone even sell me their business, right? So let me go through some of those reasons. So illness, death, family situation, stress, burned out, bored, shiny objects. Some people just want to go and do something else. They feel like, you know, especially entrepreneurs, they all think they always think there's a better option somewhere else and they have this shiny object syndrome. Um, I can tell you it happens at any level of a business. It doesn't matter if you're just starting or some people make a few millions a year and they're like, oh my God, this, there is an amazing opportunity. Grass, grass is always greener kind of syndrome, right? Um, some people will just sell their existing business because of that, right? Obviously stress, burned out, all those things. Um, some of them just set financially already, right? And obviously Corona, the, the virus makes uh, more shit to deal with. I'm sorry for the, for the language, but you know, people are just like, you know, I have my money, I saved, I own this business for 30 years, I made enough money, saved. I just want to retire, I don't want to deal with things. Um, so yeah, some people just want to be with their family, retire, some people want to relocate, you know. Um, some people, it's just about pride and embarrassment, so they don't want to close the doors, so especially if it's a, some kind of a business that is not doing so well or is not growing as much as they thought it will. They don't want to close the door. They don't want to fire people. They're embarrassed to go out there to their network and community and say, hey, I shut down my business. They'd rather just sell it, even if it's a, on a very low price. Um, sometimes they're just, you know, fights between partners, shareholders, issues, things like that. Uh, cash flow challenges. Um, yeah, ready to pursue a different vision. Some of those things, right? There's enough, enough, enough um, reasons for that. So how big is the market? All right, there are 30 million businesses in the U.S. alone, 50 million baby boomers retire in the next 10 years, 30 million businesses in the U.S. alone. That's a duplication here. 20% actually able to sell. Most business, yeah, most listed businesses, people don't know, most listed businesses won't even sell. Like when a broker lists a business for sale, most of them won't even sell because it's a buyer market. There's so many opportunities for buyers. Most businesses will not even sell. So I want you to understand it as well. Um, my belief in my experience tells me that everyone is for sale for the right price or in terms and potentially the right timing right that's something to consider as well so even when you see millions here in businesses for sale or millions of businesses or so baby boomers retire it doesn't matter in the end of the day everyone is for sale for the right price in terms and if you can get them the right price in terms and you hit them right in the right timing that's all that matters so like those numbers are pretty much very low compared to what they are Opportunities are out there in the US alone. I'm not even talking other countries, right? And everyone have those opportunities. There's abundance of opportunity out there. That's the reason for those those um, lines. And the beauty, especially right now, you're not trapped by location. There's no limits. People are used to do Zoom calls. We're closing deals right now with doing Zoom calls. You know, you don't even need to fly. Like Especially with old school owners who just want to meet you face to face. Right now, it's almost became the norm. It's almost became weird to meet in person. Um, from unfortunate situation, but uh, we can, you know, make the most out of it. We can do Zoom calls, we can have phone calls, Skype calls or whatever, right? We don't have to meet people face to face. Um, and at this point, there are companies out there doing millions a year in sales. I'm talking hundreds of millions even, remote only. If you look at some of the biggest businesses in the world right now, Google, Twitter, they just announced um, and Facebook that their employees can work from home. So, for the next at least year and i've got no doubt it's going to continue that way right so no limits on location and heck you can actually go into a business with an office space and save a lot of money just by removing that cost all right so those are some of the things that i wanted to get excited about on what's possible so putting it all together this is the most lucrative wealth skill in the world i want you to understand period like there's no other better skill for you to learn this is a lifelong skill that can really change your life if you're ready for it this is next level entrepreneurship. This is how you make the big money. And I think that if you don't have a business yet, this is the best skill to learn right away. Because you're going to learn so much here about business. You're going to learn so much. The best way to learn about business is not by starting a business from scratch, but it is to go to talk to a business owner or already run the business that you dream to have and learn from him and ask him questions and buy his business if you know how to buy a business. Um, and yeah, a trillion dollar wealth wave for those that know, that know how to grab it, right? So obviously, I showed you what's possible right now. I showed you the opportunity. If you're not gonna grab it, like I said, I'm not gonna do work for you. I'm not gonna save you. If you're not gonna be committed and resourceful and take action and step up and get outside your comfort zone and get up from the couch, I'm sorry, I won't be able to help you, but you, because you need to grab it. It's on you. 
and you're capable, you're, you're, you're able to do that. If you're here in this challenge, in this masterclass, you can do that. No one is above or below you. You can do that, period. You just need to believe in yourself as much as I believe in you because I know you're capable of doing it. But if you're not going to quiet your mind to believe in yourself, I'm sorry. Uh, there's only so much I can do here in this, in this masterclass. Um, yeah, but everyone else is training you on the slow three, right? So let's go through some of those things. So most people will teach you about stocks, real estate, startups. So let's, let's actually go through some of those things, right? So a lot of people will tell you, hey, go and invest in stock. Why do you need a business? So I think it comes down to really understanding what specifically you're going to do in stock for if you want to invest in stocks. So are, you, are we talking right now active investing, passive investing? Are we talking buying index or... Are you, are you talking about picking specific stocks? Like, what, what is your plan when, you, when, when someone else is telling you, hey, go and build, build wealth buying stocks, right? So that's something you got to ask yourself. Is it an active thing? It's going to be your business. Is it going to be a passive thing? Are you going to invest in index or are you going to pick specific stocks? Um, also with returns, what are your expectations? What risk are you willing to take? I can tell you a few things about stocks, for example. So the S&P, for example, um, will give you around 8% a year, 7%, depend if you include inflation or not, based on historical data, right? With small business, if you're looking at return alone, we're talking about at least 40% year over year. I'm going to share with you in this challenge what it looks like when we're talking about numbers. So even if you're putting your own money, and I'm going to share with you a lot of strategies that won't require a lot of your money or any, if you don't want to, because in the end of the day, it comes down to cost of capital. People tell me, like, what it looks like to buy a business, to invest in a business, um, like in definitely you need to understand even the richest people in the world they don't use their own capital for a lot of things it, it all comes down to what's their cost of capital how how cheap or not it is for them to raise capital from others right and that's how they make their they make their decision it's not necessarily uh you know just hey let's throw my own money on things so that's that's also something that you need to think about like how you look at your money like when it's time to deploy your capital when it's time to deploy others other people capital and maybe take some more equity for doing a lot of the work right those are some of the things you want to think about but in the end of the day um even here like you need to understand when you're looking at stocks like usually when you just buy the market the full market it will beat it will beat like stock pickers 80 percent of the time right so you got to keep that in mind as well if you want to make this your business like picking stocks like you just can't time the market, period. You can't go in when you want and get out when you want. I think you're going to make a lot of money from it. Like most day traders just don't make better returns than the index, period, right? And even if they do, they can't, like you personally can't really invest with them if you're looking at it as a passive um, opportunity because in the end of the day, the biggest traders out there, they have billion dollar funds and like unless you have at least 100 million to deploy with them, they won't even talk to you, right? So those are some of the things you want to talk about, think about. If you're looking at Trey Dalio, all right, like he's he's doing a lot of trading and stuff like that. He won't even talk to you, all right? So if you're looking for passive investors, passive investments into, into picking stocks, someone who's really an expert in picking stocks, and even there, you know, making mistakes, and even there, like even if you're looking at Warren Buffett, even he didn't have really good last few years, right? So you really need to ask yourself where you put yourself in, right? You also need to ask yourself how much control do you have when you're investing in stocks, like Let's say you decide to pick just specific stocks. Let's say you decide to invest in Tesla, right? Like how much are you in control of Elon Musk not going on a Joe Rogan podcast and smoking a joint, right? You can't control or even talk to the CEO. Like good luck talking to Elon Musk, right? And, and suggesting some, some, some ideas on what to do with the business, right? So it's something, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying those are some of the things you need to ask yourself. Like where do I see myself? Do I see myself maybe deploying a small percentage of my capital into those stocks? Do I see it as a full-time thing? Like, do I see that as my um, way of being an entrepreneur and making an income? Like, what is it for you, right? Like, for example, think about buying public companies, right? You buy it 20 or sometimes 200 multiples of pre-tax profits, right? Versus when you buy a small business, I'm talking very low multiples. You're buying businesses at two times, three times multiples of pre-tax profits, of a yearly pre-tax profit. So there's so much higher returns when you buy small businesses. You're so much more in control, right? You are the CEO or you have direct um, connection to the CEO, right? There's so many things you can do in a small business to double the business, triple the business. When you're a very large company, it's very difficult to grow um, at the as much large and fast scale as you can with small business, right? Because with small business, there's a lot of operation changes and, and, and things you can do to, to make things more productive. 
Um, yeah, and, and like I said, in the day, even Warren Buffett says, like the best investment is in yourself, in the business that you own, that you, you know, it's in the small business. Like, that's what I like, at least personally, in small business. It's you against you. Business is a reflection of the owner. And if you trust yourself and you see yourself grow as a person, as a human being, in the next few years, the best investment you can make is in yourself. And when you're running and buying a small business that you own, that you operate, then there's so much more potential upside that you need to keep in mind as well. So that's enough about stocks. Let's talk a bit about real estate. So again, are we talking active investing, passive investing? What's, what's your goal with it, right? If passive, like how much you're in control? Again, not too much. How much you trust the person, the syndicator or the leader of your deal? Um, that's a good question to ask, right? Let's talk about returns. So returns, so if in the stock market, we're talking 7 8% if you're lucky, if you're not in a recession, right? And you just keep the money forever. Real estate, we're talking, what, 10% a year if you're lucky? Um, and there's only so much upside in real estate, right? You can't rent to 10x more people because there's only so many apartments you have, right? I'm not even talking about, um, you know, office spaces right now that are, we don't even know what's going to happen with that, right? Um, and also, then you need to ask yourself, is it really, it's a passive, you think it's passive, is it really passive? If you buy like one small um, single family uh, investment opportunity, you, in the end of the day, if you fix the toilets, if you need to fix the toilets in your investments, then why not just fix your product or service in a business and grow the business 10x, 20x, you know, in the next few years versus in a multifamily, like instead of fixing your toilets, go out there and build a better product and, and, and sell to hundreds of people, right? Those are some of the things you need to keep in mind. So again, the upside in business is so much better. The returns in small business is so much better, in my opinion, if you're looking at the Add, add things as a passive investor or as an active investor who is making it his, his job, right, as an entrepreneur. Um, and yeah, obviously, pre-coronavirus, the economy was booming. Everything changed right now. People can't go to work right now, right? Like, you need to really, really keep things in mind. Um, yeah, because like I said, even if, if, if a lot of people say, okay, real estate is very stable, but really i mean look at what the virus did right if you invested in commercial real estate or office space in the i mean in the last few months i don't think it's that much of a good investment you see like there's so many things that you at least at this point can't control so that's about real estate some of my thoughts um, and then startups some people will tell you hey go and deploy some capital in startups i know people deploy 100 percent of their their uh, net worth in startups because they have some background they have some experience but even they fail most of in most of their investments i have colleagues who are partners in in a very successful vc firms venture capital firms and they invest in, in a portfolio approach right uh, but even they fail in nine out of ten of their investments right so their returns are actually compared to small business not as good i'm not even talking about you thinking that you need to start a business right because like most startups fail in the, the first 10 years acquisition skip that acquisition basically tells you hey go and Go to a business that already skipped the startup phase. Most businesses fail from scratch just because they run out of money. There's no market demand. They don't have the right people. I mean, there's the competition Competition just destroy them. They have pricing issues. Uh, you know, they don't have the, the good, a good product. They don't have a good business model. They don't know how to do marketing, sales. Those are some of the reasons for businesses to fail. The beauty is that when you buy a business, you basically get all those things proven. You get all those things ready you already know that there's a market demand you already know that there's some cash in the business or at least you know what kind of cash you're going to have when you're going to buy the business right you already know what team you're going to have in there when you're going to buy it um yeah so those are some of the things you definitely want to keep in mind like remember acquisitions is skipping the startup phase you basically go to startups that already made it um it, it's a bit challenging to to explain that to people because everyone nowadays wants to be the next uber right everyone want to be travis from uber um, and, and create the next unicorn. But it's funny, most people don't even know that Travis, the, uh, who used to be the CEO of Uber, didn't even start Uber from scratch. He invested in it and then became the CEO after it already had some customers, after it already had some product market fit. And like I said, same with Elon and Tesla, right? So ask yourself, who you want to compare yourself to, right? What's your standards? If you look at, again, the smartest people that we all look at, they're usually going into existing businesses um yeah and uh, so like i said venture capital in in general that space is a very portfolio approach they even know that just one out of ten will make it but for you as the business owner 
Like, why would you take 100% chance of being just, you know, just have a one out of 9% of being successful? Like, just go to, go, I would just rather go and gamble in the roulette and have at least 50% chance. Um, and in the end of the day, I really think that if you don't want to change the world and have an amazing technology, like uh, with an AI robot or something, or, you know, you have a really um, crazy technology that the world didn't see yet, then I don't see a reason to start something from scratch. And even then, if you, even if you have a crazy technology idea, why won't you go and buy a business in that sector and bring that idea into your existing list of clients of the company that you just bought? Because in the end of the day, most of the people that I know and talked about, they want great lifestyle, they want a lot of money, yeah. Um, but it's not like they're thinking about changing the world when they didn't fix their money issues yet. So everyone wants to change the world when they make a lot of money. But in the end of the day, to begin with, most of the people that I want have a, you know, a very different goal. They just want a bit of like a nice income, nice lifestyle. And then, yeah, and, and then they think about the impact. And I can tell you that boring businesses that I'm going to share with you in here in the, in the challenge, like, like most people are never get excited about buying like a plumbing business, for example. But I can tell you for a fact that this is probably one of the, if it's a good business, can be one of the most profitable and lucrative business for you to have the best lifestyle and income for you and your family. Um, so that's something to think about, right? Boring businesses, for example, are super profitable, but they're not sexy. They're not going to be, you know, the next Uber and be all over the news as the new startup unicorn that, that grew faster than anyone else. So also with acquisitions and startup, comparing acquisitions to startup, like when you're looking at acquisitions, you can raise capital from institutions, from banks. Good luck raising capital from banks for, for startup. No way, right? In terms of success rate, there's only 2% failure, failure, failure rate with acquisitions. And this is from third party data. I'm not making it. For startup, you won't get access to much financing. Right? You can get to specific equity investors that are going to be difficult. With acquisitions, remember, many times you don't even need to use your own money. You're using banks, you're using investors. There's a lot of different deal strategies that I'm going to show you that won't even require you to do that. Um, with startups, obviously, risk of failure is huge. Right? There's better chances to become the next LeBron James than some of those unicorn companies. Um, yeah, and if you want passive investing in small businesses, like why not take a small percentage of your portfolio and do that, right? And invest in small businesses that have higher returns, lower, lower um, failure rates. And obviously, if you want to be an entrepreneur and run those businesses, there's no better way to make money than own a business. All of you know that. All the richest people in the world, they own businesses. The best way to get there as fast as possible is by buying one. And I think that's the fastest way to change your financial situation. So if you're right now kind of like in the... In the middle class, I think that the best way to get to a different level is by buying a company. So those are some of the, my thoughts about stocks, real estate, startups. I know a lot of people ask me about that. So I thought it's worth sharing as well. So, um, yeah, why not learn the moves of those who control the wealth of the world? Right? Lots of you trust the pension funds. Right? Lots of you trust whatever you're doing to invest your money in right now. I would just say and tell you, be careful. Like, ten, take control of your wealth. Have a vehicle to grow with no limits and be in control. And I really think that buying small businesses is the way to do that. So, who is acquisitions good for? It's good for people who want to build empires, right? I'm going to share more about who are those empire builders, right? Which is basically business owners ready to out-leverage the competition, right? This is also for entrepreneurs growing their business at an exponential speed. So if you're basically a business owner, you want to grow fast, this is the way to do that. If you want to be better than your competitors or heck, even buy your competitors, that's the way to do that, to build an empire, to do a roll-up, which I'm going to share some more about. Um, this is also great for lifestyle entrepreneurs, right? People that work nine to five and ready, ready to escape their job because you can buy one business, make more money in your business that you just bought Plus, be your own boss and have some equity. Um, this is also great for people who are connectors who just want to get paid big money to just connect between people, right? Or even equity. So I know a lot of people who, who we helped that make a lot of money just connecting between deals, connecting between service providers or being a service provider in a deal for equity. There's a lot of cool things that we can talk about. 
obviously this is great acquisition is perfect for investors right people uh, just looking for a better wealth vehicle with all the economy craziness we're going through right now people don't want to don't know where to put their money i think small businesses is one of the best places at least that's where i'm putting a lot of my money um, obviously sellers if you own a business and you're just ready to move on and sell the business obviously i think you can learn a lot in this workshop as well so let's start with some of those different um, different type of people here so let's start with empire builders and lifestyle entrepreneurs all right so the old way everyone will tell you the way to build an empire and to have a lifestyle is to write a four-hour work week it's kind of like start from nothing grow customer by customer test product market fit and then maybe hire people and outsource right um that's the old way right everyone tell you want to build an empire go out there come with an idea raise capital from venture capital firms be diluted and be lucky if you're like even if you look at the biggest companies out there like uber or think uh, who who have an amazing growth lately like airbnb founders they own maybe like, maybe if they're lucky five percent of the business right so their model is basically think about a great idea raise capital from venture capital firms be diluted and if you're lucky you're a multi-billion dollar company and own five percent of it and you're not really in control right um and again it's your your chances of becoming the next airbnb or uber is basically as much as your chances of becoming the next lebron james just to get you an idea of kind of like the the, the percentages and possibility right so that's the old way right the four hour work week the venture capital go to silicon valley raise millions of dollars new way start from proven business grow business by business right so if you a lifestyle entrepreneur you want to be a lifestyle entrepreneur go out there buy a business that have a management team in place that makes you good enough income or money that you could take out as a dividend in the end of the year or a quarter each quarter and make great money with an actual team that are not random people you outsource to in the philippines but an actual good employees that run your business and have the expertise for years they're working in those businesses for years many times so that's the lifestyle new way uh, obviously the build an empire new ways go and grow by business business by business instead of just doing more marketing and sales go and buy your competitors go and buy complementary businesses become the best in your sector yep yeah, so business by business let's go through some more uh, thoughts here right so first of all something to understand one one good deal can really make you financially free all right that's what you need to understand like and that's assuming I'm, we're talking about seven figures that you can potentially put in in cash in your bank account after taxes right i'm not talking about people who want like financially free private jets i'm talking like very nice financial freedom that can sustain your life really really well right one deal can get you there just just so we're clear and there's no need to build a new product there's no need to come up with a new idea right there's no need to spend lots of money testing the unproven which I know a lot of existing business owners do when they want to test a new product in the market. They, they spend sometimes fifty, hundred thousand dollars or more just to test a new product or an idea. Why won't you just go and buy an existing business where the product is already proven, where you already have a list of clients, you already have great employees, right? Instead of testing. And I can tell you, you can use the same amount of money or sometimes less to just buy an existing business because you can leverage other uh, financial partners obviously less risk less like likely to fail you can skip the startup phase right we talked about that and you buy something that's already working successful entrepreneur overnight and basically double revenues overnight right there's i don't like the word successful entrepreneur that much but there's you know the best way to grow a business is by buying a business the, the only way to grow by years worth of sale is in an afternoon is by buying a business right because the moment you just purchase the business you pretty much you can double your revenue in an afternoon the moment you sign the agreement and best of both worlds you can be a lifestyle entrepreneur having an existing business uh, that have enough cash to hire managers for the day-to-day -day, or be the empire builders right and some of you don't even know if you want to be an empire builder or or a lifestyle entrepreneur yet but Obviously, the way to start is be a, like buy one business. Be the you can have the option to be a lifestyle entrepreneur. Then someone will just say, "Hey, I make enough money. I'm bored. There's only so much pina colada I can drink in the beach. Let's just buy more businesses and build an empire." So that's the a way to look at it as well. So yeah, best way to build an empire is by consolidating your industry and buying competitors or complementary companies. And again, think Facebook, both Instagram, both WhatsApp, right? 
That's how they're growing, by buying competitors, by buying complementary businesses and integrating and merging culture and technology. Right? When Facebook bought Instagram, no one understood why they're buying it. But now everyone thinks they're, they're genius, right? I remember when they bought Instagram, they thought, why they paid $1 billion for this company? And when they integrated their ad platform with Instagram, now they're genius. Um, and yeah, like, like we talked about, there's existing clients from day one, cash flow, talent, team, proven processes, sales, hiring, basically everything you wish for when you start a business from scratch, you get it when you buy a business. Uh, more certainty, obviously, in the amounts of profits you'll make immediately because you know you have some, you know, you have some numbers from the last few years, you know, kind of like what to expect. And knowing what to expect is probably the biggest thing that's going to give you certainty and confidence and, and lack of stress in a business. And yeah, it doesn't take years like startup to reach escape velocity numbers, right? Deal can be done very fast, few days to few months. Like in the time, it, especially for those of you who work B2B and have uh, business clients, like I see businesses that literally takes a year to just get one client that will pay them maybe fifty, hundred thousand dollars Here, it will take you the same amount of time and money sometimes to just buy a business. So that's something to think about. Um, and of course, you're buying something with brand recognition, with customers, revenue, profits, talents, employees, all those things, right? Testimonials, email list, equipment, office space, we talked about. So a bit about investors. The old way to look at things is just, those are the only ways, right? Stocks, real estate, startups. There's massive competition in there. Um, what about Black Swan events? Less control, like, you, like we said, you can't go to, Joe, to Elon Musk and ask him to not smoke a joint in Joe Rogan podcast and then see the stock value going down, right? Very risky, very slow. New ways, small business acquisitions and investments. Invest in a small business, invest in something, invest in an entrepreneur that you believe or in yourself. If there's the best one to believe in is in yourself, right? Invest in yourself and get the best returns. Like you can't get those returns in stocks in real estate and most of the startups investors are not getting those returns either like even those who get themselves a unicorn when they invest and i know a few of them um, in the end of the day they're taking a very much portfolio approach so when you're looking at all their losses it's not like they made an amazing yearly returns um, i really see i believe and know that you can get better returns with small business if you're buying the right deal and obviously there's less competition most people don't even know it's possible to buy a small business um, bigger multiples, more controls, more control, right? Safer and faster. Those are some of the things. That's the new way. I think that's going to be something um, that's just going to scale in the next few years. And going to be people are going to be like, if you're not, they're, they're almost going to look at you in a weird way if you don't have at least a percentage of your portfolio in a small business. That's my my thinking as an investor, as a passive investor. Uh, sellers, obviously, obviously this the, the old way is to work with brokers, right? To, to tell yourself, hey, I want to sell my business. Let's talk to a broker. New way is learn here what we're doing, right? Know what you're doing and sell to someone that will make you wealthy and maintain your legacy. And we're going to talk a lot about those things here. So even if you have a business and you're looking to sell it, you're going to learn a lot in the next few days. So no matter where you are, you can seize your part of the wealth wave opportunity, period. Right? So let's, let's get ready you, you, you are, are you ready to know how? That's the question now, right? So let's, let's get to some of that. So let's talk about the process. So three critical elements in the process, right? Let's get to it. So the acquisition process, again, a lot of people will overwhelm you. I just want to make it simple for you to understand. So it comes down to a few simple things. First of all, it's deal flow. Second of all is deal analysis. Third thing is deal execution. When you master those three things, there's a lot of nuances in, you know, each, in each of those. But I think that those who overwhelm you with more are, are just not helping you. I think when you see acquisition and you see our acquisition process as simple as following those three tap, steps, it's going to make your life so much easier, right? So that's the way to get successful acquisitions going, just following those three steps the right way. So let's overview each one a little bit um, so you understand what's going on. So let's start with deal flow, right? Deal flow, deal analysis, deal execution. Those are the three things. But basically, yeah, just, just so we're clear about those things. So basically, oops. So deal flow is all about how to find the deal, how to 
uh, make sure you're picking the right sector for you, how to talk to a business owners, how to get access to um, confidential information, basically how to start the process and get to a point where you have a lot of deals coming to you versus you chasing them. That's another big thing, right? So you have, this is, deal flow is all about getting to a point where you're looking at enough deals. You just have enough deals to pick from, all right? That's the point in the best sector for you. And you know how to talk to business owners to get to a point where they're taking you seriously and you're positioned in a way when you're taking serious. Deal analysis, that's the second step. That's all about basically what you do then, right? When you get some confidential information, like the numbers, like the information about the business, about the employees, about the products, about the customers, how do you analyze the deals? What are you doing to raise capital? What are your options? Where are you looking for in order to know what offers to make, right? How do you look at the numbers? How do you look at the data? How do you look at the org chart? All those different things when you analyze those deals, right? That's all about deal analysis. We're gonna explore that in the next days as well. And deal execution, it's all about how do you close the deal? Who do you need on your team? Do you need accountants, lawyers, M&A advisors? Do you need, um, what do you need then? What are you doing in your due diligence process to close the deal, right? This is all about how to get to a point where you get an offer accepted and actually move towards actually you owning shares in the business, right? How do you even move shares that you, like how do you get to a point where you even move uh, shares to your ownership, right? How do you get to a point where you even get access to the bank account? Like some those some of those simple questions that people don't know or understand or afraid to ask or don't or know are even possible. What do you do after you buy the business? Who's going to manage the business? Who's going to help you in a transition? Do you need the seller to stay or leave? How do you make him stay or leave? Do you need the management team? Who's going to stay with the employees? What about the products? What about the inventory? Who's going to run the day to day, right? Um, what are your, what is your role going to be, right? That's all about the deal execution. What are you going to do to grow the business, right? Those are all some of the things about deal execution. We're going to go through all of those in the next few days, but I want to give you kind of like a higher level overview of understanding what's involved in each, but it's simple. And the other thing, it comes down to three steps, right? Deal flow, deal analysis, deal execution, master those three things. You'll be good. So when you do this right, that's how you get successful acquisitions, right? Just follow those three steps, do them the right way. Make sure you're not making mistakes because like I said, small mistake here, mistakes here can cost you a fortune. And basically every day you're not taking action, you're pretty much paying for the university of not knowing, millions of dollars. Because every day you go by without doing a deal, you're basically losing millions of dollars in potential revenues that you would have otherwise. So now let's look at the big picture, right? Let's look at the big picture. So here's what it looks like. I just so you understand the vision and what's possible here. So first of all, it's kind of like, step one entrepreneur, right? We call it kind of like the amateur to entrepreneur phase, right? The finish line here is all about do your first deal, right? Do your first successful acquisition. You're an amateur, you're, after you basically finishing this step one, you have your successful acquisition. Your prize here is basically you have a seven figure business. You are the business owner, you are your own boss, right? And you get paid to build your future. You are not the visionary, you are not your own boss, you make your own money, um, you know, you're, you're not stuck anymore. You're not just kind of like trying things. From, from amateur to entrepreneur to wealthy, that's our goal here in the end of the day, to get you to a point where you're going from an amateur to entrepreneur to wealthy. Let, let, me, go to, to, let me walk you through some of those steps. Um, step two basically is all about wealthy, right? So. The finish line here is all about how to be top of your market, how to do a roll up, how to be the dominant person in your sector, how to get to a point where you hire a management team in place, right? When you have even an internal M&A team to do deals for you on a regular basis, how you have access to investors and you're doing things fast, how you dominate your area geographically, right? Uh, you have bigger problems right now. Your problem right now, how to make impact on your team, how to be a better leader, how to create more jobs, how to help people retire, solve bigger and better problems, All right? Those are some of the things you need to understand. This is hard work, remember, when you want to get to a point where you become wealthy and you do it by acquisition, this is hard work, All right? This is something you need to understand. Another thing that I think you all need to understand is the fact that you build wealth with concentration and preserve wealth with diversification, All right? So I know that I wish I learned that lesson many years ago because that would help me make much more money. The fact that the more focused you are on your acquisitions in one sector, the better you'll do, just so you know. Write it down somewhere. So I just want to make sure you're all clear with that, right? So remember, first step is all about getting to a point where you're just an amateur right now, having a very small business, to a point where you're an entrepreneur, in my opinion. You're not an entrepreneur before you own at least seven-figure business, right? Before you are your own boss, before you are kind of like the visionary right now, before you 
are in control of making your money, right? Usually before that phase of doing seven figures, people just try things, they're just stuck. A lot of people just diversify too early, right? They try too many things. They want to start 10 businesses instead of one, right? So that's how to overcome, like, that's what we're going to help you in this challenge and more is to help you go from, to get to a point where you're an actual entrepreneur, when you own seven business, right? Either by doing your first acquisition or by growing. If you have a business doing six figures, for example, right now, I want to get you to a point, point where you're buying a business and you're doing at least seven figures a year, right? At least a million a year plus. Before that, in my opinion, in my book, like you're just kind of like in the amateur level still. And again, no judging, just this, this is the way I want you to, I want you to step up to that level. Second thing, like we said, this is about buying more businesses, right? Growing by acquisitions, buying your competitors, right? That's some of the things you need to think about. Here, it's all about how to help you become a better leader, how to manage the team in a better way, all right? Those are some of the things you're going to have here. And remember here, be careful, don't diversify too fast. But then this is where a lot of you want to get into, right? And I'm hopeful in this process as well, in this phase working on is basically wealthy to build a legacy right it's basically a point where you're making the decision to either exit or to diversify and the way to do that is either to exit and then diversify in different sectors or to potentially diversify inside your business right this is a time where you need to protect your money and exponentially expand your wealth because you're looking at things in a more passive way right you're just thinking about the vision and everyone else is implementing things this is all about impact legacy lifestyle freedom this is where you really get the real 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 impact this is where you think about service about making a difference right about selfless action right in the end of the day this is how you get here but in the end of the day, to get here you got to help yourself with the first few steps entrepreneur wealth legacy right this is where you preserve your wealth this is where like and it's interesting to see so some entrepreneurs just sell their business and then they invest in different ways and uh, allocate capital in whatever the they way the way that they want to do it um it's interesting to see someone like jeff bezos for example he's diversifying a lot in his business so amazon started as a as a book company then they became the everything store now they they now they do everything right they, they pretty much he wants to go to to the moon as well so he's diversifying a lot in Amazon and also in other things that he's doing. All right, that's kind of like, I think, a good example. Um, and yeah, that's where you can really become a passive investor in different assets and, uh, and diversify your risk in different places and not just one thing or one business. And that's the real time to think about different asset allocations to preserve your wealth um, towards a recession. So those are, those are the steps you're going to get yourself into if you're going to commit to this journey. I just want to show you what's possible. So basically, seven figure first, then growing back acquisitions, a few businesses, and then legacy is all about exit, diversification, and preserving your wealth. All right. So that's the journey we're going to go through. I hope that's kind of like creating a ha moment for you. So let's go through the process now. Simple doesn't mean easy. That's one of the biggest things for you to understand. Simple doesn't mean easy, guys. All right, so let's talk about some of the mistakes that leave people stuck and slow in this process and broken and stressed. I've seen some horror stories of people spending their life fortune buying the wrong business, signing personal guarantees on the wrong deal, and then after they bought the business, they're like, you know, hey, Moran, I bought the bad business. Now I need to deploy more with my own capital to just save the business of not losing them all money. So that's the last thing I want you to get to, right? I've seen people miserable and confused. So that's the last thing I want to see and that's why we're doing this workshop to get to a point where you don't have those problems. So let's talk about mistakes in each of those steps, right? Some of the things. Um, so some people, first of all, don't know about acquisitions at all. Some people, a lot of you just don't know what you don't know, right? That you don't know about deal flow. Some of you don't know anything. Some of you um, don't know anything about wealth building or wealth preservation. Or, and in the end of the day, the cost is when you don't know anything, you just lose a fortune, right? You pay a fortune for the university of not knowing. So the biggest thing, first mistake, you're just not knowing about acquisitions in general, right? You don't know about deal flow. You don't know about deal analysis. You don't know about deal execution. You just don't know at all about acquisitions. The cost is obviously you just lose out on wealth. You're spending years of your life following or trying to climb the wrong tree to find out it's empty. There's nothing in there. 
right? And you don't want to waste years of your life on doing the wrong thing because you don't even know that acquisitions are possible. Another big mistake I see is limited deal flow. People just don't know how to find deals or they're using only one way to find deals. They don't know how to position themselves in, when, you talk to, when they talk to business owners. The business owner is not taking them seriously. A lot of problems in deal flow. They don't know how to pick the right sector for them. They're picking the wrong sector for them. Some of those mistakes. Um, and obviously, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, right? You get to a point where you're trapped. You only do one thing. And even that, maybe you don't even do, you know how to do it good wasting a lot of time. Um, poor and slow deal analysis, right? A lot of people don't know how to analyze deals. They're taking, sometimes I see people spending months trying to analyze one deal and then finding out that they can't even close the deal because the seller is not even serious or they don't know how to finance the deal. Like so many mistakes that I see of people just don't know how to analyze deals and then they're spending a lot of time. Um, and yeah, they can't handle volume, they miss opportunity. Because if you can only handle one deal analysis for a few months, you're just wasting time. If the, if the deal didn't close, you know, you just wasted a lot of your time. So you want to know how to analyze deals fast, which we're going to show you. Um, and yeah, the cost, you pursue bad deals. Because you spent six months on one deal, you're just like, oh man, I spent six months, let's just try to close this deal anyway, even if it's a bad deal. And that's when you see people spend their life savings on the wrong deal. There's nothing wrong spending your life savings on the good deal that you really believe in and you want to, you know, kind of like take some risks. I think that's part of being an entrepreneur. But when you do it because you're um, taking an emotional decision that comes from uh, just lack of knowledge, I think that's super bad. And then obviously people don't know how to execute on deals, right? It's so a bad deal execution anywhere from not knowing how to do due diligence, pain, too much money for the wrong advisors, uh, spending small fortune on doing due diligence on deals that never close, uh, not knowing how to transition the, 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 the closing and management and onboarding on owning a business. A lot of mistakes there as well. And obviously then you're screwed on the back end. You're owning a business that you just screwed. Um, and yeah, if you, some people just don't know how to finish the deal. Right? They don't know how to close the deal. They don't even know what, what, what is involved when you close a deal, right? Like, like I said some of the things before, like what is even involved with the seller, with the bank, with the lawyer, with the accountant, with an advisor, with, with the employees, with the clients? What's going to happen? Who do I need to talk to? What do I need to ask them? What do I need to make sure is staying or not in the business? What kind of assets are staying? What kind of liabilities are not, right? Are we doing asset purchase or stock purchase? A lot of those things that can really stop people from closing the deal. Yep, and as you see here, you just waste time and energy. That's the last thing you want, right? The one thing we all have the same, same time and, and energy. And the last thing we want is to spend your time. And that's my goal with this challenge for you is to get to a point where, you know, if you're here, if you're giving me the most important thing of your life, your time, I want to make sure you get the most out of value for it. So I don't want you to waste time and energy. Um, so yeah, the cost, lots of work, very little wealth, right? Another mistake, not having the right deal flow, right? People just have their own deal flow. They don't do the right work. They, like I said, they're, they're, they're limited on deals, right? So here's what's happened. They overpay on poor deals because they don't know how to do the right deal flow. Right? They don't know where to find, how to find, how to approach, where to approach, how to position. And then they just do whatever deal they find and they're attached to just one deal and they do a bad one. So yeah, less at bats is expensive. Um, and obviously attached negotiations are bad. You don't want to be attached to one deal because that's the only deal you have. Right? It's super bad. You want to have abundance of deals. You want to have a lot of ways to look at deals. You want to have lots of scripts and places and um, automations and things like that. Another mistake, not understanding deal analysis, right? They just don't understand. They don't know how to know if a deal is even good or not, or if you can even make money in the deal or not. Right? That's a big mistake that I see people are making. And then what they do is they buy a bad business or lose on a great opportunity. The cost, waste of time and energy on the wrong deals. They're missing on amazing deals, right? That's another, another big problem. We don't want you to miss on amazing deals. When you find an amazing deal, we want to make sure you do everything you can to close it. And we want to give you all the skills to close it. We don't want you to buy a bad business, right? We don't want you to spend a year 
like over complicating things and moving slow i see so many people because they don't know what they don't know they're moving slow they're over complicating things they think they need to learn more stuff buy another book buy another course just you don't need that um a lot of people you know and then what they do is they pay for stuff they don't need right hiring people to do your due diligence before you even know the basics right know the basics that's what we're doing here we want you to know the basics we don't want to pay to pay by the hour if you pay by the hour for someone trust me they're going to charge you a lot of hours right i know people who paid small fortune analyzing the wrong deals because they paid the wrong advisor they didn't even know how to screen the right advisors they didn't even know how to look for the right advisors or to know if they even needed an advisor right those are some of the things you need to be careful for obviously the cost is being overwhelmed and losing opportunity so keep it simple you know here's what you want keep it simple deal flow deal analysis deal execution simple 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 and then obviously we're going to go through each of those so you know all you need it comes down to simple things you need to understand in each step when you do those things the right way that's what you get successful acquisitions and that's what you want it's what you hear that's what you're here for you're here to buy the right business to make you enough money in income in dividends in bonuses in exit at closing i'm going to show you how to make some of that money as well but this is what you're here for to buy the wrong the right business to make you money that's it right so you can have a great impact so you could give back so you could grow and share and contribute even more and if you can do it once, if you're going to show you how to do it once, trust me, you can then repeat the process as much as you want, even hundred times. So let's get started. So let's start with the action steps for this day. All right. So I hope you, I share with you some of the mistakes, some of the lessons. I don't want you to get overwhelmed. I want you to get focused. I don't want you to make mistakes that I see a lot of people are making. All right. So let's start with the wealth plan. This is the action step for today. And remember, post in the group after you go through that. That's like, you gotta have the North Star in front of you, right? You gotta start with the end in mind. When I look at each one of you, I want to get to a point where you get to a point that you make, you have enough money in savings or wherever invested where, I don't know if you're familiar with the 4% rule, but it basically says that if you're taking, if you're investing in a very, a pretty safe asset vehicle and you're making, let's say seven, 8% a year return, and you're taking 4% out of it each year, uh, basically the, the capital that was in there in the first place won't get touched and you can leave from that 4%, right? And obviously it can come as, it depends on how you're looking, it depends if it's it invested in equity or in some kind, of, or some kind of asset that provides income for you. But I want you to look at things where 4% of the number that you want and have in mind, if it's 1 million, 10 million, that 4% of that will allow you to pay your expenses and live the lifestyle that you want. So what is the number for you? Is it 1 million, 10 million, more, right? And, and let's let's talk about the, the years, right? So what's your goal for the next 10 years, three years, one year? What's the net worth you wanna have? What assets you wanna have? What income you wanna have, right? And start to think, how many acquisitions will get you there? And I'm gonna share with you some example, but most of the money you can get is at exit, right? But then you also need to ask yourself, do you even want to exit? Right? Or maybe just reinvest back into the business to get better returns on money in, in a place that you understand, right? which is what we talked about here today. But those are some of the things I wanted to start to think about, right? to look at things in a more broader perspective and not just think, okay, like let's, let's get you focused. Let's actually write the goal of where you want to be in a year from now, in three years, in 10 years, and make sure that you know, we're taking action on that. Let's start to think on what do you want your day-to-day -to, -day to look like, your, your ideal average day-to-day. -day. Don't talk to me about a day-to-day -day that, says that you're going to travel and whatever and visit this place or this place no let's talk about an average day today let's trade let's say that you traveled all around the world you saw every city and country that you want and you came back what's now what's an average day today looks like then for you where is it what location who are you going to be with like write down an average day today right how much money how much you will take from each deal right from each acquisition how much in salary dividends bonuses exits Dive into the, those details if you think and feel like. So let's share with you an example. So here's what's possible in this space. So I believe in the first year, you can definitely do your first acquisition at least. We have people who bought three and 10 businesses in a year, just to give you an idea. But I'm, I don't want you to, again, I'm managing your expectation. If you, even if you're gonna do one deal in a year, trust me, you're gonna do very good, right? So let's say you buy a business doing 3 million in revenues, uh, 300,000 in EBITDA, which is basically pre-tax profit. And let's say we buy it at three times multiples and 
we work to grow it internally, right? We're doing more sales, more marketing, better promotions, better uh, team members, better processes, better KPIs to follow, things like that. So, right, let's say first year we just did one deal. Very doable, right? Especially when I'm going to show you how to raise capital and close those deals and get to a point where you potentially being diluted, potentially not, potentially you can put your money, potentially not. I'm going to share with you all those things in the next video, but let, let's just talk about, let's just keep the end in mind for now, right? Let's, let's not talk, talk about the details and how, let's just have a goal so we're getting excited on and, and knowing what we work on. And also then when you're going to see a deal, you know, okay, this is like, if you're going to look at, if, if, if that's your goal, for example, and you're going to look at a business doing less than 30 million, maybe you'll skip it because be like, hey, that's not going to help me get to my four or five or 10 year goal, right? So th that's the reason for you to write those things. So let's say we buy one business first year. Those are the numbers. Let's say second year, we need a second deal, right? Very doable. One deal in a year. Very, very doable, right? Same numbers, right? We didn't really stretch too much. Maybe it's a bit higher, a bit lower. It's okay, right? But approximately those numbers. Now we own two businesses, right? Potentially ideal in the same sector, maybe a complementary business or a competitor. And now we do what we call synergies and cross-selling opportunities. And this is how you get an extra 1 million in revenues from those two businesses, right? So let's, be, let's make sure we both on the same, we all on the same page, right? So third business got up to 3 million in revenues. Second business got us to 6 million in revenues. Then we did synergies and cross-selling, which got us another 1 million. So we're now at 7 million. The way to do synergies and cross-selling is just things like removing duplicates, right? So you don't need, you have two businesses, you don't need two lawyers, two accountants, you don't need two marketing teams, you don't need two HR uh, departments, etc., etc. right? That's how you save money. That's how you do synergies. Cross-sell, and we, we're probably gonna share some more about that in some of the last days. Cross-selling are all about selling your product and services to the target list of clients and vice versa. So you bought a second business, the second business now have a list of clients and services that you can sell to your first business, right? And vice versa. That's how you can get a better upside, uh, more in revenues. Um, and obviously you're going to get more profits as well. Anyway, let's, let's play with those numbers. Those are very, very fair and we're not stretching at all here, in my opinion. So let's say end of second or third year, depends how fast you do it. You own now a 7 million a year business in revenue. Right, doing 600 to 1 million in EBITDA in pre-tax profit. And let's say in the third year, or fourth, or as much as it's going to take you, it doesn't matter, right? It all depends on you. Maybe it's going to, you can do all in one year or a few months. It all depends on you, your capability, your background, your skills, your talent. Everyone here is different, right? There are companies out there who buy dozens of companies every year. There are people out there who don't even know about acquisitions that won't do one acquisition in their lifetime, right? So everyone here is going to be different. But this is kind of like, I think, a very reasonable goal to have. So let's say the third year, we now have 7 million business. Now we bought a similar company to ours, right? We kind of like grew in our targets. So at the end of the fourth year or third or whenever we're going to do that, we now have a company, a holding company that owns three businesses, total doing 14 million in revenues, right? We did some more synergies and cross-selling opportunities and we're doing around 2 to 3 million in EBITDA, right? And now, because remember we said before that a bigger business will sell for more, we can now sell the business for five times to 10 times, potentially even more, uh, sometimes less, depends on who is the buyer. We're gonna talk some more about that. If it's a strategic buyer, financial buyer, there's a lot of uh, measurements and things to look at when you sell a business. And that will determine of how much someone will pay you. But in the end of the day, business is worth what someone was willing to pay for it. But here, I think it's a very fair number to talk about five to 10 times multiples. So let's go on the lower end on both. Let's say you're doing only 2 million, selling for five. We're talking about 10 million in exit, um, right? Plus, we don't even talk about seven figures that you can take throughout owning those businesses, right? So it's not like you're only going to take money at exit. You're also going to take money while owning the business throughout uh, an income that you have if you run the day-to-day -day and working the day-to-day -day throughout bonuses or dividends or whatever you want or paying yourself in a consultancy fee. All depends on your tax situations and wherever you're at and what's the best situation for you to take money out of the business. Uh, and you're gonna take probably around seven figures at least, multiple potentially seven figures out of the business throughout those years, right? And obviously you can make a lot of money at exit. Another way to look at it is you can just stay in the business and continue to grow it to be even a bigger business, right? And potentially take it public and then maybe just sell part of your equity and be diluted 
a little bit, but then I have access to some of it in cash, some of it in equity, right? There's a lot of things here with, which we might expand on in the next few days. But I want to share with you on kind of like what's possible, right? And heck, if you want to exit and potentially change your tax residence to receive uh, most or all of that money in your pocket uh, without tax or very little tax, uh, that's kind of like what I did. Um, I'm a resident of a few countries in the world, um, uh, Panama, Cyprus. So some of those countries, we can expand on that as well if you will want. Uh, but there's ways to do that and have, a, um, let's just say, a, a, a nice exit planning situation where you can have. So I hope that kind of like opened your eyes to what's possible. Go through that as well. Go through that lesson. Go through the training. Write down what do you want. Where do you want to be in one year, two years, three years, ten years? Write it down. Right? Dream. That's the time to dream. And I would also suggest you write down next to it how it's going to feel when you're going to live those dreams, right? What's, what's your day-to-day going to look like when you have 10 million in your bank account? Write it down. Dream. I think it will really, really change your perspective and will open your eyes to those opportunities and to the right deals when you look at them. So I hope that you got some value. I think that, yeah, write down your wealth plan. That's your homework. Remember, post in the group, stay engaged. You're going to get bonuses if you're going to stay engaged. Write down, share some feedback, share some lessons, help others. Like That's the time to be involved. We want to help you. We want to support you. We want to help you connect with others. We want to help connect everyone. We want to help connect the world through acquisitions. I really believe it's possible. There's so many people who want to be involved in this space, but I don't know if it's even possible. Share this challenge with everyone you can. Um, I really think it can change your life and others if you're gonna bring them to the table. And heck, it's just so much more fun to do it with someone else that you like and appreciate and, and can connect with and share challenges with. Because remember, it's not gonna be easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. And it's always fun to do it with someone that you appreciate and love. So uh, go and share it, share the lesson, share the um, homework. Um, I hate the word homework, but share, just write down your wealth plan in the Facebook group um, so we could see where you wanna be and see how we can help you get there. So post in the group and tomorrow we're going to talk about deal flow, right? So today we talked about the acquisition method, right? I hope you got some value and we opened your eyes to what's possible. Tomorrow we're going to talk about deal flow and how to start to get to find those deals, the secret to finding the deals that can change everything for you. That's tomorrow. I'm super, super excited to get there and really get the work started. I hope today we opened your eyes to what's possible, to some of the mistakes, to some of the opportunities, to why buying a small business as a passive investor, as an active entrepreneur is probably the best and new, most exciting things you can do in the next decade um, and why the opportunity is out there right now. There's never been a better time to do that. Um, I don't know for how long this opportunity is going to be out there before it, um, you know, it's not going to be as exciting or the returns are going to be as good. But now there's never been a better time, especially with all the craziness that's going on in the economy right now. So I really want, to, want you to make the most out of it. And welcome to day two of the Acquisitions Masterclass. My name is Moran Tuber. I'm the founder and CEO of Acquisitions.com. And I want to get right to it. So if you remember, this is our acquisitions process. We don't want to overwhelm you. We want to make sure that you're getting results. In the end of the day, things comes down to deal flow, deal analysis, deal execution. This is what this challenge, this process and masterclass is all about. So today we're really diving into deal flow. So, um, and obviously, yeah, post in the group, like encourage, encourage others, right? Uh, post in the group, you can find amazing partners, joint ventures, people, who knows, maybe you could find life partners in there as well. Go in there. And those who are going to be the most engaged, we're also going to share with them some more prizes. We're going to surprise you. One of our team members is going to private message you every now and then uh, with cool, more surprises, more extra content and, and things like that. And, and just cool, cool, cool things um, that we can share with you if you're going to be out there and engage and share and share your lessons and distinctions. Uh, in the end of the day, I really think that the most selfish thing you can do in life is to be a selfless, right? Go out there, help people and read the book by the name of the Diamond Cutter. I'd like to remind that it's, it's really changed my life and I can't stop recommending that to everyone I meet. So go post in the group um, and do that to, to learn, right? Like, the best way to learn is to teach. So go out there, teach, inspire, help others. And, you know, who knows? Maybe you're going to help someone who is about to give up. Um, you take an action will inspire others, right? It will make people want to take another chance. So do that. Um, yeah. So just go to acquisitions.com forward slash group to post on your progress. So today, let's dive into some content. So today we're diving into deal flow, right? So why deal flow is even important? 
in the end of the day, it all comes down to the deal, right? You can, you can close the deal, you can buy a business if you don't have a deal to look at. One good deal can make you financially free or grow by year's worth of revenue if you're a business owner. You, you can grow by year's worth of sales in an afternoon if you're buying a business similar to yours, right? That's something that you can't do organically with just more marketing and sales. Um, and for s- most of you, your first goal is just to become financially free, to make a few thousand dollars or above $10,000 a month um, owning a business. And that can basically get you financially free. You can definitely get it with one good deal. Obviously, if you buy a business, you don't need to build a new product or test new product or test the market. You don't need to come with new ideas or be unique or spend a lot of money testing things while things are unproven. There's less risk. Um, you're less likely to fail when you buy a business. So just quick reminders, you're basically skipping the startup phase. And if you're using SPVs, which is a special purpose vehicle, uh, it protects you legally as well. And remember that the acquisitions target takes the loan. It's not you personally that is liable if you don't want. You can always sign personal guarantees if you are on kind of like an empire, empire builder phase and maybe you don't care and it's okay and you don't have anything to lose. And if you want to go all in, that's something that you might actually want to consider to sign personal guarantees because, you know, you want to care more about the upside. Um, and yeah, in the end of the day, oops, sorry here. <laughs> in the end of the day, you want to take those risks if you want to build an empire, right? But if it's just kind of like a lifestyle thing for you, then you don't have to. You don't have to sign personal guarantees. There's a, a lot of ways to do it without it as well. Uh, but I like to say you can't fall from the bottom. So if you don't have anything to lose, you need to consider that as well. I'll probably talk about it more in the future, but... You also need to understand, in, probably in one of the next days, when you raise capital, personal guarantees agreement and loan agreements are separate agreements. So when a bank is giving you a loan agreement, it's not necessarily, not necessarily mean that you need to sign personal guarantees. So just, just keep that in mind as well. Um, and you remember, when you buy a business, I mean, you buy something that's already working, it's proven, it's, it's already reached the product market fee, there's testimonials, people are uh, successful clients, employees, uh, processes that you have access to right away. You don't need to build things from scratch. It's like when you go out there and buy a computer or a car, you don't build it from scratch, right? You just go out there and buy something existing and proven. Um, And what I really like about the space of acquisitions is it can be best of both worlds. If you want to be a lifestyle entrepreneur, I think it can be amazing for you. Or if you, because it's a great way to just have an existing business that's bringing enough cash flow and then you can just use that cash flow to hire a manager to run your day-to-day. Obviously, you need to, uh, learn how to handle him, how to manage him, how to make sure he's, he's incentivized and all that. There's a lot to it, but it's a great way to build a lifestyle. Um, I guess lifestyle life, right, as an entrepreneur. And obviously, if you want to build an empire, that's the best way to do because you can grow by acquisitions. That's what the best, biggest companies in the world are doing. So if you get this right, if you get this right, the deal flow process, in the end of the day, like it just means for you more opportunities, better deals, way higher chance of success and better negotiations, right? In the end of the day, if you don't have deals, I mean, if you do have deals, let's start with that. Like you have abundance, you have more choices to look at. Um, Obviously, you'll have more chances of being successful because you have many, many opportunities. And then even if one one deal won't work, you're not going to give up. Plus, you come in from abundance place when you're talking to business owners and you have a lot of deals in the pipeline you have a lot of certainty and abundance and even if one business owner tells you that he don't want to do a deal with you you don't really care because you have hundreds of other deals that you're looking at so it's very very important to really put focus on this deal flow process like if you don't bring in deals um yeah like you want to have deals period Um, If you get this wrong, this deal flow process, then you'll just spend too much time on deals that you can't close. I've seen that a lot of times. People find just one deal and then they're spending um, a lot of time, sometimes months or even years trying to buy just that one business. Uh, They're very much in a scarcity mode. They're very much dependent on that one deal. And if they're not closing the deal, they're depressed. Um, They wasted uh, a lot of time of their life. Um... And if you don't know where to find those deals or where to build yourself abundance of deals, you're just going to give up uh, too fast. So one side of the things that you're going to work on one deal for a long time, the other side of it is that you're just going to give up because you don't have, you're not going to have deals to look at. You're going to say like, ah, this is not working. I can't even find deals. I don't know how to position myself with those deals that I find. And you're just going to give up, right? So that's the last thing we want you uh, to happen for you.
Um, and obviously, you, you, you'll just overthink things um, and you won't take action to begin with. Like some, some of you, you're either going to overthink things, you're going to be scared to make mistakes when you only have one deal to look at. It's very, very difficult. It's almost, think about it, if you have a business and you try to get a client at a time, which most businesses do, if you only have one prospect you're talking to, um, it's very, very difficult to grow a successful business. The way to grow a successful business is to build a funnel, is to talk to a lot of prospects. Some of them will become clients and same here. The same process applies here. To get deals um, is very similar to getting clients, just the difference is that here you position yourself as someone who's buying a business and not someone who's selling a product or a service. So your service, your product is basically, hey, I'll buy your business, right? But it's very, very similar to owning a business and going out there and creating marketing campaigns. So let's dive in. So here's um, today's outline. So first, we just going to get you ready for the deal flow, right? So kind of like pre-work stuff. Um, then we're going to talk to you about all about the, the first phase, which is just to understand some of the principles of deal flow. Uh, then we're going to talk to you about uh, the second phase of deal flow, which is just to understand a little bit about, more about systems in this world of bringing deal flow. Uh, we're also going to talk about common mistakes and how to make sure you're avoiding those common mistakes that cause massive problems down the road if you're making those. And the last thing I want you to do is spend a small fortune and months or sometimes years of your life making small fortune mistakes. So like we said, if you're looking to buy a million dollar business, you can also make million dollar mistakes if you're doing the wrong things. And sometimes those mistakes can uh, be mistakes of spending money. And sometimes those could be mistakes of just spending a lot of time, unnecessary time, if you don't have the full process and the full understanding and the full formula of how things are looking in each part of the process and the nuances to make sure you're not making those mistakes. And we're going to go through those as well. So remember, our mission in this masterclass, in this challenge is simple. Our goal with this in the end of the day is to get you into actual conversations and sending offers to business owners in those five days. I want to show you that it's possible. I want to show you that it's real and you can do that. I don't care who you are. You are capable. It's possible for you. I want to empower you that you can do that. And I want to connect you with amazing people in that network that we're building here for all of us to do amazing deals. Some of us as investors, some of us as the entrepreneurs, some of us as just connectors with each other. Um, that's my goal for you with this masterclass. We also obviously here to give you enough information to go out there and buy your first business or the first bolt on to your existing business and grow your business by acquisition for the first time. Um, yeah, obviously we have a lot to cover, so we're gonna focus on the 80-20, right? So the 20% that will get you 80% of the results. That's our goal here. Each day, just a reminder, we're also gonna give you some action steps. So also today we're gonna give you action steps. We don't want you to lose momentum, we want you to build momentum. Because in the end of the day, it comes down to domino effect, right? We want you to focus on one domino each day and we want to make sure that you move it and take little action every single day. That's the best way to be successful. And then if you're moving just one domino every single day, you're taking action a little bit every single day. If you're going to look at yourself in one year, you won't recognize yourself. Think about working out, getting into shape. I, I like to always use those, that, that example because everyone understands that. Like if you want to get in shape or maybe once in your lifetime you really got into great shape, it comes down to doing very simple things every day but repeating them on a regular basis in a very consistent manner. And then if you're following those dominoes every single day, within a few months or one year, you won't recognize yourself, right? You can get into the best shape of your life if you are following those things every single day a little bit. And just a quick reminder, there's so many deals out there. There's too many deals out there available for everyone. And what we're doing here with acquisitions.com is we're building an army and deal flow to eventually invest in. We are investing in deals. We are investing in companies of our people in our network, of our people in, the, in our community. And what we love in what we're doing here is that everyone here is in a different geographic location. Everyone here have different backgrounds and experience and, and people that they know. Um, and we want to help each other uh, do those deals. Some of those deals you'll do on your own. Some of them I know that we'll eventually be able to do with you and help you close them and potentially even invest in your deal if needed. And just also another reminder, remember those things can only happen if you take massive actions, right? Um, so at the end of this day, 
uh, we're going to give you the action steps, right? We're not going to leave you out without actions. We want you to take action. We want you to build momentum. We want you to see results as soon as possible. And then feel that success, feel that fulfillment that comes from seeing the even just a little success right now. And then every day that goes by, seeing a little bit more success, a little bit more success, seeing that it's possible. That's what will give you those amazing results that you're dreaming about. So you ready? If you're ready, let's dive, let's dive in. And just um, to remind you, this is sponsored, all this challenge and masterclass uh, is sponsored by Acquisitions University. Acquisitions University is our full mentorship program that provides step-by-step -step detailed training on all things acquisitions with all the nuances, all the details, agreements, documents, uh, contracts, financial modules, everything you need, as well as 12 months of weekly Q&A calls with me and other M&A professionals, uh, full 24-7 support, and more than 1,000 people of strong community of people out there, business owners and entrepreneurs who are out there looking to buy one, two, three, heck, we even had people buying seven or 10 businesses in one year. Uh, it's very hands-on. Uh, then obviously we pick our best members and invest in them as well. So share the challenge. Again, quick reminder to share the challenge and we're also gonna share with you um, masterclass on a live deal we're doing right now, plus an opportunity to be part of the Acquisitions University. So let's get to work on today's uh, deal flow stuff, right? So here's a little bit about uh, the pre-work. So for amazing deal flow, here's what you need. First of all, you need to pick a sector. And if you don't have a sector to pick, um, you can be sector agnostic, which is basically be involved in all sectors. And I'm gonna talk about that in a bit as well. Um, you need clarity on what you want. I think one of the biggest problems in, I guess in, in human beings overall is that they don't have clarity of intent of what they really want. There's always too many thoughts, too many thinkings. And because you don't have clarity, you're not able to take consistent action on just one thing. So clarity is super, super important in business and I think anything in life. Uh, we're gonna talk about scripts and how to reach out to business owners and eventually also how to talk to them and how to position yourself. Positioning is crucial because the way you start is the way you end. If you don't know how to position yourself as a credible buyer, no one will take you seriously, right? So that's super, super important as well in this um, uh, deal flow part. Uh, we're also going to talk about off-market deals, which is a very, very blue, blue ocean area. Um, in the end of the day, the best deals are deals that are not for sale or businesses that are not for sale. There's much less competition or usually no competition whatsoever. So we're going to talk more about that as well and how to find those amazing deals. You're also going to talk about brokers and how to position yourself well with brokers. I think it's super critical as well. We're going to talk about it today and I think a little bit tomorrow as well. Because brokers are bringing great deals as well if you know how to position yourself with them and if you know what are the differences between off-market deals and deals with brokers and you know how to make the best of both uh, worlds. Um, plus, you need to understand everyone you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with brokers, you need to understand how to work with them and understand that uh, they have obviously their goals and, and their incentives and they just want to make um, their business work. Um, so you need to understand what's their uh, agenda, I guess, of, of being involved in a deal and you need to know how to handle it and obviously position yourself in a way that makes sense for them and you. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to build a deal flow machine, all about automations and systems. Um, when we're building it for ourselves and for our clients, we're seeing at least 10, 20 deals a week coming to us. And that's very, very exciting. Um, and I'm talking off-market deals. So that's very, very important to learn and understand as well. So let's start and focus on uh, the first two. So let's talk a little bit about picking a sector and clarity on what you want, right? So let's start and talk about choosing your first sector. Uh, there's a lot we can talk about being involved in a sector, right? There's few considerations to choosing what you want. So there's few things that involve and definitely write some notes if you have um, a place to write because you need to make a decision and the better you make that decision now, the easier it will be for you when you find the deal that you want because you prepared yourself and you know what you want. So it comes down first to picking deal size, right? So let's talk a little bit about deal size, company size, and what we what do we suggest you to pick? So my first answer would be, 
pick whatever you want, right? I'm not here to make decisions for you. I'm here to share with you what worked for us and our clients. But I can't live your life for you. You need to make your own decisions based on where you're at. Some of you here are business owners who run seven, eight, or even nine figure businesses. I know some of you are involved in this in this masterclass are those business owners. And some of you never owned a business in the past. Um, maybe you never even worked at a high level position in a business. So you don't know much about business. Uh, there's no right or wrong, either is okay. But some of you will have a different learning curve than the other. And based on where you at, it's probably also going to determine what size of business you'll be more comfortable with, All right? So let's talk a bit about each. So I'd say first type of business are businesses doing below 1 million a year in revenues. Revenues is basically sales, amounts of sales in that business. So let's say if the business is doing below 1 million or let's say between, um, let's say 500,000 even, I'd say it's, it's even in the same category. When you're buying those businesses, especially if it's below 500,000 a year in revenues, uh, you you need to understand that you're not just buying a business, but you're also buying yourself a job usually. Because you most likely will need to be involved in the day-to-day. -day. You'll need to be the CEO. You need to be involved in a lot of things because you're buying it usually from business owners who are running the day-to-day, -day, right? They're doing a lot of the work. So you need to keep that in mind. Again, there's no right or wrong, but you'll need to keep that in mind. So if your goal is to buy a business and be a lifestyle entrepreneur, you'll need to think if that's the route you want to take. And it still could be a good business size for you because you could buy the business, you can uh, stabilize it, you can maybe grow it a bit and then use some of the cash flow to hire a manager. Um, for some of you, it also be good because you want to build, you don't care, you want to build an empire in that sector and you say to yourself, hey, you know what? Let me buy whatever business size I can in that sector and let me learn everything I can about that sector. So that can be great as well. And now maybe you can replace your existing income from your job or whatever you do um, and basically learn about the sector, have an income, plus have equity in a business, which is the best way to build wealth, right? So that's kind of like that size. So let's say businesses doing below a million or half a million a year in revenues. And I'm talking US dollars, but yeah, it doesn't really matter. Just just pick it with your, your currency. Um, next size of business are, I'd say, anywhere between 1 to 5, 10 or sometimes up to 20 million in revenues. And I know the, the range is pretty big, but it really depends on the business, on the sector, on the management team and how they build their business. Uh, but the thing is that I would say up to five to 10 million a year in revenues, you have less competition. You'll see that when you're talking to those business owners and you're positioning yourself as the buyer, usually you won't have anyone competing with you. Uh, when we're looking at businesses doing above 10 million and definitely above 20 million a year in revenues, you're now competing with uh, larger institutions, investors, usually private equity firms, some family offices, sometimes venture capital firms. So you need to prepare yourself for um, very difficult or more difficult competition because those um, those institutions have uh, access to, to a lot of capital and you need to prepare yourself to that. The sweet spot that I found our business is doing between one to 10 million a year in revenue because with those business owners, we don't have much competition. Uh, the deal is very much dependent on the relationship that you build with the owner. The owner very much care about his employees still because you don't have hundreds of employees usually or thousands of employees. He usually knows uh, uh, most of the employees very closely. Uh, a lot of those employees are very close to him. It's almost like his family. Uh, the business is like his baby at that size. And then everything that you're doing to position yourself as the reliable buyer, as the safe pair of hand, is really, really going to help you to get a better deal term compared to those who have deeper pockets. What you find out is that the, when the business is bigger, uh, usually the owner care less about what's going to happen with the business after the acquisition because he's just less attached to the employees uh, because you just don't know anyone by name anymore. There's so many employees. And what he'll care about at that stage is usually the vision of the business and the um, acquirer um, and obviously the, the money and the term that he's going to get. So if you're not sure, I would say pick the range between 1 to 5 or 1 to 10 million a year in revenues. Um, but obviously, um, it really depends on you. It really depends on your experience, your background. I'd say if you're just getting started, um, if your goal is to build an empire, replace your existing income, 
look at any business doing above 100,000, 200,000 that can basically replace your existing income um, up to five or 10 million a year in revenues, right? That would be my suggestion if you're not sure, right? But again, don't overwhelm yourself, keep it simple. Um, I prefer that you talk to larger businesses and get a no than not, don't, talk, don't talk to anyone just because I said so, right? In the end of the day, it's gonna be your decision. Um, and it really depends on the owner and who you're gonna meet as well. Uh, but that's just what I've seen um, over the last few years. Uh, also, some more things you want to consider is what do you wanna do in the deal? Like, do you wanna work full-time, like we said? Um, do you want to buy just one company and hire a management team and have a chill, kind of like a four-hour work week type lifestyle? Or do you want to be um, someone who's working all in 24-7, building an empire, building, um, you know, a, a larger vision with bigger impact in the world? And again, there's no right or wrong. And it might be start lifestyle, then build an empire if you want, or stay a lifestyle. What I found out is that having that four-hour work week lifestyle can be very boring. Like There's only so many pina coladas you can drink. Um, which led me right now to, to work on building, um, I want to say an empire, like something with a big impact. And what you're seeing right now with what you're doing is just the beginning. There's a lot of plans for us in the background to help a lot of you and build here something meaningful, um, not just for ourselves, but for a lot of entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs and existing entrepreneurs and business owners that we can impact and connect with each other um, via acquisitions. So I know some of you are asking me kind of like where I see myself. Uh, but I, I, I achieved that lifestyle thing. I achieved the passive income thing. I achieved the financial freedom thing. Um, so for me right now, it's kind of like just a play. Hey, let's play with the big guys. Let's see if I can build something meaningful and massive. Um, um, but again, where you're at is different. So it all, it all depends on where you want to be and where you're seeing yourself. Maybe you just want to be a passive investor and just put capital into deals and, and trust other CEOs to run the business. And maybe you just want to get like monthly or quarterly, quarterly reports, right? And just be on the board and you just trust the CEO. Um, some of you uh, don't even want to be the CEO or investor. Some of you might have an existing service business, for example. You can go out there and, and do deals and get equity in different type of deals and build yourself some kind of a portfolio that way. Um, others here I know um, are literally M&A advisors, mergers and acquisition advisors. So maybe you want to get fees that way doing deals um, or equity doing deals or... You know, some of you here can eventually become an uh, advisors for other companies and help them find companies. So it really depends on where you see yourself. Do you see yourself as a CEO? You see yourself maybe as someone who's just even finding deals for others. And maybe you get someone to pay you an income um, and or equity. I know that I know that a lot of people in our community will be happy to do that. I know that we pay some people sometimes uh, for those things. Um, and maybe... Yeah, so, so you just need to make a decision on where you see yourself, right? Who you are. Maybe you want to build an empire, like I said. Maybe you want to build a conglomerate or build a, like a portfolio uh, with different companies, right? So what do you want? Ask yourself those questions. Um, another good question to ask yourself is like, what are you good at? What are your weaknesses? Um, and that's going to help you to know, okay, what do you want to do? Who do you want to hire? Uh, what about location of the business? Is that ma- does, does that matter to you? Um, you can buy businesses remote, but where do you want to be? Like maybe some people I know want to buy businesses for a visa in different countries to immigrate to different countries. Some people just want to get away from their wife <laughs> and buy businesses in different countries because of that. Some people want to have an excuse to travel, to do weekends in different businesses where the business can pay for your expenses. Um, maybe you just want to have something international, have businesses all over the world, right? And have some kind of a approach that way um, so everyone got different goals you just need to ask yourself where do you see yourself so more good questions to ask yourself is um, who do you know where do you have contacts what are your passion what are you curious about um, maybe just even what type of person do you want to serve uh, right so for me right now the reason i'm doing this the acquisition.com thing is that i really want to um, serve young entrepreneurs or just entrepreneurs in general, business owners, entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs. That's my niche. Those are the people I want to help because I see myself in that space and I really, really am excited and passionate about that and I'll do whatever I can to help that that space, those people. Uh, those are my people. You are my people and that's why I'm here basically wasting my uh, precious moments of, of life that we have uh, with you guys. Um, all, all, some more good questions to ask yourself is what, are your, what is your background? What expertise do you have? Um, and start to think, what is my least resistant approach? What would be my least resistant business to pick? What would be the low-hanging fruit business for me to own, right? Usually the best ideas are literally 
beneath us, like next to us, right? So don't think that you need to get yourself into something completely different than what you know. Um, like I know someone who, who used to drive for Uber and then went to buy transportation companies, right? So it's like, it, it was just for him common sense. So again, no right or wrong, but ask yourself some of those questions and we're going to dive into some more of those in a bit as well. But I hope, I hope it opened your eyes for some of the things you want to think about uh, when you're looking at businesses or when you're even thinking of what businesses you want to have. And in the end of the day, please don't overthink it. If you don't have a kind of like a low hanging fruit or least resistance sector and you're just not sure, I would say just for now, big sector agnostic, focus on the numbers in the deal and the potential upside that the business can have. And just focus on businesses doing between one to five or up to 10 million in revenues if you're not sure, right? Just make a decision. Okay, I'm not sure. Those are the businesses I'm going to look at. And if I don't know what sector I want to look at, I'm just going to look at all sectors based on those numbers. Simple, right? Keep it simple for now. In the end of the day, leaders decide. If you're here, you need to see yourself as the leader, as a leader in general, as the business owner, as the investor, as someone who's involved in acquisitions. See yourself as a leader. And jump into the water. Don't be afraid. Jump into the water, water and almost like learn to swim as you go. Like after you're in the water, that's when you learn to swim. That's what being an entrepreneur is pretty much like. And ask yourself, like, what's the worst case? Like you have nothing to lose. Talk to business owners. Worst case, someone's going to tell you to, you know, go F yourself. Like it's all good. In the end of the day, we are here to empower you. And I know if you're here, you are capable. So make a decision. Just be sector agnostic for now if you're not sure. And pick businesses doing between 1 to 5 or up to 10 million in yearly revenues sales, basically. Um, and write it down. Write down your ideal deal. Like Even maybe ask yourself, like in general, where do you want to be? Where do you want to be again in a year from now? Right? How much cash do you want to take? Do you want to work day to day or not? Do you want to take income and distributions or not? Do you want to be investor, shareholder and be more of a passive role? Um, just make a decision, right? And let me share another thing. One of the best ways for you to learn what is the best sector for you is to talk to enough business owners and figure out what are sectors that are not for you. Because I'm telling you, after you talk to enough business owners, you'll learn so much about their business and see what they've been up to and see if you're seeing yourself being involved in that business. Um, some other good questions I like is like, ask yourself, would you be happy telling your family, uh, your mom, that you own th- that business? Um, or another thing I like is if tomorrow there was a newspaper article about you saying that you just bought this business, would that make you happy being in that sector? Um, another question I like is ask yourself, like, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do, right? After you traveled all around the world, you came back. What would, we, what would that look like right now? What would an average day look like for you right now? What sector would it be in? Um, another question I like is that if you had no option at all to earn money moving forward in your life, you're, you're going to make no more money, but somehow your basic bills are being paid. You have a roof above your head, you have food, but you cannot make a, a single, and everyone, everyone around you, your family, everyone is fine. They won't need to worry about their bills. What now? What do you want to work on right now? What is that sector looks like? What is your life work? Ask yourself. I think that's something that I wish I was able to ask myself 15 years ago. Like, what is your life work? What do you want to be? Where do you want to see yourself 10, 20, 50 years from now? What would be, what would make you happy wake up in the morning to work on 50 years from now? Ask yourself. Um, and sometimes the simple answer is that you just want to serve people, right? In the end of the day, if you're going to dive into kind of like the layers of why, uh, it usually comes down to just serve people, serve, help. Um, and what you'll find out is that usually you can do that in any business, in any sector. And it's about building a mastery in a sector and joining a journey and being part of the journey in any sector. Um, so if you're not sure, again, focus on just serving people, doing good for people, giving back, helping. And it can be by just helping employees in your business, creating jobs, saving jobs, um, uh, helping clients, serving clients, um, and that alone can be a great purpose for you. So, that uh, now that your, your pre work is done, let's drop into deal flow part one. So, this is phase one. Um, incredible deals boil down to one thing in the end of the day, it boils down to relationships. If you don't have that, it's going to be very difficult. And in the end of the day, you're only one relationship away from a multi million dollar deal. Always. Like, literally. It's just one good relationship. And 
what I don't like in things that I've seen out there is that some people think that doing business or doing deals and acquisitions is, you know, it's like people think that they buy companies from Excel sheets or from profit and loss statements. No, business is being done between two people in the end of the day. So I really believe that to get the best deal done for you and the seller and to make a win-win, it's more about listening, about caring, about having empathy. It's about asking people what they want, what are their goals, uh, what they want to do after the exit. Like, remember, those business owners, if, especially if you're going to talk to a baby boomer, like, it's their baby. You know, it's their life work, so respect them. You want to be the safe pair of hands, someone who's going to be there to take care of their legacy, their, you know, the brand that they build, um, take care of their employees. And what I really believe in is that the best way for you to get a business for free sometimes is to get the seller to like you. It's literally just to get the seller to like you. And you know what? The best way to get someone to like you is to like them, to really care about them, to listen to them. Like, you know, the two we have two ears, one mouth uh, for a reason. So always listen more, listen most of the time and care about them. And you'll see, <laughs> as simple as it sounds, that's really going to help you do better deals. And what it also means is that um, it could be a relationship with, few of those people. So it's not just the seller, right? Because the world of acquisitions is about building relationship with a lot of people involved in the deal. It can be with brokers, it can be with sellers, like I said. It can be with other business owners, uh, entrepreneurs, baby boomers, it can be suppliers, it can be lawyers, accountants, other advisors. So everyone involved, remember, life is about relationships, it's about connection. And same here, when you're doing deals, it's about how can you get connected to that person? How can you connect to him in a way that shows that you care, that you really want to serve and give back to them. Uh, but that's not all, right? So I also want to talk a little bit about, kind of like a little bit about the identity of just being an acquisition entrepreneur. Um, so you got to be comfortable saying that you are an investor, right? You got to be comfortable saying that you're looking for deals, that you're looking to buy companies. Start to change your identity. Start to change your conversations. Even when you walk in the street, when you're in flights, start to change conversations. Become a new person. Like even just writing down on LinkedIn profile that you're an investor, you'll see that alone is going to open so many doors for you. So put yourself into the identity that you're an investor. And I don't care who you are. You're an investor. You're spending your time, right? You put in your time, not even if you don't put money right now, you put in your time. When you're putting your time, your most important thing in life is time. When you're investing your time in anything, you are an investor. That should be your belief. And you need to have that belief that saying that if you find a good deal, you'll be able to finance it. Uh, I think I mentioned it in, in the last session is that if I was able to give you, give you right now a Bugatti, Bugatti that's worth $1 million at least. And I told you, hey, um, I need you to buy that Bugatti for me as soon as possible for $100,000 because I, I got I to gotta sell, sell it as soon as possible for whatever reason. I don't know, taxes, whatever reason we can come up with. I, I got to sell it, $100,000, uh, but you kinda, we got to come up with that money in the next few days. Would you be able to come up with that $100,000? Right? You need to ask yourself. And if you're not sure, then my answer for you would be you got to go out there and talk to anyone you meet in the street and tell yourself, hey, I got this amazing deal. I got this Bugatti. So... That's, that's how you get the money for the Bugatti. Um, plus, let's even add another layer to that. What if I told you that you're going to have a buyer to that Bugatti in a week from now buying that, business, that, that, that Bugatti from you again for 1.1 or $1.5 million? Would you then be able to get yourself $100,000? Right? Like what the number should be to get yourself that number? And most of you might say, hey, I'm definitely going to be able to get that number because I'll do whatever it takes to get that number because I have an amazing deal. And the problem that most of you don't see is that you are the amazing deal. If you are going out there and spending your time and caring about the owner and going to put your efforts as the leader of that business you're going to buy, you deserve to be someone that someone else will invest in. So you need to go out there and position yourself and talk to everyone you meet as if you are the Bugatti, as if you are that amazing deal. So start to change your identity. Start to look at yourself as someone who is capable of doing things. It's really, really important. Um, and yeah, an incredible deal could also be with your existing relationships. A lot of people underestimate who they know and, and, and staying in touch with people you know. Uh, so I've seen deals come from Facebook wall. I see, I've seen people come from people you know. 
because people you know know people of course um, contacts in your phone a lot of you have hundreds of people in your phone that you didn't talk to for probably years a lot of your deals are in there your linkedin network um, co-workers friends college friends everyone you ever talk to can be a potential deal for you people you haven't been con- in contact with for a while like i've seen deals coming from so cra- so many crazy places uh, but it came from those places because the person who closed that deal was willing and ready to do that deal when it came from that, those crazy places. So remember, it's a lot of who you are, how you position yourself, then deals can come from all over the place. And you really have to own that new identity. Really, really important. Like again, ask yourself who you want to be in a year, three years, five years, 10 years from now. Um, ask yourself questions like what would Warren Buffett do uh, when he looks at the deal, when he's out there looking for a deal? Like, I'm sure I don't need to teach you that. Um, and I'm definitely not the best teacher about those things, but I'm a big believer that our thoughts create reality. Um, I'm a big follower of Joe Dispenza, um, if, you, if you're not familiar with him. Um, like, it all comes down to changing your identity, changing internally who you are. Like, you want to become someone who buy a million dollar company? If you really want to do that, you got to become someone who is worthy of owning a multi-million dollar company. Because you got you to gotta think that way. You got to feel that way. You got to act that way. And guess what? Someone who's owning a multi-million dollar company is probably not out there being lazy, um, doing nothing with his life and being full of distraction. He's focused. So even if you're he, he, watching this video, you need to ask yourself, how focused I am? Can I focus on just one task for one or two hours? Most people can't even do that. So uh, one of the biggest problem with most people in this space of deals or getting deal flow is this. Most people have very limited opportunity because they only have one or two relationships in the pipeline. And while that's enough to get you started and might even get you a successful acquisition, you want more opportunities, may, way more opportunities, right? So you basically, the problem is um, you, want to ses- you want to systemize deal flow, right? Which leads us to, you want to go from this to this, right? You just want to have a lot of deals to look at. you got to build that pipeline. you got to do that. So that brings us to phase two. So this is all about automating deal flow. And this is critical to really, really succeed in this phase. So deal flow. Deal flow, again, is all about getting your pipeline open to several amazing deals fast. You want to understand clearly what you want. You want to position yourself powerfully to get curious and hungry business owners coming to you wanting to sell. You want to be sure to include multiple strategies to optimize consistency. So it's not just one way to find deals. You want to build yourself a pipeline in a few different in a few different places um, and especially strategies that hunt for off-market deals the best deals are not for sale the best businesses are not for sale and when you do this right you really create yourself a deal flow machine and it comes down very much to automation systems bringing deal for you you're waking up in the morning and there are deals in your inbox waiting for you and when it's done right I'm talking about getting 20 plus deals a week that you can look at. It makes you not attached to negotiations. You have way more opportunities. You're in abundance of deals. So remember, when you're building your deal flow, it's a funnel, right? So you got to start with a lot of companies, big list. Then some would be interested. Some will tell you they don't want to talk to you. Some will be motivated to sell. Some will not. Some will tell you, hey, give me millions of dollars for business that's worth nothing. Some will send you information about the business, some won't. Some um, businesses you will see yourself as the owner, some you won't, right? Some businesses you think that you could add value to the business, some businesses you won't. Um, Some business owners you will meet or talk to, some won't. Some business owners you'll send offers, some you won't, right? And in the end of the day, um, like, Think about simple things. Like if you can't explain what the business does, for example, in a few simple words, probably not a business you want to be involved in to begin with. So you, you want to consider those things. You want to remember that it's a funnel. 
you want to remember that it, yeah, it comes down to numbers game as well. So where do we find those deals, right? Let me just brief through a f- few things, right? You can find them from brokers, from your network. You can send letters, emails, LinkedIn, use Facebook, um, use sites like Hoover's or Endel, or you can call people, you can use Facebook ads, you can use your website or forums or events or just networking events in general. You can look at investor sites, angel sites, um, that is basically any place in that people look for investments. You can buy data, you can go for trade associations, uh, sites like ZoomInfo. Uh, um, and in the end of the day, things like brokers, for example, they can be great, but some will give you a hard time because you don't know how to position yourself maybe with the broker, right? They will ask you for proof of funds. They will ask you for deals you've done. Um, so you need to learn how to position yourself with them. You need to also ask yourself, what about distress deals? Do you want to do distress deals or not? Do you, uh, again, really, really comes down to bringing yourself back to your identity, to your vision, where you want to be in a year, two years, five years, 10 years from now. And based on that, thinking where would be the best place to start. And like I said, some of the things I just mentioned are some of those best places to start with. And I'm going to share some more. So let's share some of those secrets, right? So I think the first secret is just that uh, the best deals are not listed for sale. Uh, some of the best businesses out there are will not going to be for sale. It's because you're not going to have competition. Um, plus, you're going to be working with someone who have, I guess, better expectations for what's um, necessary to close the deal. Um, another secret is that you want to position yourself. What I found out, at least, is that positioning yourself as a personal, just an investor, versus positioning yourself as a big company is actually easier. Um, a lot of people will tell you otherwise. But what I found out is that when you talk to a small business owner and you position yourself as this large corporate entity, sometimes you will literally scare them. Um, or so, so you, you either going to scare them, you're going to think you have too much experience and you're going to screw them in the deal. Or they're going to see dollars when they look at you and they're going to expect a lot of money when you position yourself as someone with, you know, like tons of years of experience and corporate and I'm a conglomerate looking to buy you. Remember, business is about people. It's about you're buying a business from a person. And the more you create a a, um, distance between you and him, it's not going to be easy for you. Um, What I found out is that also sending an email from... um, just a good domain name is very important versus sending, for example, for just Gmail or a Yahoo account. Um, another secret, you want to follow up. Like you want to use things like CRMs or maybe even just Excel sheet for tracking your deal flow, right? Like what we had in the past is some sellers come back to us within six months or 12 months after they are tired of running the business. And then they come back to us again saying, hey, I'm ready now. And if you are taking initiative with doing that follow-up, it's going to be much easier for you to stay in touch with them and find those amazing deals when they are ready. Secret four is be consistent. So first of all, you want to expect to talk to like at least 100 companies. Otherwise, you'll just give up earlier. Like you want to come with the expectations. I'm going to talk to at least 100 business owners. Um, Some people will close in the first deal that they talk to, but you don't want to have that mindset. You want to come with a mindset that says, I'm building a habit of doing something daily on my acquisition goal um, and then have something daily or weekly on your calendar to go and do some work, to go and do some of the things that I told you to find those deals, right? Um, never stop your work on deal flow. That's another super, super important thing because the last thing you want is to work on one deal. Even if you're about to close it and then something happens and that's it, you don't have any other deals to work on. So you always want to have deals in the pipeline. Um, most important secret, you got to automate so much loss because this doesn't happen. I see people who don't automate things. They spend too much time creating the deal flow on their own. Um, and they just don't see enough deals. And that's really, really, in my opinion, one of the biggest differences between those who get a deal done fast and those who don't. So you really want to automate things as soon as possible. Otherwise you're going to get stuck with very few deals to look at. You don't want to be stuck here and just look at one or two deals, right? It's really, really, um, yeah, it's just not going to help you. Let's just say that. This is what you, where you want to be. When you automate your deal flow system and you create a lot of relationships, this is where you create a large funnel. When you have a large funnel, you can then pick the best deals for you and get them done. So 
we shared um, some of the secrets. Now let's talk about some of the common mistakes. So not prioritized. Obviously, if you don't have deal flow at all, you either won't start in this journey or just gonna give up too fast. And that's the last thing we want. We don't want you to give up. It's possible, but if you're not gonna do the work, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. You gotta do the work, it's on you, right? There's only so much we can do for you. We can't, if you wanna sit on the couch, watch Netflix all day, I'm sorry, I can't help you close a deal. I can't help you buy a business. So you gotta put it as a priority. Um, silly rules. I sometimes see people who, you know, are too focused, have some silly rules. They either focus on just distressed deals or just no money down deals or just working on only with businesses that are not for sale or only with brokers or, you know, they have too many strict rules, silly rules, and they're not open-minded because in the end of the day, you want to be open-minded. You don't know where the best deal will come from. And especially you want to be open to more deal structures, opportunities and angles to look at any deal. That's your goal, to look at any deal and be able to do it. Obviously, if it makes sense for you, and that's probably something we're gonna talk about more tomorrow. Um, another thing that I've seen is uh, uh, only using one way to find deals, right? Uh, I've seen a lot of people who just focus on one thing or a lot of people who just focus on too much old school stuff. So for example, uh, for example, just, just cold calling people or just sending physical letters. Now, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but I'm saying, if you're attached to only sending physical letters or if you're attached to only doing cold calls, um, I'm sorry, but you're missing on so many opportunities, especially nowadays. I mean, in, 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 the, in the world where we have access to the internet, I mean, I think it's, it's almost ridiculous not to use this to our advantage and make the most out of it, to use automations, to use softwares, to use systems that can build you pipeline of better deal flow over time. Um, and like I said, no automations, right? Um, if you don't have any automation, it's going to put you in scarcity. You're going to put uh, pretty much all your eggs in one basket in, or in one potential deal. It's going to take you too much work yourself to write letters or to create campaigns manually. Um, so I don't suggest that. Um, poor positioning. It's another mistake I see. People don't know how to approach business owners, how to um, use even scripts to begin with. What are the right ways to talk to business owners? What questions to ask? how to position yourself as a credible buyer, even if you don't have much certainty and confidence within yourself, how to position yourself as someone with money. Because if you couldn't position yourself as someone who, who don't have money whatsoever, I'm sorry, but no one's gonna take you seriously. You wanna position yourself as a credible buyer, someone who can have access to capital if the deal makes sense, and someone who can handle the management of the business. Um, yeah, and like you want to, you want to be able to position yourself well so people take you seriously. If not, I'm sorry, but you won't be able to to overcome that. It's going to be very difficult for you to close the deal. Um, scripts also. I see people either have wrong scripts, too much difficult scripts, uh, overwhelmed with too many scripts, and not sure what to focus on with from all of those scripts. Um, sometimes people just too much attached to script. Uh, remember, same like. like same thing that I told it that we're not buying companies from Excel sheets. It's not Excel sheet buying an Excel sheet. It's people buy businesses from people. Same here, like with scripts. It's not that this script or that script will make or break you. Like, yeah, scripts are important to give you a baseline of understanding. But in the end of the day, if you don't know how to position yourself as a human being to begin with, it's going to be very difficult. I don't care what script you have. Um, also, I'm just not being consistent, right? Like if you again going back to getting into shape thing right like if you go for a sprint 100 meter sprint once a month or once a quarter um i'm sorry and then you eat bullshit the rest of the time i'm sorry you, you won't lose weight like you won't get into good shape same here if you're expecting to just work one hour every quarter or one hour every month or even one hour i don't know every week, I don't think it's enough. I want you to get to a point where you work at least one or two hours a day. You wanna be consistent. The more consistent you are in this or anything in life, it's gonna be easier for you. Uh, like, yeah, I can sell you a, become a billionaire dream in a day, but I'm sorry, I don't know people who get there without consistency. So you gotta be consistent. And I think even one or two hours a day of consistent work, of actual focused work, of productive work um, can really, really change you as a person because most people in today's world can't even focus for one or two hours. Like even if you're still listening to me here at the 50 something minute mark, it means that you can focus more than the rest of the world. Like literally most people can't even do that. So tap yourself on the back first of all for that and think with yourself, how can I keep that consistency of focus of productivity and not just watch this video that you're watching, but actually 
act on what I'm telling you to do. All right. I think that's a very, very important thing to, to remember. Um, and of course, giving up. If you're going to give up, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Right. The, the only way to fail in life is to give up. Like you either give up or you don't have enough, like, like have enough patience, have enough patience, guys. Like even if it's going to take you a year to buy one good business, so what? Like it's going to be much more challenging to start something from scratch or to grow organically. So give it a try, you know, um, be committed to this. The results can be so amazing. So why giving up? Don't give up. Deal flow, deal analysis, deal execution. Um, tomorrow, we're going to talk about deal analysis, which is basically all about how to analyze deals, how to look at deals. But remember our journey and if they remember our goal. Our goal is to build wealth or preserve wealth for you with acquisitions and investment in businesses if you're there already. Um, and I know some of you are there. And remember, you build wealth with concentration and you preserve wealth with diversification. So first step is the left side, right? So people who want to be their own boss, become entrepreneurs. Most of them start to try to start a business from scratch. Um, then maybe they start a business. Maybe they start a new business, uh, a new one every month. But the second step is to concentrate and focus on one thing for a few years, maybe, or a few months at least. This is at least like a seven-figure business, right? This is potentially doing roll-ups and buy a few businesses in one sector and create some kind of a conglomerate or, or buy a complementary business or an empire in one sector and start to think about legacy. And start, third part is about how can we build a legacy, preserve wealth, diversification inside your business or outside, right? Think Jeff Bezos, right? Amazon. So he's kind of like started diversifying in his business. Now he's pretty much out there in anything, right? He's going to the moon. He bought a media company. So you really want to ask yourself, right? So step three is all about wealthy to legacy, thinking about exit, diversification, protecting, exponentially expanding your wealth. Words like impact, legacy, lifestyle, freedom, everything can be here. Service, making a difference, right? Selfless action. So that's the journey that you will take in this acquisition space. And that's how you're going to get there. That's our goal with this, with this journey with you. So we did day one. We did day two. And tomorrow we're going to do day three. So deal analysis, how to quickly and effectively know when a deal is a good deal. That's the next step. How to start the initial conversation with business owners, what to tell them how to know the deal is even a good deal, how to get access to information from business owners, right? That's the goal for tomorrow. Uh, plus, obviously, yeah, how to move those conversations forward, right? So now you, today, the goal is to reach out to people that will just show you, hey, I'm interested. Tomorrow, we're going to show you what to do after a day, show you, hey. And welcome to day three of our acquisitions masterclass. So if you remember, this masterclass is exploring our three-step acquisition process. Remember, we don't want to overwhelm you. We want to make sure you're taking action and getting results and seeing that what you're doing here is possible. So we're trying to keep it as simple as possible. Our acquisitions process is all about deal flow, deal analysis, and deal execution. Now, remember what we're doing here is we're pulling back the curtain and showing you literally the black box secret of the wealthy elite out there. I wish I knew this information 15 years ago. I could make much more money much faster. And this is what I want to share with you here. This is the skill that all of those guys have. And I want you to get as well. So um, if you stay with me throughout this entire masterclass as well, throughout this day, it, it is pretty safe to say that you'll be learning the most lucrative entrepreneurial skill in the world. You'll learn how to think, behave, and act just like the wealthy elite do and it's way different than everything that anyone out there taught you so far so i want to get back to it um, if you went through day one and day two i hope you started taking some action posted in the group if not please go and do that in the end of the day our goal is to unlock these results in these three steps all right now yesterday we covered deal flow Today, we're going to dive into the next phase, all about deal analysis. So let's get to work. So deal analysis. So what that looks like. So 
first of all, why is deal analysis even important, right? Why, why, why it's so important? What is it to begin with? And, and let's talk a little bit about kind of where we at, what is it, and what are we without good analysis? So first of all, if last time you started talking to business owners, maybe some business owners starting to reply, but you're not sure how to talk to them and how to analyze if the deal is even a good deal, if the seller is even motivated, you just won't know how to move forward on deals, right? So obviously that, um, you'll miss out on the biggest hidden and best deals. You'll get stuck wasting time with the bad business. That's the last thing we want you to do, right? Um, you won't know how to position and negotiate the close in the right way, right? So we wanna make sure you're doing things right, you're doing things fast, you're able to filter the right deals based on what's good for you specifically. Um, and you're not wasting time and you know how to do things fast. And you know how to use a lot of different ways to analyze the deal in order to get the best win-win deal for everyone. You will be also limited with your problem solving options, which limits how you can approach deals. We want to show you different approaches, different options. Um, and obviously without good analysis, you'll close a deal that can potentially become a prison. So the last thing we wanted to do is to buy the wrong business. Like I've heard horror stories of people who come to me and basically save their, spend their life saving on a deal that's not just not making them money, but basically um, the business is so bad that that person had to inject more capital just to keep the business alive because he didn't want to fire all the employees and shut things down after he invested so, money, so much money to begin with. And that's the last thing we want to happen to you as well. Um, and obviously, you'll waste time and energy over analyzing something that's bad, right? We don't want you to waste too much time, too much energy, and potentially a lot of money on the wrong deal, on, on a bad deal. Um, or you can accidentally say no to something that is incredible. I've seen people doing that just because they don't know how to approach deals, how to analyze deals. They only know one thing or two things, and then they're missing out a lot of good opportunities. So if you get this right, of course, if you learn how to analyze deals and how to talk to those owners and how to position yourself and how to know if a deal is a good deal, first of all, you could pay less, uh, sometimes even no money at all um, and close win-win deals for everyone. Uh, you'll have tons of options and different deals to do with different business owners, different approaches, different structures. Uh, you'll know how to know if a deal is a good deal or not very fast and it's going to... Uh, be specific to your situation. Uh, if you get this wrong, you'll waste time, like we said, right? The last thing we want is to lose on literally millions of dollars of potential acquisitions that you could do uh, because you just won't know how to approach business owners in the right way, how to analyze deals fast, etc., etc. So let's dive in. I want to share as much as I can with you throughout this training. So let's dive in. So um, today's outline. Let's see what we're going to go through today. Um, and also, just a quick reminder, this masterclass and challenge is sponsored by Acquisitions University, which is a mentorship program that provides step-by-step -step details on everything acquisitions, right? So if what we're doing here in the masterclass is kind of like an overview, a beginning, a way to open your mind and create an awareness for what's even possible. And obviously, I know that a lot of you will be able to go out there and close your first deals just with this masterclass alone but for so those of you who are more serious more committed want to really take things to the next level and do things faster with hands hold uh that you want someone to hand give, give you a hand and help you throughout the process then acquisitions university might be the right thing for you um obviously you're going to be part of an amazing community you'll be able to join weekly q a calls with me and other very successful M&A experts, people who work with private equity firms, family offices, venture capital firms, 24-7 uh, support, lots of people in the community. And basically, it's the best program out there to ensure that you'll close at least one, two, three. Like I said, we have people who bought literally seven, ten businesses in one year. I'm talking seven-figure businesses, being businesses doing above a million a year in revenues. Um, in, in the university program, you got all the scripts, templates, things that literally would cost you thousands of dollars, like I'm talking 10, 20,000 plus dollars with accountants and lawyers. Um, you learn everything on how to raise capital from institutions, investors. Um, you will get access to my calls, calls that I've done a few years ago with actual business owners, bankers, brokers. Um, it's old calls, but you could literally listen to live calls where I'm talking to business owners. 
You will learn how to automate deal flow with systems, how to get to a point where you're building systems where deals are coming to you, the best deals, uh, off-market deals, deals that are not for sale. You'll get access to our Rolodex of hundreds of financial institutions and investors in your deals. You'll also learn everything you need about how to financially analyze deals with financial modules and more trainings from experts. So I'm not the only um, person who's teaching you in a university program. Um, Obviously, everything you need post-deal, how to close the deal and then manage and grow the business after you buy it. Um, Basically, everything you need, hand-holding program, full mentorship. Uh, This is what I wish I had many, many years ago. Uh, This is how some of the best people out there bought amazing businesses. Um, And this is, like I said, it's not for everyone. It's for those who are really committed to take this to the next level and really learn this skill set of acquisitions and buy amazing businesses. Um, Our goal with everyone who joins is to buy at least, like I said, one business in the next year working with us. Um, And like I said, it's not just me. There's a lot of M&A experts other than me. I'm talking 20, 30 years of experience in private equity, banking, family offices, etc. Doing Q&A calls, being there to support you. So if you think that this is for you, go to acquisitions.com forward slash join and see the details in there. Um, I really believe that every day that you're not in that program, if you do want to take this space seriously um, literally every day that goes by and you're not working with us closely it's at least a million dollar business that you're missing out every single day literally a million dollar opportunity that you're paying for the university of not knowing by not joining us so that was my soft pitch um, but let's get back to some content i really want to add value to all of you if, if you join or not it's all good either way so first thing that we'll cover in the deal analysis is all about the people Then we'll go and talk about the numbers, everything you need to know about the numbers at this stage. Um, A little bit more about the angles, how to approach different deals. Uh, Some more notes about negotiations, how to talk, what to ask, how to approach business owners. Um, Obviously, we're going to talk about common mistakes because the last thing I want you to do is have those do those mistakes. Um, And just a quick reminder, um, our mission here is simple with this masterclass right our goal with here in the other day is to get you actual conversations and offers by the end of this five-day masterclass we want you be to be able to go out there be comfortable see that it's possible see that it's doable to buy a successful business no matter who you are no matter what you've done in the past i know that it's possible for you and this is our goal with this masterclass to open your eyes to what's possible to open your eyes to show you that you are capable to empower you that this is possible for you no matter who you are so this is our goal. Um, obviously, we want to give you enough, in, enough information to go out there and get those results. And we are focused here on the 20, 80, 20, right? So because there's so much to cover, we can literally do months over months of acquisitions training, which is what we do in our university program. But here we want to open your eyes to show you what's possible and get you some results as soon as possible as well. And each day, um, if you've been in our first days, you know, we're going to send you some um, give you some homework or action steps and basically start the domino effect, start the momentum. Like it's so important to start momentum. Whatever you want to be good at in life, you got to start the momentum and take daily actions and build a habit around those results that you want to have. Like I said, you want to get in shape. You got to build a habit of working out on a regular basis and eating well. Same here. You want to be successful in the space of acquisitions. You got to build those daily habits of doing deal flow, deal analysis and deal execution. Um, And please understand that there's abundance of deals out there. There are millions, millions of millions of millions of businesses around the world that are open to sell if you will just approach them. There's too many businesses for all of us to work with. Um, So please don't be afraid that like because there's a lot of people in this challenge and group, you're going to be overwhelmed. There's still like this is a buyer's market. There's so many opportunities out there and we are going to eventually work with some of you guys um, to help you close the best deals. So, also quick reminder, those results can only happen if you take action. In the end of the day, if you're not going out there taking action, um, there's nothing I can do. Like, I'm here to help you as much as I can, but you'll need to go out there and take action and trust yourself and jump into the water. And if I told you to talk to a business owner, you should go out there and talk to a business owner. And even if you get rejected, that's okay. At least you move forward, you learned a lesson and you changed your, your approach next time maybe after watching the training again and again and again if needed. But as long as you don't give up, we'll be here to support you, right? So please don't sit on the couch, get up, step up, wake up, do the work, 
and that's how you'll get results. And of course, in the end of this day, we're also going to share with you some action steps um, on how to move things forward today, um, moving forward from our lessons from yesterday. So if you're ready, let's, let's dive in. So let's start with the people. So the people, the first key is to analyze deals, to deal analysis. The section of deal analysis um, isn't what you might think about, right? Because probably a lot of you think, okay, let's start looking at the numbers. Let's open Excel sheets. But I would start in a different place. I would remind you that this is first all about people and it's all about relationships. This is what business all comes down to. It all comes down to relationships. Deals are done between two people, not between Excel sheets and profit and loss statements. Whatever you do, you must be collaborative instead of competitive. I've never seen um, a successful and let's add the word even fulfilled business owner or entrepreneur who's not coming with the approach of being collaborative, of creating win-win scenarios. If you don't have that approach, um, maybe it's going to work for you, but I don't think it's worth it, to be honest. Um, And personally, I've never found it to work when I come from a place of being selfish, thinking only about myself and my pockets uh, usually it never works at least not in the long term uh, that's why i suggest you go and read the book the diamond cutter if you didn't yet seriously life-changing book um, it's going to really open your eyes to the way that i look at life and business if you really want to understand how i how i approach life overall and in the end of the day it comes down to being someone that they like and trust and i'm talking to anyone involved in the deal i'm talking about the seller i'm talking about anyone who's going to be involved in the deal can be brokers accountants lawyers bankers everyone investors um, employees customers even eventually right so that's what it comes down to it's about building a real relationship and get on the same side of the table what i'm going to show you and share with you in negotiations is you want to get to a point where you're on the same side of the table almost building the offer alongside the owner as if you're helping him solve a problem. It's the, that's the best way to get any deal done. Um, so yeah, it's about building a relationship. So what you want to do is start to talk to people, right? We showed you how to start to build that momentum, how to talk to a few people. We're going to continue with that today and give you some more action steps. But remember, it's about talking to people, ideally in an industry you know something about, um, if you're not, we said be sector agnostic and start to think about what is the real problem, right? What is that seller real problem? What they want? Listen to them, right? This build the bridge and, and that really supports the information that you want to gather, right? You want to be interested instead of interesting. You want to find commonalities, like ask him some questions. What do you want to do with the business? Like drive the conversation, right? You want to ask questions like a doctor, like asking, hey, why did you even start this business? What got you to this sector and not something else? How many years are you in this business? Uh, what do you like? What do you hate? What would you change in the business? If you had access to capital, what would you do? Um, who do you like in the employees who can take over the business in the day to day? What's your future plans after you're going to receive the money in the exit? If you had, if you wave a magic wand, what, what would the solution be look like to grow this business? Like start to ask questions, start to be interested in what he's doing. Um, ask him, what do we want to sell? Like, sounds like this business is doing good. Why don't you stay where you at, right? What's holding you back? So build the relationship, right? And like, like, remember, be the leader and remember that you have abundance of deals out there. If you're going to look desperate when you talk to the business owners and you're almost going to beg to them to sell you their business, um, it's going to be very weird and they won't take you seriously. You want to position yourself as someone credible, as a good person. Um, And in the end of the day, find out if it's even a good fit for you to be part of that business. Ask yourself, is that business worthy of you as much as you really try to get the seller to convince the seller to sell you the business? And remember that you're doing them a favor as much as they're doing to you by selling you the business, right? So really remember that your positioning, the approach that you have, your certainty, your confidence, it's almost you need to lean back and ask a lot of questions. That's what it comes down to in doing deals. Um, And it's about building a lot of rapport, like I said, caring about them, ask them about themselves, their family, their goals, their dreams, their fears, ask whatever you can. Ask why they do what they do, right? Like you want to position yourself as the safe pair of hands, as someone who's going to take care of them. Ask about their employees, ask about 
um, who's important to them, what's important to them. That's how you build a relationship, but by really caring about the other side. You want to get someone else to like you, like them, but by being interested in them. He's a human being just like you, so I'm sure he's got a lot of interesting things that if you'll just open your eyes and ears, um, you'll be really fascinated by some of the things that they're going to tell you. And that way, they'll see you as someone who is going to take care of them, their brand, their legacy, their employees, their customers, etc., etc. So remember, build a relationship with them. Super, super important. Right? Then also focus on gathering information. Right? So if you started doing some of the work um, last time, you want to start building some, um, I guess, to start taking some information, right? So uh, it's about, um, so let me go through some of the things that you can probably ask for, right? So when you talk to them, uh, first of all, always start with rapport. Just ask them personal questions, right? Get them to open up. And if you don't know if they want to sell, if it's not from a broker, ask them, like, have you ever thought about selling this business, right? Don't be aggressive, be nice, right? Ask them, did you think about the price? Did you think on a price? Like, how did you think about that price? Like, See if you're even in the ballpark, if it's crazy, giving you crazy valuations or not, right? Most people got no idea how businesses are being valued if it's the first time they're trying to sell a business. So understand that they're going to be nervous as well, especially if it's a business they own for 20, 30 years. And ask them if they thought about a price, ask them, how did you come up with that price, right? Um, and, you know, if they're not sure, you can even say something like, look, the way usually those businesses are being priced is uh, on, based on some kind of the multiples of pre-tax profits. And then if you're not sure what it's like in your sector, you can always search. Um, yeah, I would, I would suggest to always search out there, see what multiples are used in your, um, in, in your sector. And we're going to talk more about valuation in a bit because I don't want, so I don't want to dive too much into that right now. Um, and, and yeah, obviously, you can always tell them, yeah, what you're interested about, tell them, hey, well, this is how it's being done usually. This is what it usually looks like, like, lead the conversation, be a leader, and remember that they're nervous sometimes as much as you, if not more, especially if it's their first time that they're selling a business. Um, and almost fill a questionnaire on the basic information stuff in a conversation. So instead of sending like a Google Doc and just asking for information, you can just ask all those things on the phone or in a meeting, right? So first of all, you can start asking questions about financials, about their P&L, about their balance sheet. If the numbers went up or down, ask them why that happened. Um, and in general, you always want to be a little bit skeptic because by definition, you know less about the business than them, right? They're the owners. They know much more. Um, ask them about the assets. What assets are available? What's going to be involved in the deal? What's not? Um, like, ask them what's important. Ask yourself, do we want to keep those assets or not? Can we use those assets for funding or not? And we're going to share some of those things in a bit as well. Um, Ask yourself, what do I need to potentially grow this business? Maybe more money, different services, better HR, better marketing, better sales. Like start to look at their org chart and see what can you do. Um, ask yourself, what do we want to keep? What do we want to leave out of the table um, and almost carve out out of the deal, right? How much cash do we need to keep in the business for working capital to run this business? As a general rule, you want at least 10% of yearly revenues in working capital, right? You want to ask yourself, what about the owner? Um, he want to stay in the business? He want to leave as soon as possible? Is he open for a transition period or not? Um, ask yourself all those questions when we, you talk to him and try to get those answers in a normal conversation. Ask yourself, how much capital do you think you can raise? From what sources? It's going to be debt, equity. Can you get expressions of interest from financial institutions? And I know some of those things that I'm talking out loud right now, maybe you're not sure about what I'm even talking about. And it's okay. Uh, Rewatch this video again after I'm going to go through some of the training on uh, on different angles and finance and things like that as we go through today's training and tomorrow's training as well. Um, and obviously, always ask like what they want. Ask them like ask yourself what would be fair to pay for this business. Like what are the terms going to be for this deal? What are the overall valuations? Right? What is the price compared to the terms? Right? Those are the questions you want to ask yourself. Um, what about the seller? Is he going to sell or finance some of the acquisition? Will it be open to an earn out? I'm going to talk about some of those things if you don't understand what I'm talking about because I don't want to overwhelm you, but I want to open your eyes to kind of like some of the things you want to keep in mind when you talk to business owners. You want to ask yourself, do you want to buy 100% or maybe less and be a minority owner? Uh, what about 
options for growth. Uh, how much capacity do we have to grow the business? Like if you bring, let's say, 1 million customers tomorrow for the business, can the business handle it? If not, why not, right? You want to ask the owner those questions to understand what capacity you have to grow the business. What about the employees, suppliers, customers? Can you talk to them? Some owners will allow it as soon as possible, some won't. Um, can you get money from potential CEO? Who's going to be your CEO? Are you going to be the CEO? Who's going to be your management team, your executives? Who's going to be on your org chart? Who's not? Who's going to stay in the business? Who's potentially going to leave? Who you want to keep? Who you want to potentially let go of? How the seller is going to look at you potentially letting go of people, right? Ask yourself, how motivated the seller is to begin with? If he's not motivated, um, it's going to be very difficult to get a deal done unless you're willing to pay a premium price. And you want to ask yourself, am I willing to pay a premium price for this business? Um, and if he's super motivated, ask yourself, maybe I can make a, a lower offer because um, he's kind of like 10 in on motivation. So you want to ask yourself all of those questions, right? So it comes down to, again, what they want, what terms they want, uh, what is the best price they can do, can they finance part of the deals? What are your boundaries in terms of price and terms? What do you want, right? Ask yourself all those questions. Um, then in the end of the day, it comes down to also showing them that whatever problems they have, um, you can solve them and get them to their goals. The better you'll do doing that, the easier it will be for you to close the deal, period. Um, check the culture. I think it's super important as well, right? So if you can visit the business, uh, get to know the seller, get to know the team. Do you know what, like, what about the team? They have processes to follow. They have KPIs, keep, which are key performance indicators to aim to. Uh, does anyone uh, keep them accountable? What about the leader? How is he leading their team? Like in the end of the day, business is a reflection of the leader. So you want to kind of like start to think with in your mind what, what those things look like, right? Um, and in general, ask yourself, if you are going to be the owner of the business and the CEO, are you in a position to be able to lead that team? Um, you know, you need to ask yourself, do you have the confidence to do that? Otherwise, can you hire someone else to be the CEO potentially and run the business? Uh, the CEO can be a potential investor for you as well. What about support overall, right? Do you actually, um, do you or them, the customers, the owner care about the customers, right? Um, like ask yourself, like what can you do to improve the service and the support with those customers, right? What's the reputation looks like with those um, customers of that business overall? Can you find some reviews? Can you understand what's going on so far? Can you see the upside and protect your downside potentially uh, from those things? And also remember that taking a risk overall is part of it, right? So ask yourself always, does the potential upside worth the risk I'm about to take, right? And remember that some of the most successful people out there just took the biggest risk, right? So um, as an entrepreneur, you almost need to prepare yourself to take risks, uh, but you definitely want to do your homework on all those things, right? So culture is super important. Who are the people? What are their values? What, what is the vision of that business? Is there any vision overall? Um, are their values matching yours, etc., etc.? There's a lot of things I can talk about it, but those are some of the things you want to keep in mind. Um, and also a bit of a warning, those uh, sellers will be in touch with you for a while, uh, most likely in a transition period. So ask yourself, like, if you want to deal with them, right? Like, the last thing you want to work is uh, work with people you don't like or just kind of like annoying people or assholes, right? So um, so you want to check out who you're working with, right? That's, that's for me, it's kind of like culture. What are their values? Who are those people? Are there good people? Do you see yourself hanging out with that owner for a while? Because... Potentially, that's going to be the case because you'll need to learn about the business, right? Um, and he's going to be potentially an amazing mentor for you because guess what? The best way to learn about a business is not to start one from scratch. It's to buy a business from someone and get the owner to be your mentor for a while and show you everything, right? Share with you all of his experience for 10, 20 years. So ask yourself all those questions. Um, figure out how they're doing mentally. Have they mentally checked out of the business already maybe? You know, and maybe because of that, the numbers are a bit down. Maybe things are bad because mentally they're kind of like just want to leave the business already. Um, is there anyone who can be promoted to be the manager or teach you some of the stuff that you'll need to learn if the owner is not involved anymore, right? You really want to learn about kind of like the relationships between people. Um, figure out what about the employees? Are they frustrated or not? Um, you know, ask yourself. And also... You need to remember and to ask yourself how dependent that business is on the owner or not. 
and based on that also figure out how much comfortable I'll be putting leverage on that deal and raising capital potentially um, and having debt on the business if the business is really dependent on the owner. And if it is, it might be okay if he's going to be involved and you can learn as much as possible for him. And maybe some of the results is going to be attached to some of the involvement of the owner, right? So some of those things you want to keep in mind. I'm going to expand more of those. I think I'm, I'm talking out loud here a lot. Um, and I'm, I hope I don't overwhelm you, but I really want to kind of like open your your your, your eyes to, to what you want to be, um, um, I guess, careful about, right? So really important working um, with the seller, learning about him, learning about his values. Also, ideally, like see what you can do to work with him directly, talk to him directly versus tons of advisors that he have that usually just having too many advisors in a deal. I've never seen that um, adding much value to the deal. Usually they just um, a lot of, I don't want to say destroy, but yeah, they, they, they're just another layer you need to go through. So ideally you just work through the, um, with the owner directly. So you definitely want direct relationship with the owner um, as soon as possible. Um, yeah. So also some other things to consider is usually, like we said in uh, the last training, is that smaller businesses, you, you'll find out the owners care more about the employees because they know everyone, they know everyone by name. Um, and usually bigger businesses, they'll care more about just the terms and the money, right? So keep those things in mind as well. So that was people. <laughs> I hope I didn't overwhelm you, but this is so critical, right? Who are the people you're going to work with? How are you going to build rapport with him? How much you like him, how much he likes you, what about the culture, the vision, the values of the business, how the employees are being kept accountable, what are their processes, what's the org chart chart looks like overall. Org chart is an organizational chart, basically. What are some of the departments, what the marketing looks like, sell department, HR, operations, finance, support. You need to ask yourself what everything looks like in all of those companies, what can be done better, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that was all about the people. Remember, it's all about relationships to begin with. If you don't have the right relationships, forget about doing deals, period. Um, I've seen incredible deals cross the line on trust and a handshake because people understood this key. This is critical. Don't take it lightly at all. And that's why I spent some time on that. So after your relationship, you obviously need to also understand the numbers, which you probably thought from the get-go. What, what about the numbers, right? So in terms of numbers, we can spend literally months just teaching you how to create modules, LBO models and discounted cash flow models uh, or calculating and comparing different companies, margins and EBITDA multiples. And there's so many different ways to value a business. And we do sometimes do that on deals that we're doing. But in the end of the day, in this masterclass, I really want to teach you the overall principles, right? And you need to understand that in the end of the day, business is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. And I want to give you a quick example. Think about Facebook, for example, when they bought Instagram. They bought that business for $1 billion when billion used to worth a lot many years ago, much more than it is today. Um, Instagram back then had no revenue whatsoever. Nothing, nada. So if you had a conversation with, you know, a young analyst and asked him, hey, what, what are the multiples that Facebook are paying here? What, what is the valuation here? Um, no one could have made sense from it. I even remember there was a lot of stories about that acquisition where people really almost laughed at Facebook for paying so much for this random photo image business. But in the end of the day, business is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. What they didn't know, or I guess what Mark Zuckerberg knew is that he can get access to Instagram target market to all of their visitors, to all of their customers. And it's basically the same type of customer. Plus he knew that the synergies and complementary things with those businesses are amazing. So the reason that Facebook saw that as, an, a, great, as a great acquisition target is because of their ad platform. So they knew that in the moment that they'll put their ad platform on Instagram, that business will go much bigger, right? Which is what happened. So that's why you need to also always ask yourself, like, who is the buyer? What are the terms? The terms make sense. It depends for who, right? In the end of the day, a business is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. So when you're the buyer, you need to ask yourself, can you finance the deal? Can you pay for it? 
And does the business make sense for you? Is it good money for you? Is it good terms for you? Is it the lifestyle that you want? Is it potentially building the momentum and, you know, kind of like, yeah, building the momentum towards the goals that you have in the next one, two, five, ten years from now. That's what you should focus on. Um, so, in the end of the day, you do need to deepen these skills so you can spot opportunities, right? Or danger fast. That's why numbers are important. It's super important to understand the basics. And we'll show you how to make offers by the end of this masterclass. Even if you don't know anything about financials, even if you never read profit and loss statement or a balance sheet, you will still learn how to make offers. Uh, but this is a great skill set to learn. If you don't have any understanding in basic accounting, accounting, um, go and learn some things, you know. So you can read a simple book about accounting and you'll learn most of the things that you'll know. And at the end of the day, the best uh, lessons you can learn is by actually doing, by actually buying a business and learning um, and seeing a real business uh, going through day-to-day uh, -day operations and at the same time looking at the, at the financial reports. And obviously, the more you know, the more you can solve problems. The less you know, the more likely you'll get a bad deal. So it's very important to understand the basics of numbers. You also don't want to be too reliable on other outside advisors. Um, and too many people haven't mastered the skill and they get stuck chasing bad deals. So you definitely want to have the basics done. Um, at the same time, you need to remember that a business is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. And the only real important thing for you is to ask yourself, can you finance the acquisition and is that deal good for you personally? Yes or no, right? That's what you want to worry about in the end of the day. What's the upside? Like worry as much about the upside of the deal as much as the um, basically deal that you're buying. At the same time, remember, you want to buy a business not based on a potential upside valuation, but, but you, you pay based on past valuation, but you hope for the best with future potential upside. Um, and obviously, there's a huge opportunity to educate the seller, get goodwill, and get a better deal that way. So let's talk a little bit about basics that you need to understand, right? Some things that you need to understand in financials, in business in general. Some of you might look at it and say it's like, obviously, it may, it's, it's super simple. Uh, for some of you, it might work just talking through some of those terms that I have in mind, right? So you definitely want to learn um, about the revenues of the deal, right? Ask yourself, what about, about the revenues? Are the numbers up, down? What about the profits, net profits? What are the margins overall in that business compared to the industry? Are we at good range or not? What about the cash flow? How much cash we have in the bank? Uh, what's the cost to get a new customer, right? You want to ask yourself those different questions. How long a client stayed with us? What the churn looks like, right? Are they staying a long ter term? Do we have contracts with the clients or not? Uh, how much debt there's on the business? What am I inheriting as the potential buyer, right? What about the receivables in the business? What's the turnover ratio for those receivables? What about the inventory turnover ratios? Um, and overall, you want to understand basics in the overall financial uh, reports, which are the income statement, the, the P&L basically, uh, the balance sheet uh, and the cash flow statement. And this is a bit outside the scope of this program, but like I said, um, you can definitely learn the basics on your own. And in this challenge and masterclass, we're going to show you how to make offers either way. But those are some of the things you definitely want to pay attention to. And if we go in even deeper, you definitely want to ask yourself, like, how, how are you uh, or that business is better than a competitor? Like, what's the uniqueness that they have? Um, what guarantees they can give you for that business to make the same amount of money at least the next year? Because remember, you always... By definition, the seller knows more about the business than you. So you need to always be a bit skeptic and ask yourself what the seller is guarantee here to me to show me that the business is going to make the same amount of money next year when I'm the owner, right? You always want to ask yourself, um, what about the comp com competitors, right? What makes you think that the competitors won't destroy you, right? What uniqueness do you have? What are the trends in that sector overall, up, down, um, who is the ideal customer? Who are the customers overall? How do you get those customers with that business? What product services do you have and sell? What price points? Uh, why do you sell those services or products and not other ones, right? Ask yourself all those things. Who is running what in the business, right? Ask yourself, very, very important. Who's doing what? 
what each person is accountable for. You want to learn about those things as much as possible, especially if you know nothing about the sector. The better you'll know about it before you buy the business, the better. Um, and a bit of a warning again, don't take this part lightly. You want to get to a point where in a matter of few minutes or a few hours at most, if you really start to dive in on those things, you are able to understand the basic overall financials, the biggest opportunities, and understand what are the leverage points in that deal. Um, and to know how much time you want to spend on things overall, or you want to walk away and go to a different deal. Because remember, if you have the systems for deal flow, you can really have abundance of deals to look at. So then one of the best skills to have and learn is to learn how to filter deals faster based on your criteria to make sure that you're not spending too much time on the wrong deal for you. Um, so really, really, really important. Also, you want to ask yourself when you're looking at numbers, I think I have a cool, cool story for you. In every business, you will really want to look at expenses, right? And ask yourself, especially in the P&L statement, like in the income statement, ask yourself, like, what are irrelevant stuff on this P&L? Like, what are expenses that we could eventually save when I'm the owner, right? Like, there's this cool story of someone that went out there and, and tried to turn around a business. And the first thing that people do when they try to turn around a business is looking at the expenses and seeing what they can, like, what can they basically uh, stop and save. Um, and, and that guy said that, he saw this company had a giraffe expense on their income statement, right? And that was for around $200,000 a year. And what he found out is that the business that he bought to save, he wanted to come into the business and save it, spent $200,000 a year to sponsor a giraffe, right? So ask yourself when you're looking at the business you buy, where's the giraffe? Where can I save? And every business got a giraffe. So... Your goal is that acquisition entrepreneurs to find the giraffe. So at the end of the day, those are the numbers. They don't have to be complicated. You can make things more complicated than they are, but I really want to show you that it can be also simple if you know how to look at things and understand the basics. And what I found out in life in general, the more you know about something, um, the more you'll need to understand the basics and fundamentals. Like the more expert you become at anything, in the end of the day, it comes down to how good can you keep just the basic fundamentals in place and be the best at them. And that's what it comes down here in numbers as well, right? So you do want to learn how to read financials. Uh, at first, it's tough. It's, it is tough, especially if you never looked at a balance sheet or income statement. Uh, but eventually, it will just become a natural things, uh, I think, to, to do for you. Um, and where you want to be is eventually a place where you have solid deal flow leading to fast and accurate reading of the numbers. And the better you get at knowing how to read and interpret the numbers, the better deals you can get, right? So that leads us to the next critical component, component of deal analysis, which are the angles. So that's exciting. Let's do it. So a creative angle will earn you millions, literally. So... These are the unique ways to approach the offer. There are tons of approaches, so you gotta think outside the box. I'm gonna share with you some of those today. The more you know the people and numbers, the better you can find an angle that gets the job done and get an offer accepted and get the deal done and you becoming the owner of the business. These are exciting, but in reality, there are tons of approaches and the skill of building the angle matters more than the formula. So it's about building that skill set of looking at a deal and finding right away what are some of the angles you can use. That's the skills that you want to learn as you go. So let's explore a few of those. Um, and in the end of the day, remember all of those angles are coming down to your relationship with the seller. So the better your relationship, that's why I started with the relationship with the fundamentals, the easier it will be for you to pick those angles. So... Let's go through some of those. So we're talking about minority acquisition, receivables out, inventory out, SBA financing, retirement. Like, let me just show you some of those different angles that we have in our arsenal, right? So those are some of the things that we have. All of those are different angles. A lot of strategies. And those are a lot of opportunities to buy a business without, so if you, 
you can see in the middle cash is just one of them your own cash if you want but there's so many other ways to close deals right so we are here to tell you that if you're in a position where you know how to raise capital and you know how to use the, those different angles that's where you can do game changing deals that moves you from entrepreneurs to very wealthy entrepreneur faster much faster um, and in the end of the day i really want you to learn this because it's going to give you many many options and many different ways to look at a deal with your negotiations and a lot of people will tell you you only need to do this type of deal or that type of deal or only do no money out of pocket type deals or no money down or one dollar down deals or only raise capital from banks and only do that financing and in the end of the day like I don't want you to be attached to just one way of doing things because if the only thing you know how to do is sell our financing deals then you're going to be able to do only very few deals right there's so many ways to look at a deal and structure a deal and those are some of the ways that i want you to understand and yes we will show you how to do a lot of no money down deals but you also need to understand that I mean, in the end of the day, if you only do no money down deals, it means that you're not buying the best businesses out there. So I also want to show you how to do bigger deals and raise capital and have access to capital, especially if you have good deals. You need to understand that there are investors out there looking for great deals. So why not using that? So let's go through. Seems like I need to go through this again. So. Even here, we can probably spend months on each, but let's start and give you a few examples. So let's start with syndicates. Uh, I like to share about syndicates because it's very simple and a lot of people are coming from the real estate space and understand. And it's very similar to real estate. It's basically um, means that you raise part of the capital from banks, um, part of the, or just institutions in general, you raise debt financing, part of the capital is coming from investors on the equity side of things. And you just share some of the equity and upside and potentially some um, other type of returns that you can provide the investors. It's all negotiable. You can take management fee. You can take carry, which is uh, on the upside in the exit. And again, all negotiable. But it's a very simple strategy and an angle to look at things. It basically means you're going out there. You raise part of the capital from investors, part of the capital from institutions, and you close the deal and you negotiate uh, the right equity structure between you the investors and everyone involved in the deal super simple uh, but i think it's really important but some things you need to know when you're raising capital from private investors that's what happens when you do syndicates is first of all i suggest you to always use a separate legal entity um, versus in general using your names for acquisitions um, a lot of people are afraid and not sure when to register a company i can tell you for a fact you don't have to register a company um, right away but when you have a good deal and you're about to close a deal you can register a company before closing or during the process of you raising the capital uh, it's very simple to register a company in every country nowadays could would cost you a few bucks um, but i would suggest you um, to follow obviously you want to follow security laws right um, with an attorney um, and it's different in each state and country and in the end of the day, the way that you raise capital from private investors is you basically sign them on what we call a private placement memorandum. I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, and some, some of those um, offers can only be offered to accredited investors. Some allows non-accredited investors as well, which means accredited investors are basically more wealthy individuals. Um, so you really need to be careful. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not here to give legal advice, but you really need to be careful when you're raising capital from private investors it's an amazing tool there's an amazing opportunity to raise capital for private deals the way that we're doing here right now but i want to make sure that you cover it i don't want you to make mistakes so you definitely want to uh, get some more advice on that if you decide to go through this structure um always be open with investors always explain to them there's there's a risk uh, to invest with you like everything in life be honest always be upfront always be transparent about you your deals um, and remember that you're sharing a great opportunity uh, with them, but I also need to understand that there's a risk investing in any company. Like when you're investing in a public company, there's a risk as well. So 
always be honest and upfront about it, especially with people who don't understand much about business in general or investment in general, even if they have the money. There's a lot of people out there with a lot of money, but not necessarily the understanding of what they're doing. So I always suggest you keep things honest. And, and if you want to see how do we raise, by the, by the way, capital, share the challenge in the members area and we'll share with you kind of like a live um, deal on how we raise capital for that. Um, and um, what else you want to know here? Yeah, so with investors, usually you'll need to create some kind of a deal package or uh, what we call a pitch deck. And usually the better team you have, the better credibility you have, the easier it's going to be for you to raise capital. Obviously, you can use uh, some of that um, team uh, network to find those investors. There's a lot of, a lot of ways to find investors. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I would also suggest to work with few investors versus a lot of them but it's a decision that you'll need to make but you need to remember when you raise a lot of capital from a lot of investors you have more people to talk to and, and report to on the deal um, you always want to be open about the logistics of the deals um, you always want to stay in touch with the investors before the deal after the deal to always stay in good relationships and be open about everything um, and in the end of the day it comes down to the deal right the deal gotta make sense for you for them uh, focus on win-win show how you're going to minimize the risk, show how you're going to protect the capital. That's number one goal for any investor. Um, and if you don't know how to protect the capital, um, you need to think about ways to protect the capital because otherwise the investors in the end of the day, before getting any return on their money, want to make sure that the capital is protected, right? Uh, they want reasonable returns, obviously, uh, but first of all, they want to think, how can I make sure this capital is, is not going down? Um, and you, what you'll find out with this approach is that money is never the issue when the deal is good. Um, when the deal is really good and you, you are really good to position yourself with those investors, uh, the money is out there. It's all about the deal in the end of the day. And I want to remind you the Bugatti story. If, you, if I gave you a Bugatti right now for $100,000 and you need to raise that capital within a few days, if the deal is good enough, which is the Bugatti, and you have a buyer for your Bugatti in a week from now for a million, um, you should be able to go out there and raise capital. Um, this is a great way to use OPM, other people money. Um, and when you use other people money overall, you can do more deals. The sky is basically the limit when you are able to do those deals with investors. You can do bigger deals, better deals. Um, you'll have this way more eyes on the deals, almost most advisors. Um, and um, yeah, and also remember, like even if you raise capital, a lot of people tell me, oh, but I need to dilute my equi equity. Uh, that's okay, because remember that 100% of nothing is nothing. <laughs> um, so raise money if you, even if you're going to be diluted. Um, I like the sentence that says, I'd rather own 10% uh, of a billion, billion dollar company than 100% of nothing, right? And when you raise capital from other investors, you can really, really scale things faster. Um, also, I would suggest to you that if you're not comfortable pitching the deal to your friends and family, um, why would a professional investor want to invest in you? They'll also ask you sometimes for what skin in the game. Are you willing to put into, into the play? Are you willing to sign personal guarantees? Are you going to run the business? Like what value are you bringing to the deal? Um, and it comes down a lot to selling yourself, your motivation, your enthusiasm, um, to again, going out there and just changing your conversations with people, to talk to anyone you know, to meet anyone you know, um, in terms of some logistics, uh, usually the, the, so the way that I suggest you to do is just to raise capital on a separate SPV, to have a separate SPV, separate entity for the investors. So you raise from the investors who believe in you, you put it in a different uh, entity and that entity can invest in that company. Um, like I said, I'm not a legal advisor, uh, but there are different uh, regulations that you can use with accredited investors. There's Reg A uh, with accredited investors. And there's also Reg uh, 50C, 506C for um, non-accredited, where you can also advertise. Um, but again, go and talk to your lawyers. Um, and, and again, I'm not here to give any legal advice, but I'm here to just share with you that this is one of the most amazing ways to close deals, to go out there, raise capital, um, and do it in the right way with all the advice, with all the support. And... Always, always um, add value and focus on your investors and focus on what's the best deal for them. Don't be selfish, be selfless, because the better you'll do to your investors in the first deal, the more doors it will open for you in future deals as well. Um, also, actually, another cool thing with our university program is that uh, we usually, um, we sometimes help our 
clients um, raise capital from our network as well of investors, which is a very, very lucrative thing. So I think that was enough about raising capital from private investors. Um, let's talk about another one. So let me just go through all of those. So let me talk about, there you go, asset-based lending. Asset-based lender as ABL. Um, a lot of people, so we talked about syndicates. Okay, sweet. So let's talk about asset-based lenders. So the way you use asset-based lender, it's basically a different angle, different approach when you raise capital, right? So, or when you're about to make an offer or close a deal. Asset-based lending means that you basically go to a financial institution and you are going to use the acquisition target assets as a leverage to purchase the business. Or more current, a right way to put it is that's basically going to be the way for you to provide a down payment for that business. So, the way it works, um, again, I can talk about it more, but in a simple way, it's you go into a financial institution and you ask them, hey, how much can you loan me against those business assets? And you're showing them all the information of the acquisition target. Um, usually they'll ask you for some information. Every institution will ask you for different things. Uh, and as a general rule, you can usually raise capital against receivables. Um, and if you have receivables and inventory and equipment and real estate, you can many times raise against those assets as well. Depends on the size, depends on the type. Um, and every institution will need to do their own due diligence. But uh, just to give you an example, accounts receivables, you can usually raise between 70 to 90% of uh, the balance that you have on the balance sheet. So if you have, let's say, $1 million in receivables on the acquisition target balance sheet and the right institution um, will give you 700000 then you now have 700000 you can use to pay as a down payment for the business. So it's very lucrative, very attractive. We're going to share with you some case studies on deals that have been done that way. So that was asset-based lending. Um, let's go to the next one. So... Let's just go through this again. So the next one I want to talk about is, let's talk about two things actually. So let's talk about seller financing and earnouts. So let's say that you use the asset lenders in our last slides um, and you raise 700,000, right? And let's say that you need some more money. So where that can come from? That can come from investors in the syndicate. That can also be done with seller financing. So seller financing basically means that, um, let's say the seller wants $10 million for the business. You can tell him, hey, no worries. I'll pay you $10 million and I'll pay it over X years, right? Whatever years you can negotiate. And I've seen anywhere from two years to even seven years of seller financing agreements. The most important thing you want to make sure with this is that you just make sure that whatever you pay on a yearly basis can be covered by the cash flow from the business. So it's a brilliant way to buy the business using basically the acquisition target cash flow to finance the acquisition price. It's very exciting. Uh, if it's the first time you hear about it, um, it might even blow your mind a little bit because I know it did it for me many, many years ago to understand that it's even possible to go out there, look at a business that you want to buy and buy it using that business cash flow to pay the purchase price over a period of time is just genius. And I'm, I'm still freaking excited about um, talking about it. So that's seller financing. Seller financing usually is being done on a deferred payment. It's all negotiable. Usually it can be paid on a quarterly basis, monthly basis, yearly basis, um, all negotiable. Sometimes there's can, be, there's can be interest or not on payments or not. Um, and seller financing on a deferred basis is usually kind of like a guaranteed payment. Now, the other way to do that, so I'll add another kind of like bonus angle for this training, is earnouts. So earnouts uh, are similar, but a bit different. So earnouts are basically, uh, it's an angle where the seller almost kind of like must earn part of the purchase price based on the performance of the business following the acquisition. So it's a really great way to bridge the gap in the valuation. So let's say if you tell the owner, like, hey, you think your business is worth um, whatever, 10 million, I think it's worth 5 million. So let's do this. I'll pay you the difference, that 5 million, only if you reach X results, right? So only if and when you reach that milestone, I'll be, I'll pay you uh, that difference. And that can be negotiable based on revenues, profits, even numbers of new users or hires or employees. It's all negotiable. 
That's the beauty in it. That's why when you see large acquisition stories out there, you'll see that sometimes you, you hear about them being done partially in cash, partially in stock, partially on an earn out, and then some of that money is being earned or not based on milestones. So that's really, really cool and can be negotiable as well. So let's give you another one. And that's really, really cool one, actually. And I'm going to share another case study about that. Um, if I won't be able to do it today, then probably in the, tomorrow or in two days. So the next one is about suppliers rebate. That's a very unique one and really cool one. So tomorrow when I'll share a case study, I think tomorrow is going to be the share the case study on this one. It's, it's a very exciting um, way to close and raise capital for a deal. So vendor uh, rebate or supplier rebate or it's basically a type of a vendor incentive in which kind of like a, the part of the purchase amount that you had with that supplier is being returned by the supplier to you as the buyer when a specified quantity or value of goods has been purchased within a specified period. It's super, super exciting. So the way it works is, let's say you're looking at acquisition for Target and you're looking at the balance sheet, you're seeing their suppliers in there and you, you're able to reach out to them and you told, tell them, hey, look, um, this business paid you $2 million over the next two, two years. I'm going to be the owner of this business. I'm going to buy it. Um, what kind of a rebate can we agree on to get on this deal? Assuming, obviously, that we want to continue this work together, right? With you being the supplier, you can even sell an exclusivity. This can be a lot of money. I'm going to share with you, like I said, a story about Lyle Wong for uh, students in university. He raised six figures as a down payment to buy a multi-million dollar business this way. He basically went to suppliers of a business that he don't own and raised that capital from him um, in a rebate. So it's super, super exciting. I hope that it opens your uh, eyes to what's possible. It's super cool. You basically can get access to hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars in capital that you don't own, but you're now going to control. And in the day of the acquisitions, you can basically get access to the capital and then have that transaction going. So, I, th I think the biggest important thing is um, don't explore all those angles before you know what the seller wants, right? Be sure that you know what they're doing, uh, what you're doing, I'm sorry, and what they want, or you can get wrapped into a bad deal. Because there's so many of those opportunities like even those that I shared with you, I shared with you, I think, uh, four different strategies that are super, super exciting. There's a lot of things you can miss out in them, a lot of things you can do right, but that's how big, big, big deals are being done out there using some of those strategies. And I hope it. Uh, I hope you like it. So those were the angles, right? And I shared with you just, you saw, it's like four of them. Uh, it's super, super exciting to look at each deal and kind of like start to think, okay, this is the deal I have in, in mind right now as a potential target. Basically, let's think what angles I can use for this potential acquisition. Obviously, and it's all with back and forth play with this seller. So next, let's talk a little bit about the negotiation. So negotiations happening all the time. You want to do an op how to position yourself when you talk to the owner. You want to start a conversation with them. And it's about knowing how to dance, right? So it's all about relationship, the numbers, the angles plus the capital that you raise. It's kind of like finding the balance between all of those things together. And in your negotiations, that's when you potentially can bring a deal team to help you as well. So those are some of the things that are involved in negotiations. So let's dive a little bit more into each of those. So deal team. Uh, some people, sometimes you can have a, a deal team to help you. Um, sometimes you don't, if you know some of those things, like, you know, there's a few things in the deal, like knowing the numbers better, knowing the legals better. Sometimes you don't even need to do and, and have those people to help you. Sometimes it's good to have those experts to help you. Um, it really depends on you. Everyone here is in a different situation. Some of you have a lot of business experience. Some of you are able to learn fast. Um, that's what we do in our uni program. We basically help people to be able to do those things really, really fast, sometimes without a deal team at all. But obviously having someone with a lot of experience and expertise is always helpful. Um, so some of the people you can have on your team are finance people, M&A maybe, buy side people, um, if you don't know the full details, legal person to help you or legal team, 
<clears throat> uh, potentially you want um, industry experts to help to help you understand if that business is good or not in that sector. But in the end of the day, you really don't want to be too reliable on them, right? You don't want to get to a point where, first of all, you don't know anything and they'll steal your deal uh, because you add no value whatsoever and you just don't know what you're doing. So those are some of the things to uh, be careful with and understand about bringing a deal team to any deal that you're looking at. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things like, man, I can talk about those things for months. Even with a deal team, some deal members you can pay on an hourly, some you can pay on a on a um, results only basis when the acquisition targets paying for the acquisition. There's so many details, but I, I really want to run through some of these because we're already past the hour and I want to make sure that I go through everything that I wanted to put in this training. But just so you know, there's so much involved in this and it's super, super exciting. But let's talk a little bit about offers. So after you make your first offer, which I'm going to share with you, um, I think either today or tomorrow, how to make your first offers, we're going to always wait for a counter offer if your first one is getting rejected. So I'm just going to share with you some few tips that have helped me over the years and to our clients. So wait for a counter offer. If you're willing to increase your offer, I'd say wait at least a week. Like never, never look desperate when you're making offers. Always remind them that you're taking as much risk as them. Like, so you need to be risk yourself. Um, there's many ways and strategies to make offers. Um, there's different approaches you can take as well. Even if it's logistically, you can send offers in the email. You can uh, attach the PDF. You can send a letter. You can even do a, a meeting or a Zoom call or uh, a live face-to-face -face one and then present your, your offer. There's no right or wrong. It's really what do you want to do. As long as, in my mind, your mindset and approach is that it's a collaborative approach and we're doing it on the same side of the same side of the table with the seller uh, that's the best way to do that and just to give you kind of like an overall idea of what it looks like usually you send an offer the offer either get accepted and move to an LOI uh, we're going to talk more about that in a bit uh, as well LOI is basically a letter of intent which means that um, you put a letter with some more details information about the deal um, something that you want to understand is that you don't need to be afraid to make offers. They're non-binding, which means um, you don't necessarily have to move forward even if the offer get accepted. That's why I don't want you to be afraid. Um, don't be afraid to make low offers. Don't be afraid to offend people. Remember that if you use an SPV, a separate entity, you don't really have much downside, especially if you don't need to sign personal guarantees on your deals. Um, yeah, so those, those are some of the things you want to understand with your um, offers. Also keep in mind, don't be afraid to make an offer. Um, so yeah, I think the biggest thing is don't be afraid to make offers. Uh, they're non-binding. You have nothing to lose, literally. Uh, we're going to give you in one of the homework action steps to make offers. So I want to kind of create, uh, put, I guess, plant the seed to show you that, hey, it's all good. Like, don't be afraid to make offers, right? And that's our goal with this masterclass and challenge in the end of the day. And also some quick more warning, right? So some of the things that I see, people just don't know anything about numbers, don't know anything about angles, don't know about people. They start with the wrong frame, don't build relationships. They have scarcity thinking. They don't have the deal flow done and don't have enough deals to look at. Um, they're going out there and doing deal things and deals that are not win-win and then it's going to hit them in the future because the seller is not going to be incentive to help them. Um, just in general, people not making any offers. There's People are just afraid to make offers. Uh, there are people who are afraid to make lower offers because they feel they're going to offend the seller. But you need to remember there's not really many other buyers waiting. Um, also, never be too eager. Um, that's another super important thing. And another mistake that I see is people just have the wrong team to help them. Uh, that can really destroy deals, especially if you have uh, advisors who charge you by the hour then guess what? They're going to do their best to charge you more hours. So you really want to pay attention to those things as well. So that was a bit about negotiations. And I know, I'm sorry if I'm overwhelming you, but there's so many things that I want to put out there because I don't want you to see you making mistakes. I know that you can make a lot of mistakes and I just share with you some of the things that really going to make sure that you're not making those mistakes, uh, at least in your first kind of steps. So let's talk a little bit about mistakes and I'll go and go through them as fast as I can. Uh, but I want to save you the pain. I want to make sure you're not making those mistakes. So first of all, it's just wasting time on the wrong person or the deal, right? Which means, first of all, you usually just don't have automations around your deal. So you don't have enough deals to look at. That's probably one of the reasons that that happens to begin with. 
uh, not knowing a bad deal when you see it, right? Which means you just don't know how to analyze the deal. You don't know, understand anything about the numbers. That's another thing. You don't know how to build relationships with them. Um, also, another thing is limiting options because of limited skills. You don't know how to raise capital. You don't know how to interpret the numbers and understand what is good, what is bad, what are some of the assets, the balance sheet, the cash flow statements. Those are some of the problems I see out there as well. People don't understand legal elements. Uh, I see problems there as well. Um, for example, like I said, people don't understand when you're making an offer, is it's non-binding, so they're afraid. They don't understand the legal part. Um, and that basically holds them back from taking action. Uh, relying too much on just doing no money down deals. If you only want to do no money down deals and distress deals or just seller financing deals, um, you're just going to do bad deals. And I want you to make money from your deals, not waste your time and a small fortune and uh, on buying the wrong businesses. So learning how to raise capital using some of the strategies I mentioned here, like raising capital from rebates or from syndicates, uh, it's very, very helpful and important. And the more money you can raise in the end of the day, the better deals you can do. Um, no money down deals or distressed deals just gonna means you're going to do poorer deals, like less of good deals, period. Um, and the more you know, the more you know how to raise capital, um, the better deals you do. The quality of deals, of deals otherwise is just restricted. And in the end of the day, when you buy a business, you want quality, right? You want to be able to have an upside of the deal. You want to make money. That's what we're here for, to have money, to make money, to, to, to make an impact. Um, and otherwise, if you're not doing a good deal, it's very difficult. So you definitely want to develop the tools, the skills, the knowledge on how to bring capital to the table on deals. Um, you don't want to, I don't want to see you getting into shitty businesses and getting screwed up, waste time, waste money. And I've seen that a lot, unfortunately. Uh, people messaging me and telling me, hey, Moran, I, I wish I watched this training or other ones that I have out there before because I just spent a life fortune on, on a bad deal. Um, so yeah, yeah just, just remember, no, no amazing business owner, like, you're not going to buy Apple or Facebook uh, with no money whatsoever that you're going to raise, right? Like, keep that in mind, right? If you're going to buy a distressed company for $1 down, usually it's not going to be Tesla or Apple, right? So please, please, please keep that in mind and understand that the more money you can raise, the better deals you can do. And that's the goal here, to do good deals, make good money for you, the investors, and anyone involved. Um, another thing is just not knowing how to position with the business owner. You don't know how to approach them, how to talk as a reliable, credible buyer, what to say, what to ask, how to lead, how to just get what you need overall and make it a win-win for everyone. That's another mistake. Um, only knowing how to focus on certain type of deals. I mentioned that. So people only look for a distressed deal. They only know how to make a distressed offer or leverage buyouts offer or seller financing offers. And it's very, very difficult because the more, in the end of the day, the more tools you have in the toolbox, the better you can solve the problem, right? That's why we have all those angles, all those different ways to approach deals, all those ways to raise capital and not just do distressed deals or bad deals or, you know, kind of like looking for the, the bad, worst deals out there that if you're lucky, you'll get them for zero money down, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's nothing wrong about doing those deals, but you need to understand that there's a lot of opportunities out there. So you want to be able to approach all of those deals and make the best decisions to you specifically. Um, another big mistake I see, just people focus too much on numbers, right? It's another mistake I see, especially for people who are very, um, just analyze, like to analyze things. Uh, that's just usually a very uh, dependent on your personality. So if you're too much analyzing things, uh, it means that you forget sometimes about people and you forget that you're doing deals with people and not with excel sheets that's very important as well relying too much on board members i've seen that as well people you know think okay i'll have a board i'll just let them do everything um you do that just see people waste too much time looking for a board just to have someone on their website and then they're doing nothing and they're giving too much equity then they don't know what to do with that equity then they're afraid to be diluted and like why did i give equity they didn't do anything, uh, they didn't really add any value to me, now they stole my deal. So it's like, don't rely too much on board members or in general advisors, like learn those skills. That's what we're doing this here, we're teaching you that skill. So you can close those deals and eventually maybe even partner with us on some of those deals and we could help you close it or invest potentially in you as well. Because again, those deals out there, those private businesses are great investment opportunities for the right people with the right businesses. And that's what we're here to do with you. We want to help you, empower you, to remind you that it's possible for you to do those deals because there's amazing opportunities, amazing deals out there. So why not? Um, another thing is, yeah, just not being good at using angles. So even if you know all the angles, I've seen people that just don't know how to approach it, how to look at each deal and 
uh, I guess, consider each angle and how to make sure that you're using the wrong, right angle with the right deal. That's very crucial as well. Um, another mistake I've seen, I'm seeing people doing is just they they don't know how to fill the third deal fast enough, and that means they're wasting a lot of time. They just overcomplicate things. Um, just a lot of people just being perfectionist with the offer. They're literally taking months to to make an offer, uh, forgetting that like worst case you get a yes, um, and you still have a way out, so you don't need to worry about it. Um, another thing is trying to beat the other side. I don't like that. Um, like. Yeah, look, I don't like the attitude of always I'm thinking that there's always a winner and a loser in negotiation. Um, I just like the collaborative win-win, you know, long-term wins, long-term relationships. I think that's the only way to do business nowadays, at least. Being too optimistic as well. I've seen that happens as well. Like people who have no experience, no background, um, want to be a billionaire in a day type of people, want to build a billion-door business in a day with bringing no skills, no money, no work, but think that they still deserve 1% of the deal just because they're able to go to a broker website and download uh, an information memorandum. So I guess keep things in perspective as well, like understand where you're at, what you bring to the table, what you bring to the deal. Uh, it's really, really important as well, especially if you want to position yourself as a credible buyer. Otherwise, people just won't take you seriously. Like if you'll go out there and, and, and talk things that makes no sense, people will look at you like crazy, right? So remember that this is not a be a billionaire in a day thing. This is Let's build wealth the right way with the right people and have win-win for everyone. So I think we covered a lot. Um, we covered deal flow. We covered deal analysis by now. Let me share with you a bit of a case study, one of our uni guy. That's Borislav. I'm really, really proud of him. So you can read this testimonial here in our Facebook group of our uni members. Um, let me quickly go through the details. He came to us, he worked with us. He bought a trucking company, which means he had a lot of drivers working for him. Um, I think around 80 last time he told me. Um, so he tried to purchase actually other businesses before that, but then he decided to focus on this one. Um, it's just to give you an idea. Um, purchase talk. Okay, so he's saying that he's right in here, but just so you know, in terms of revenues, the business did $13 million a year in revenues, $1.2 million in EBITDA. And I think he said, yeah, two points. He paid for it $2.7 million uh, using SBA, he found the business directly, so there was no broker involved. He basically took the experience that he had from learning with us. He had the confidence to do that from the training. He listened to my calls with other business owners. He knew what to say, how to say, what to ask. Um, it, it, it took him nothing out of his own pocket. He actually overfinanced the deal and had even more working capital to pay more people and bring in more employees and advisors. Um, his background, just to give you an idea, is... I mean, I remember, you can see I have some bullets here, but he, was, he, he told me it was very much out of his comfort zone. Um, he had the mindset of having nothing to lose. If, yeah, he worked. Okay, so he worked as a trucker, having a shower, then got dressed in a suit to meet the banker to show that he's credible. And it took him uh, six months from joining our program to get in this business, just focus on the next step in front of him at a time. He had a great team helping him. Um, and da -da -da -da, yeah, he positioned himself as an experienced person when he's talking to lenders. He knew how to do that. And he told us that it's all about the nuances. And by the way, um, I'm just writing some, reading some of those bullets from the interview with him. If you're going to buy the VIP version, um, then you're going to have a full, I think we have like 40 minute video interview with Borislav and many, many other members just like him going through everything step by step. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. So that's Borislav. I freaking love that guy. It's, it's really, really amazing. So not too bad, right? Barely knows English, the guy. It's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. I'm so proud. Sometimes I'm, I'm, in, I'm even surprised with some of the deals that people out there are doing. A 13 million a year in revenues business. How long will it take you to build something like this from scratch? Incredible. Seriously, it's inspiring. And that's why I'm doing this. It's so amazing. It's so good to see it. And now we're looking to work with Borislav to do even more deals and helping him. And heck, we even figure out um, and exploring the IPO routes with him, uh, which is out of the scope of this program. But I'm super, super excited about this. So here are a few numbers. Yeah, so it did 17 million, then it went down to 13. And that's what allowed him to buy the business at such a great uh, multiples. No broker, zero down. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So today, 
I'm going to give you some more homework, which is go out there, find and contact 10 brokers and 10 business owners. And let me talk to you a little bit about how you do that. So to find brokers, I suggest you to start by just Googling business brokers. A great site that everyone knows about is Biz by Sell. Uh, there's a lot of websites, a lot of brokers. Uh, we even going to have, uh, if you're watching this, might even have some listings for you on our acquisitions.com platform. So the way to work with brokers is make sure, first of all, to build a relationship with them. Remember, it's all about people. It's all about relationship. Get on the phone with them. Don't make things via email. At the end of the day, brokers need to screen you somehow. They want to make sure that you're talking to someone credible, who have certainty, who have understanding of what he's talking about. Uh, the way to position yourself with brokers, um, the easiest way to do it is to, first of all, remember that you doing them a favor uh, as much as they do to you, right? So your position, your tonality, your confidence is cr critical when you say those words. So if you uh, are going to be on the phone with brokers, you can say something like, hey, Mr. Broker, I'm looking to buy a business doing up to uh, 10 million in revenues uh, in that whatever tracking sector. Um, you can even tell them, hey, I'll be backed by banks and investors. It's going to be a combination of debt and equity for the financing side of things. I'm also a part of a large group of high net worth individuals, which you are right now. So if this deal won't be a fit for me uh, personally, I could even introduce you to someone else in my network to potentially buy from your listing this deal or another deal that you have. So if you're saying something like this to your brokers, um, it shows that you really know what you're talking about. You're sharing words like debt and equity and you show that you have access to the capital if the deal makes sense to you. Um, and you obviously add value as well because you tell them that you're part of a high, uh, a group of high net worth individuals, which you are. We have a lot of very successful clients here and just people in general in the group, people with seven, eight and nine figure businesses that I know personally are involved in our groups. Um, you always want to position yourself as someone credible. So I don't care what's your background, even if you have no background in business whatsoever. I don't care. Even if you worked in Uber, uh, for me, it means you have a transportation background. So when you talk to the broker, tell him, hey, my background is in transportation and I'm looking to use that background to uh, now be my own boss and own equity in, in a business that I'm looking to purchase, right? So something like that. Position yourself as someone credible. Don't position yourself as someone who's looking to buy a multi-million dollar business um, and beg for someone to give it to you for free. Business is not working that way. You got to show value. You got to give value. You got to position yourself as a credible buyer, um, ideally with access to capital yourself or from your network. Um, and if you know all those angles, you know how to approach things, you can really great get great deals with uh, brokers um, if you can raise capital. With uh, brokers, be careful, uh, not be careful, but just remember that brokers promise something to their uh, sellers, to their business owners that they work with. Um, and usually those promises are not, hey, I'm going to sell your business and it's going to be 100% earn out or something or 100% seller financing. So you need to be, I guess, sensitive to that and understand that and understand that they have their own fees to earn. Some of those brokers also work on a retainer. So their interest is obviously to continue to make earn that retainer. Um, but again, it's all negotiable. It all depends on the broker. It all depends on you and how you position yourself, how you are credible or not. So keep all those things in mind when you talk to brokers, go out there, message 10 brokers, jump on the phone with 10 brokers. If you not going to talk to 10, talk to at least one, build the momentum, right? It's the domino, the domino effect. Start with one. Do those things on the phone, please, not on the email. Build relationships or meet them even in person. Be credible. Dress like someone who is, can be a business owner. Not, don't go with flip-flops. Uh, no, be serious. Shave your beard a little bit if you think that you need to do that. Like, be a credible buyer. Ask yourself, what would a credible business buyer would look like? And... That's how you want to act. And with the broker, the next step is basically he will either suggest to you to sign an NDA, which is a non-disclosure agreement. Don't worry about signing a non-disclosure agreement. I'm not here to provide legal advice, but I sign hundreds of them a month. I never had any issues. But again, this is not me giving any legal advice. Um, sign NDAs, get access to financials and start to look at the angles and figure out, can I pick some of the angles that maybe we worked on today and figure out, can I do a deal this way? Um, please, please, please don't focus on email with brokers. They're going to screen you. They're going to, they're going to ask you for other things, uh, like your personal bank account, which is unnecessarily if you know how to talk to them the right way and you position yourself as a credible buyer. Um, what else? So yeah, please don't act like someone who, who's poor with no experience. Even if you don't have experience, remember you are an investor because if I give you a Bugatti right now, you will be able to raise the capital. So 
you need to value yourself as much as the Bugatti. You are worthy of it. You are capable. If the deal makes sense, you can raise the capital. That should be your attitude. And you are now part of uh, high net worth individuals that can provide you that capital. Uh, but again, another disclosure, it doesn't mean that you can post in our group saying, hey, I'm looking for an investor because legally you can't do that. You can't solicit people in public to invest in your deal. That's why I'm saying to you, you got to have the right legal advice and the right support. So that's how you reach out to brokers. Go out there, look for broker sites, biz by sell, businesses for sale. There's a lot of websites out there. It depends on where you're at, which country, every country have their own site. Just go out there, start to make calls. Um, next step, go and reach out to business owners directly. So a few ways to find business owners. Uh, you can just go to the company site and look for their names in there. You can call them directly and ask them, hey, who's the owner? I'd like to speak to him on a confidential uh, matter. Uh, you can even check their about you know, on their team, on their website. You can look for uh, just on Google, sites like uh, Zoom Info. You can search on LinkedIn, uh, Hoover's. Hoover's is uh, H-O-O-V-E-R-S. You can look, um, or Dan Bradstreet, you can look for some info there. There's a lot of companies out there who provide information about business owners. Uh, you can use hunter.io to find their email. Um, you can also find those business owners on LinkedIn, right? So you can go out there and just use something like uh, either connect with people directly on LinkedIn, just connect with business owners, CEOs, uh, managers, things like that. And reach out to them and ask them a message, similar to what I shared last time with a similar script. Um, ideally, go and look for uh, companies who have at least 10 employees. You can look for keywords, like I said, like owner, founder, CEO, manager, things like that. Hey everyone, welcome to day four of the Acquisitions Masterclass. My name is Moran Pober, I'm the founder and CEO of Acquisitions.com. So, if you remember, this masterclass is all about exploring our three-step acquisition process, which are deal flow, deal analysis, deal execution. Just quick reminders, this is all about the black box secret of the truly wealthy people in the world. They're truly wealthy elite. That's what they're doing. They're doing acquisitions. They're buying businesses. They're doing deals, mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, exits. That's what they do. Um, so you are learning here the most lucrative entrepreneurial skill in the world, period. I hope you got it by now. So the simple process is here to unlock these results in three simple steps. We can overwhelm you, but we're not doing that. We want to keep it as simple as possible. We already covered deal flow. We already even covered deal analysis. Now we're ready for the final step. Everything about deal execution. There's probably going to be a few parts for that, but today we're going to do as much as we can to talk all about deal execution. Now, deal execution is all about what to do after the initial offer stage, right? So usually when you make an offer on a business, and today we're going to show you how to make an offer, uh, the offer is either uh, getting accepted or rejected, right? Pretty straightforward. Now, if it's rejected, usually what you need to do is to go back to your angles to your offer angles and analyze the deal again and see what you can bring from those different angles some of them we talked about in the last day and see what can you do to make a better offer or maybe you want to just decide to move on to the next deal right and just keep this one it's up to you on how much you want to do this deal and how important that is for you when the offer is accepted this is where deal execution come into play Right, so this is what today is all about, where you really move into uh, legalizing the, the offer, let's say, right, where you're doing your due diligence and you're getting everything across the finish line. So why is deal execution so important? So of course, deal execution is critical because without it, you're just wasting time and energy and talking and dreaming, but you're not actually acquiring businesses, obviously, right? And this stage of the process is actually one of the most scary and intimidating stages. Lots of things can go wrong, get missed, or take a turn for the worse. I've seen a lot of those horror stories. I'm going to share some of those today. And you want to be able to navigate everything like a pro to actually add that seven-figure business to your portfolio. Um, in fact, without good execution, you will work hard with no results because you just can't reliably finish the process. You will miss details that hurt you in the long run. 
You'll spend a small fortune doing due diligence, bringing in outside experts, getting advice when it's not always needed. And you'll expose yourself to uh, risk, to fraud, to different mistakes. You'll fail to set yourself up for success, which is what we're here for in the end of the day. And if you get this right, your acquisition will be smooth. You'll get a massive win for your future, your wealth, your dreams. And you'll just feel more empowered than ever after closing a deal. I don't think there's many things in life that makes you feel so empowered and so good after you're doing them, like doing acquisitions. If you get this wrong, I've seen that happen in a lot. You'll acquire a ticking bomb that could just become a messy trap that destroys your time, energy, and money. And that's the last thing we want to happen, right? So let's start with today's outline. It's very simple today, uh, but a lot of very important information. And remember, this sponsored by Acquisitions University. Everything you're watching here is sponsored by Acquisitions University. Acquisitions University is a mentorship program that provides step-by-step -step detailed training on all things acquisitions, as well as 12 months of weekly Q&A calls with me, with other M&A professionals, 24-7 support, more than 1,000 people in our community are out there buying businesses and they're out there to ensure that you'll buy one, two, three or even more businesses every year. It's everything that you need, all the small details, all the nuances, all the support, all the automations. Um, so basically, if you really want to take acquisition seriously, go to acquisitions.com forward slash join and you'll see some of the things you'll get from being part of our university group. So let's get to work on today's topics. So first we're gonna talk about what we call uh, a letter of intent. I'm gonna share some um, cool information about that. Then we talk gonna talk about due diligence to make sure that basically you're doing due diligence to make sure that you're acquiring what you think you're acquiring, right? It's super important. Next is the kind of like the nitty gritty of the closing day. We're gonna talk about that. When you do it right, uh, this is simple and straightforward. So don't freak out too much here, uh, but some really important things that a lot of people miss that are gonna save you a small fortune, a, lo a lot of time. And we obviously will wrap up with common mistakes I see in the execution phase. And then in the end of the day, remember our mission is simple. If you've been taking action and if you didn't, start to take action, start to build momentum. Remember, you can do this as well you're starting to have actual conversations. If you actually fold my action steps in each of those days, you should have conversations with business owners. You have 80-20 roadmap to acquire your first business or first bolt on to your existing business. That's our goal with this challenge, right? And we're gonna to continue today and tomorrow as well. You've build, been building momentum. So we have another amazing action step for you at the end today as well. And yeah, you should have started reaching out from yesterday to your war market, um, from two days ago, from yesterday, to business owners, through brokers, um, and today we're gonna get things to the next level. And today we're going to actually make offers on businesses, and I'm gonna share with you about that later. But first, let's get started with everything. So I hope you are ready with uh, somewhere to write notes if it's pen and paper or something on your computer. So let's get to it. So what is a letter of intent or in short LOI? It's basically in a nutshell a document that is outlining the understanding between two or more parties which understanding they intend to formalize in a legally binding agreement eventually. Right? Other names uh, that you might gonna hear are, maybe you heard about head of terms or a term sheet or memorandum of understanding. It depends on who you're talking to. Um, you might hear those words as well. Uh, they basically mean the same thing. So what is an LOI? In the end of the day, it's an extended version of the offer with more details about the deal. So what happens is, first of all, you make an offer usually which is very non-formal and simple, which is gonna be the action step in the end of the day today. And after you get the offer accepted, usually you put things on an LOI where you get basically everything extended with more details about the deal. It sets the most important terms and everything you want in the deal, you put in it, right? So 
the goal is to get everyone on the same page without it being binding and legal basically. So a bit more information about LOI. So some of the things you'll see in an LOI are obviously you're gonna see some buyer and the seller information, the name, the company name, um, everything about the price, the structure, the liabilities that you inherit as part of the deal or not. If there's seller financing in the deal, you'll see that info there, uh, working capital, numbers and adjustments, you'll see the details there as well. If there's earnouts, you're gonna see the details there. Uh, things like due diligence, exclusivity period, checklist, um, and then also you need to remember that purchase agreement will then occur um, after due diligence. Uh, it can be, um, I don't want to overwhelm you, but you can buy assets or you can buy uh, the shares, uh, which then means that you inherit the liability as an ongoing concern. Um, and that's something that when you want to work with your team, with your lawyer, that's something that, um, yeah, it's, it's outside the scope of this program, at least for now. And the goal is to get everyone on the same page without it being binding to begin with. And yes, you can go directly to a sales and purchase agreement, but usually it's more common to do an LOI first. And then when you're actually closing the deal, you're signing the sales and purchase agreement. And maybe some of you bought real estate, then you're familiar with a sales and purchase agreement. So similar here, but usually with businesses, and uh, many times with real estate, especially with larger deals, it's very common to start with some kind of a term sheet or an LOI as well. And with businesses, you can make an offer, you can start with an LOI. Uh, we'd like to start with a non uh, basically a simple offer, and then if the offer gets accepted, uh, then we move to an LOI. But again, there's you'll see a lot of different approaches. There's no right or wrong. It's just like, you know, do what makes sense for both sides. If you get this right, you first of all won't run into negotiation surprises near the end of the close, right? We don't want you, want you to get to that point. You'll know exactly where to spend time on that deal. You'll be able to quickly evaluate potential costs for the acquisitions, right? So there's a lot of benefits of doing this right, right? It sets you, set up basically the foundation for a quick and seamless close. And that's what we're all about. That's what we're doing here, right? We want to get you to a point where you're closing the deal in a simple and simple, simplest way, seamless way. Yeah, a bit of a warning. If you do it wrong, and I've seen mistakes and problems, like um, because you do things wrong, there's an um, option where the seller can regret, um, basically he changes his mind or some thoughts in the last minute. Um, lost detail, which ambushes you basically the day of the close. Um, some people, or not signing exclusivity on the deal, that's a mess. And I'm gonna talk more about that in the mistakes in a bit as well. Um, some people are just rather just pay lawyers to draft something from scratch. That can be expensive. Um, so why not just use a template? So yeah, be careful from those things. So after you send the LOI, now it's time to do your due diligence. This is where you really dig in and make sure that what you're looking at is real, right? And you get access to everything that you need to verify everything, right? To make sure that everything is fine. Everyone is as the owner basically said to you, right? That's, that's the, that period. So due diligence. There's, first of all, lots of moving parts, right? Some experts may be required at this um, part. Uh, we're talking accountants that might do your financial due diligence or any finance guy, um, lawyers to do your legal due diligence, um, potentially help you with creating the investor vehicle if needed. Um, commercial due diligence sometimes comes into play as well when you bring in uh, people with uh, understanding of the sector. Um, investors, uh, inst financial institutions, have their due diligence, right? So those are some of the things that you'll need to be, I guess, prepared for. And even here, it all comes down to the relationships that you started building from the deal flow and deal analysis parts. And it's very important. Here, you're gonna really see things come into play. And this is a time where you wanna check and recheck everything possible. You don't know what you don't know. That's the biggest thing with buying a business, right? You don't know what you don't know. 
by definition, the seller knows more about the business than you. So you want to learn as much as possible during that due diligence period to see that that's the real, that's the business that you wanted to buy in the first place, right? And there's also, you know, it comes down to systemizing things, to having checklists, to being a leader and leading your team at this point. Um, there's also different ways to pay to pay those advisors. Um, I don't want to, again, overwhelm you too much, but you can cap the fees, you can pay on contingent fee, you can pay it on closing only, you can start with a small retainer and then pay on the upside at closing. There's hourly rates, uh, I've seen deferred rates 100%. Um, you know, it really, really depends. And in the end of the day, each one of you, you'll see, will get different terms from their team based on the report that you build, based on your relationship, and based on the positioning that you have with those team members. Um, if you want to know a little bit more on due diligence, I have here a list on the deal we're closing right now. So I can riff on some of the things that we asked, for example, just to show you the, the business to provide as part of the due diligence. And you'll just, uh, I'll just read through it till you see kind of like what's involved. So we ask for monthly p &L, balance sheets for, at this point we ask for 2019 and year to date to 2020, because uh, we were in 2020 right now. Uh, we ask for budgets or business plan for 19 and 20. Uh, we ask both a uh, written plan and Excel spreadsheet. We ask uh, for a budget or a business plan for 2021. Um, also both written and Excel spreadsheets. We ask for the most recent business plan. We ask for a list of all the bank or other cash accounts along with uh, who has authorization to sign the account. We ask for bank statements. Um, yeah, I won't go into dates, but basically I'll, I'll just read through everything fast um, to not get you too bored. We ask for marketing play, uh, plans. We ask for the uh, aging accounts receivables report, uh, the write-offs, inventory reports, inventory aging reports, monthly um, accounts payable, list of employees, salary, rates, if it's hourly or not, insurance, other benefits, starting date of, date of employment, employment for each, responsibilities, bonuses for each, copies of quarterly employee uh, tax filings, including W-2, W-3, uh, copies of any federal tax letters, uh, copies of any uh, province tax letters, a uh, copy of lease agreements for the office, a uh, schedule of all costs, benefits, any contract between suppliers and the company, any contract between employees and the company, um, resumes for key people, sales team listing and roles, general roles, like there's like 20 more. I don't want to get you bored, but there's a lot of things that are involved in the acquisition process, in the due diligence process that you want to lead uh, with your team. But you definitely kind of like want to understand what's involved. But in a nutshell, it's about getting access to everything you can in the business. That's that period. Basically, you made an offer. Both sides kind of agree to something, some kind of a term. And now it's time to really do your deep dive due diligence. So I hope it kind of like gave you an idea of what's involved in the due diligence period. So obviously, if you do it right, you'll buy the business that you want. You won't make small fortune mistakes, which I've seen. Um, and you'll just do things faster and get deals done, right? This is what we hear for in the end of the day. And yeah, be careful because I know companies that literally went bankrupt paying fees on due diligence on deals that they didn't close because they just didn't know how to negotiate and how to position themselves with advisors, with accountants, with lawyers, right? So all those things are things you want to pay attention to and make sure that you do the right way. So let's talk a little bit about closing. So in terms of closing a deal, um, there's three ways to look at it. Some people look at it as, okay, now I'm free. Uh, I think the way to look at it is just another day. And I'll tell you a bit more about that in a bit. Um, and easy and simple. If you've done the work up to this point, like that closing day is very exciting, especially if it's the first time you're doing that. But it's pretty straightforward. You're just signing a lot of agreements. Um, and it's obviously hard and risky if you haven't done the work so far, right? And you didn't follow what we told you. So this is kind of pop the champagne and get back to work uh, attitude. But I'll talk more about that in a second. It really depends on who are you? Are you the investor? Are you going to be the CEO? So more, let me tell you a little bit more about closing. So first of all, now basically you're the owner, right? So congrats on that. So before that, you probably registered a company. 
ideally a separate company like we said a separate um, SPV uh, special purpose vehicle for that acquisition and it can be done a few days before closing you don't need to register a company too early um, sometimes you might register a bit earlier because you want to bring in the investors on a different entity but <clears throat> yeah you'll need a separate company ideally um, that's the time to get on the bank mandate right or or just get a new account it depends on how you're going to uh, structure things so get on the bank mandate i've, I've seen mistakes where uh, people don't do that and they have a problem to get added to the deal um, one simple way you can do also is to, to just get started with adding yourself as a bookkeeper to the account first it's just so much easier to get access to more accounts and then over time you can say you bought the business um, this is the time to meet everyone in the business to say hi and to remember that you're the leader now right so and also remember that a lot of those employees are scared it's the first time that you know they have a new boss they don't know who you are they don't know what to expect so really have a lot of compassion with them and be the leader and tell them your plans and what you want to do with this business and be excited and show them that excitement. It's super, super important. Remember, um, business is about people. In the end of the day, every business problem is an HR problem usually. So it's either a cash problem or cash or cash flow or HR people basically, right? That's what business is all about. So obviously, if you're becoming that new leader, make sure um, you're doing it the right way from day one. Um, also, now you're kind of like the new guy in the block. So... You can rene renegotiate pretty much everything. Um, everything you can do for better cash flow. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow. Um, and yeah, obviously it depends on who you are, right? So if you, I mean, if you're an investor, a passive investor, usually you just go back home and wait for reports from your management team, right? Or you can obviously say hi to the employees if you want, but not necessarily. If you're kind of like the passive, more uh, of a shareholder uh, type investor, right? more of the owner investor not the owner manager ceo if you are the ceo then that's the time to optimize operation to learn about the business to work to improve things um, and kind of like either do everything yourself and or bring experts to help you and if you get this right this is where you start to make money right this is what we hear in the end of the day to make money to create jobs to save jobs to have impact on on the community of that business that we bought um, you know to help and serve our clients this is what it's all about and this is obviously the time for you to make some money and start to build your wealth with that business um, sometimes there's also enough money at closing so if you over finance the deal it happens then you can take some money out or you can keep the business the money in the business and uh, kind of like uh, basically use that money for more growth uh, but right now you're basically the owner so you can make the decisions right you can pay yourself an income um, a salary you can issue distributions and of course you now own equity that's very important as well right and that's obviously worth something um, in terms of how you want to take on a lot of people ask me there's a lot of ways to do that i'm not here to give you any tax advice but it really depends on kind of like what's the best way to to take money out of the business and pay uh, I, I let's just say less tax less less in taxes right that's that's what business owners are doing at the end of the day and that's what you're going to do probably and you're probably going to have an accountant in that business is going to help you right so a little bit more on closing um yeah so said that let's move to the next one so oops i'm sorry i, I clicked the, the wrong error that's what happened is when you have that so if you get this right we said that um, you pay yourself awesome now let's talk a little bit about common mistakes right so we'll wrap with common mistakes that I see in the execution phase. And let's start. So first of all, being passive. Like I see a lot of people who get the offer accepted. Then they're almost like, you know, sitting on the couch waiting for things to happen and to make billions uh, sitting on the couch. It's quite the opposite. When the offer gets accepted, this is where you need to step up, you know, and become the leader and be more focused than ever. It's super important. Um, it's, it might sound very simple, but I don't know why it, it seems like a lot of people get the offer accepted and then almost kind of like stop doing anything. Um, it needs to be quite the opposite. So really pay attention to that so it won't be you. Um, going straight to uh, S&P sales and purchase agreement. Again, sometimes it can be okay, especially on a distressed deals when you buy the business for $1. But normally, um, yeah, it's not what you wanted to do. Like you want to know as much as possible about the business, especially if you don't have a downside on, on doing the due diligence in terms of fees. Um, and you know how to structure things well with the, your team. Um, so you only ideally pay at closing with the acquisition of cash flow. 
And in the end of the day, also, if you raise capital, um, yeah, you'll, you'll do due diligence for sure. Like financial institutions will insist that you'll do due diligence and obviously they will have their own due diligence as well. Um, a lot of mistakes that I see is people take forever uh, to get the board to review the deal. Then they too much rely on a board of advisors and then the deal is just not moving forward just because they don't know enough. They don't know what they don't know. They're waiting for someone else to give them all the answers and they're not taking responsibility. They don't have anyone to reach out. They're waiting for their board. Their board is busy with other stuff and deals are just not being done. So that's another mistake that I've seen. Um, also not getting access to recent numbers. Uh, when I went through the list of some of the numbers that we're asking the on the business we're doing right now, the deal we're doing right now, you saw that there's a lot of questions about the latest numbers, latest balance sheet, latest, latest, latest p and I'm talking like super latest. So for example, it's so, it's so important because when you're doing due diligence, usually we're talking about like two months of exclusivity. And before you made the offer, there's a chance that you only looked at numbers from two months before that. So you can get to a point where you're making an offer on a business and you're in due diligence and you don't you didn't look at numbers for the last three, four months. Now, usually it, it might not be a big deal, but uh, like think with the virus, think pre-virus numbers and post-virus numbers for some sectors. They're very different, right? So the last thing you want is to make an offer on a business that's now worth 50% less because of what happened, unfortunately, in a lot of sectors. Um, but you don't want to be the one who's paying based on valuations that, you know, based on, I guess, numbers pre-virus. So you really need to make sure you're looking at um, all the latest numbers. Not getting to know the team and having those relationships formed, that's super important. Remember, you are now the leader. Um, those owner, those those employees, they need to feel secure for their job. So you need to be there and make sure that you're giving them that confidence. Because um, especially with acquisitions, there's a lot of acquisitions, especially when there was a strategic acquisitions from bigger companies, a lot of acquisitions ending up with employees getting fired. So you really need to reassure the team on what are your plans. And if you're going to fire people, fire fast so you can get back to work as soon as possible. And obviously, like that's the time to also stay honest and keep your word. So if you promise the seller, hey, I'm going to keep your employees, then, you know, kind of like, like, it's just a good lesson for life. Just be honest um, and, and, and take the right action. Um, and if you didn't promise that to him, then uh, just make sure that if you do something like that, uh, make sure that you do it um, in an honorable way with respect and you're helping all the employees as much as possible. Because remember, businesses, in the end of the day, we're here to, to add value to those uh, businesses, to those employees. So, um, if you have to fire people, unfortunately, um, yeah, just do it in a in, in, in a good way, right? Always respect them. Always try to help them find a different job. Like do it the right way. Don't be don't be an asshole. It's just a good life rule. Um, another mistake I'm, I've seen are just not learning enough about the systems, operations, and the suppliers in the business. For example, you know you don't know what's going on. You don't know what are the terms. Uh, you don't know if you can renegotiate terms or not. Um, and just overall understanding everything about your org chart, right? You want to know everything about the business. You want to know who's doing what. Uh, and basically making sure that, you know, that when you're going to be the owner, money is still going to come in to the business and less money is going to go out, right? You want to make sure that the business is going to bring you money and you're not going to find yourself in stressful situations. And, you know, you want to be almost obsessed uh, for learning, obsessed to be the master of that sector, to to make that almost, you know, or not almost, but make that your life work, make your, your life work to, to create a great business, to build a better vision, to have great values and beliefs in that business. Because that's how great businesses are being built, by having a leader with a great vision, that have great values, that have great beliefs, that share those beliefs and values with his team members. Everyone are going towards the same vision everyone know what they're doing, everyone have processes they follow, everyone have their own role, everyone have KPIs and accountability. So that's how really good businesses are being built and obviously providing great service and product um, to your customers. That's that's the way to do that. So yeah, get to know the team, get to know, build those relationships um, and, and make sure you know all the systems. Um, another problems that, that I've seen are just not having enough or just not having clear agreements with your professional advisors, right? So 
things like making sure your fees are set, you capped your fees, uh, you know exactly how much you're paying and when, um, you know like what are the terms, where the money is going to come in from, what's the downside, what's the upside, you know, what are the risks, like those are some things that you want to figure as soon as possible with every uh, professional advisor you're going to have in the deal. I'm not getting mandate um, on, on the bank account. I've seen people getting stuck because they basically can't access the cash in the bank um, because the owner left. There's no one to talk to. He's the only one with access to the accounts. So just make sure that you're prepared for those things and you know how to access the bank of that business or you're going to um, create and register a new bank. Uh, but yeah, it really depends on the business, really depends on the situation, really depends on the bank you're going to work with. Uh, what about the credit of that bank account, if that's going to help you or not. So there's a few ways to look at it, but you need to figure it out as well. Like, don't forget about it. Like, in the end of the day, it's a business. You want to get access to the bank. You want to have access to the cash in the bank, right? If, if there's obviously cash that, that is being part of the deal as well. Um, relying too much on banks and debt financing to close the deal. I've seen that as well. So, and also the timing to talk to those banks. Um, I've seen that problems as well. So people who start to talk to financial institutions and banks and investors only after they get the letter of intent signed and accepted. Um, but sometimes it's it's too late and sometimes you need equity and you're not prepared, you're not ready and the due diligence period and exclusivity is done and now you're left high and dry with nothing. So that's a big mistake that I've seen people or People are only relying on this source of capital or that type of deal and that's it. And then it's like, okay, if I'm done with, if I can do this, I can do a deal at all. That kind of attitude. Um, what I've seen and that I don't like is putting a penalty clause in an agreement. Uh, often what I found out is that the bad vibes just outweigh the benefits. Like people think that putting $20,000 penalty will do something. Uh, good luck suing them for $20,000 as well. Um, yeah, I wouldn't deal with it, at least depends on the deal size, depends on your risks, but um, something to pay attention to. Um, not signing exclusivity, I've seen that as well, right? So when you sign in, you're going into an LOI or an agreement in general, and you're starting your due diligence, and you're going to spend a lot of time and potentially money, um, and not just your time, but your advisor's time, and obviously it's also thinking about your opportunity co opportunity cost and where you're gonna put can put your time. Otherwise, in different places, um, and a lot of those mistakes happen when you don't sign exclusivity, right? Because the last thing you want is to have, you know, the seller within two weeks of you do or a month doing due diligence telling you, hey, I'm sorry, I just got a better offer, and you're not under exclusivity, so I'm gonna go with him, right? So you don't want competitors to shop for your deal um, at the same time, right? When you While you're doing due diligence, for example. So let's talk a little bit about a case study of uh, one of our guys in our university program, Suhail. He's a great, great example of a lot of grit and tenacity and, and attitude that I think can really, really help. Um, so yeah, he's just, this is a post that he posted on a second deal that he, done and is about to close his third one pretty fast i think it took him less than a year to close his third one so let me talk to him um, to you a few details about the deal so it's a hair salon plus you got a product line um, that's a business doing 750 a year in ebitda uh, in, in sorry in revenue 150 a year in ebitda so he built a board of advisors he got rejected a lot he found something one day before closing for financing so let me go through some more notes. So basically, he picked the sector and just got to work. He didn't care. He was like, okay, I just want to go to work. Um, I want to talk to people who are in their retirement age, people who want to retire. And for those of you who are going to buy the VIP interviews, uh, you're going to hear an interview with him uh, for, I think, around 30, 40 minutes or between 30 to an hour or something like that, where he's going through all the details, how he found the deal, how he negotiated the deal, how he financed the deal. And you'll hear like 90% of this, a lot of it comes down to your, you know, how you position yourself, how you talk, your mindset, your attitude. Um, his background is in sales, so that's helped him for sure. Um, and he said also in the interview that him focusing on small daily actions really helped him because that's built a domino, right? The momentum, like we said, and obviously he had all the support from us as well. Um, he had great finance people in the end of the day to help him close the deal and finance the deal. The way he found the deal, by the way, came from a broker um, as there are so many businesses in his sector. So he looked literally at like 
90 businesses in his sector before buying the first one. Um, he said that all were good businesses, but they were just not the good the type of business for him. Uh, he didn't like the processes in those businesses. And that's why it's so important for you to do the analysis, like we said, right? Um, he also said that the number one reason that he chose this deal and if there was just the motivation of the owner, he was really, really motivated. And you know how he knew that? He made the first offer, which was rejected, um, but the first offer was 50% of their asking price. And the fact that someone even still talking to you after you made a, an offer for 50% of the purchase price means that they're still willing to do a deal with you. All right, so think about it this way. Um, he also got rejected for his second offer. And he also felt at that point to understand how much they would be open to do some kind of a seller financing. And at the end of the day, he got accepted on his third offer. He also mentioned that he met the owner just once in face-to-face -face before um, for the offer. And what else? He financed the deal, 60% debt, 40% uh, seller financing. That's really interesting. He wasn't able to get financing from large banks and he had to make 1,200 phone calls, got rejected by 400 banks. Those are his words, right? If you get the full interviews, you'll hear that, but I'm just kind of like riffing through some of the summaries that I have here. Um, and also his personal situation is that he had or has no assets at the time of taking that loan. So the loan needed to be unsecured. He sent also 1,500 emails to get the deal done. Um, in terms of operations, uh, the seller will stay in the business for up to two years for one owner, that's one owner, it's, it's apparently partners, um, and six months for another. So you're going to have a great transition period to learn about the business. There's also an internal manager that's being groomed to run the day-to-day -day if needed. Um, and that can be, uh, he can get paid by um, obviously a salary and potentially bonuses and potentially even equity. You can incentivize those people very much. Um, you can even use some of those uh, potential manager as investors in your deal and bring capital to help you close the deal, right? His plan and goal is to buy more companies. As you see, he's about to close his third one. He wanna create, he's creating a roll-up basically in that sector. His plan is to sell um, at at least 20 million with the dream of possibly growing to a uh, hundred million dollar exit. I think he's on his way and I think he'll get there for sure. He also said in the interview that Daily meditation really helped him get in focus. So that's just to give you an example of what it looks like to be on that path, to go through that and do the work and get results. Um, but it's pretty exciting, no? So let's go to action steps. A action steps. So yesterday we re you reached out to hopefully 10, 20 business owners, 10, 20 brokers. So today let's get to the next level. Hopefully by now, you talk to the business owner, you talk to the brokers, you have access to financials, um, you've done your analysis, you looked at the angles, and now you're thinking, okay, what offers can I make, right? So this is the time to make an offer. Now, today we're just doing the 80-20, remember, I can expand on it a lot and we're expanding on it a lot in our university program. And some of you might be even thinking, hey, where's the financial model, where's the LBM, LBO model, or where's the discounted cash flow model to, to make an offer? Um, and maybe you're saying going to making an offer right now is crazy. It's too fast. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not sure. Da, 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 da. But at the end of the day, I wanted to keep it simple, guys. Like in the end of the day, if there is enough cash flow in the business to cover all the debt service, all the debt, basically all the liabilities that you have on the business, then that's a good deal for you. And if you can finance that, that's what's really important, right? Remember the example when Facebook bought Instagram? They bought it for a billion dollar company that did nothing in revenue. So what kind of analysis you think they did? They literally had to do random analysis, um, like take those, probably <laughs> send over those young poor anal analysts and told them, hey, go and find me a reason to justify why, we're, why you're paying a billion dollar for Instagram, right? But obviously now that business is amazing because they were able to create synergies and complementary um, services and platforms between those companies so and obviously the talent that they bought they bought amazing talent amazing developers so they knew what's their upside and that's how, that's how you want to look at things when you buy a business you want to think to yourself um, am i buying a business with enough cash flow does that cash flow going to pay all the liabilities and all the expenses that i'm going to have in the business 
if that's the case and we can get in go into ratios and we're talking about it in the university program but for now keep things simple like i want you to go out there and make offers remember when you're making offers it's non-binding you have nothing to lose right like you don't have any, even if it's someone telling you yes you don't have to go and close the deal you can always say oh you know what i don't want to do this i decided to go on a different route i decided to go on a different deal so we don't want to overwhelm you we want you to take action at this point like almost see it is just kind of getting temperature checks and seeing if there's even interest on the other side and seeing if you're even in the ballpark based on the offers we're going to teach you to make and yeah remember this is not legally binding right so just get your feet wet like worst case they will tell you no i'm sorry like don't make it bigger than it is like worst worst case they'll tell you no or worst 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 case they'll tell you yes then you can Change your mind and start to do your due diligence and get to work and close the deal. So here's how you do that. So let me walk you through a, a template for an offer that you can use. You can use a simpler version, but this is kind of what we're using uh, that is very simple and straightforward. The yellow parts are where you basically need to change the details based on your deal. As you can see, you can put your name, your address, your content details, the address of the seller, or if you send it to a broker, his uh, info, the date, dear name, Re, you can talk about the business name or just the overall sector um, and you can just go through it i'll attach the template here but basically you can see it's a very, pretty straightforward hey i'm going to buy x shares this is the total consideration this is the overall price i'm going to pay now the buyer which is you you will assume following liabilities yes or not all right and just just change it based on what makes sense to you and what you potentially talk to the seller um, about, right? So you're gonna put everything here. There's gonna be the total amount. Some of it is gonna be paid at closing. Some of it is gonna potentially be deferred. And here are some of the terms. So here, as you can see, 12, 24, so four years. And again, total numbers, right? So I can dive into the details of kind of like what it looks like. So remember, you inherit, at this point, you inherit some debts and that's why the numbers are a bit different. Uh, but yeah, this is how you make an offer. Um, you can also add some deferred payment that are contingent or on financial forecast that agreed between the buyer and seller. That's what we call an error that we talked about, remember? All right, so, so obviously if we reach X amount of milestones, they're going to get paid X and this is what's going to be the total. Da -da -da -da. We can even retain capital with the seller if needed, All right? If you don't want to buy 100%. And you can even attach the expression of interest from a financial institution or funding sources for you. Um, and obviously, you can add all those words. The offer is subject to due diligence, da da da. I trust this. So, this is kind of like a bit of an official way of doing it. You can do it this way, or you can make it even simpler and using your words. Again, there's not, it's not, it's not your Bible. It's just like, you know, go to work, do what's easier for you you can use your words you can use this template either works so this is what we've been through our journey so far you know we went through day one day two day three today day four right all about our overall method the deal flow deal analysis and deal execution all right we covered a ton like so much i hope I, I, like it feels like day one was was a year ago already um and tomorrow is going to be probably the most important piece because all of the work at this point won't matter or benefit you if you don't get what we're going to cover tomorrow. So many drop the ball right after the deal execution because they don't know how to get real wealth. And this is what tomorrow is going to be all about. All right, so tomorrow is all about lifelong momentum and wealth, how to be a real true acquisition entrepreneur. So tomorrow, we're also going to share a lot of case studies and stories from the trenches. I know a lot of you are excited to hear more stories like Suhail, like Boris Love. And plus, the most important thing yet. So let me explain. I just showed you the acquisition process, right? But that's not the end of the journey. Remember, there are three phases to this game. First one is just to become basically an entrepreneur from amateur to entrepreneur that's kind of like how i see the first step right then it's about how to become to get to a point from entrepreneur to wealthy right building wealth being kind of like top of the market best in your sector potentially a roll-up hiring a management team potentially even having your own internal m a team having investors speed 
um, dominate your geographic area many times, right? You're focused on making an impact on your team. You're creating jobs, you help people retire, you solve bigger and better problems at this point, right? When you're building wealth and you're at the wealthy stage. Um, and you can like move past the money problems for good. Money is not the issue at this point when you start to really build wealth. Um, it's a hard work, right? Don't get me wrong. It's hard work for you to get here. Um, and it's kind of like the time where you can make a decision. Do you want to put lifestyle first or wealth first? Um, and remember the sentence, you build wealth with concentration and preserve wealth with diversification. So this is still the time where you concentrate. And then that's the point where we're going to talk a lot about tomorrow, how to build that legacy, how to you know, get to a point where you can exit, you can diversify, you can diversify inside your business or outside, you can protect your wealth and exponentially expand your wealth, right? This is where you start to talk about impact, about legacy, about freedom, about service, making a difference, selfless action, right? This is the real step three, the legacy part of the of the road. Um, and this is the point when you understand that you can't really help anyone until you help yourself first, right? So remember those steps, remember what it looks like. So I just showed you how to reach step one, pretty much. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you how to move from acquisition entrepreneur to wealthy. And this is critical because if you don't preserve yourself for this move, as soon as you get your acquisition, it will be much, much harder to make. That's the point where you want to get you guys to the wealthy side. Some of you are here. Some of you are not here yet. Entrepreneur for me is someone who's running at least a seven-figure business. So if you're not here yet, you're basically an amateur, right? Without judging or anything, you're just like, you want to be an entrepreneur, real entrepreneur, have a seven-figure business. A business doing at least a million year in revenues. After that, wealthy, it's like, let's get to the point where you're having at least eight-figure year in business. Money is kind of like not the real challenge anymore. You have a lot of employees. You're growing. You're focused. Right? That's kind of like the place we want to get all of you as soon as possible. We're going to talk a lot about that tomorrow. And obviously, the legacy part, which is kind of like the next step. Um, so, we have to answer the question. What do you do after you own the business? Right? Plus, I'll show you exactly how to move those offers that you're making today forward. Right? So today, remember, we're making those offers. Go out there, make offers. Don't forget, make offers. Take the action. Welcome to day five. I really hope you're excited because in the last few days we've been learning literally the black box secret of the truly wealthy people out there. I hope you got some value so far and today we're going to continue with that. Um, obviously, if you didn't realize it yet, you are learning the most lucrative entrepreneurial skill in the world, period. A uh, quick reminder on housekeeping. If you want lifetime access to the challenge, just go to acquisitions.com forward slash VIP. Any question, email support acquisitions and don't forget to follow me on social media platforms. Um, and yeah, if you didn't yet, don't forget to share um, this challenge page in order to get access to uh, basically a real live investment deal that we're doing. Remember, your net worth is your network. So don't forget, even now, even after the challenge, you're going to have access to the group. So continue to engage and share and learn and ask. And the more engaged you are, the more better people you'll get connected with in that group. So go to acquisitions.com forward slash group if you didn't already. Now, let's go in the trenches today. So if you remember, uh, we were talking about three critical elements in the last few days to get acquisitions done basically, right? So we were talking about deal flow, we were talking about deal analysis, a bit about deal execution, and we shared with you the fact that if you have those three done the right way, that's how successful acquisitions are being done. And today is going to be um, a lot about case studies, real results, real deals, so you can see what's possible, right? So let's start with Boris Love. So here's Borislav. Um, this is kind of like his testimonial in our uni group. But let me share with you a little bit about his deal in general. Um, and even before that, let me just go through some of this, just so you see kind of like what, what was involved. So just, just to give you an idea on this guy, Borislav, he's a great, great guy. And if you're buying the VIP access with the interviews, you're going to see a 30, 40 minute or so interview with him where he's really going into the details. Uh, but his background, he, he used to be a truck driver and he came to us 
and eventually he purchased a very successful trucking company in Chicago. Um, I think, let me see if I have the numbers here. So it was a 13 million a year business that um, company that founded six years ago. He put nothing down um, and he worked hard to get this deal done. It took him six months from starting to work with us to get this done. He came to us, his credit score was bad. Um, he didn't know anything about acquisitions, but he learned how to find a deal, how to negotiate a deal, how to position himself the right way. Um, he also had a great team that we helped him hire uh, with accountants, lawyers, finance broker, and he was able to position himself as a, someone ex with, with enough understanding about business that came across as credible with the seller and that's what allowed him to close this deal without putting his own money. Um, so it's really, really exciting. Like, think just how long will it take you to start something like this from scratch, right? The company doing more than 10 million a year in revenues. Um, he's one of my favorite results and success stories because even if you hear my interview with him, um, as you can see, my English is not my first language, but in his case, it's even more um, seen and, and it's pretty pretty fascinating and exciting and sometimes i'm even surprised with some of the results that we're getting for people so um that's why i'm doing it it's really really fascinating and amazing and and you know it's a win-win for everyone for boris law for the seller for the institutions and financiers and banks and and investors and everyone and i think long term it, it, it's really really such an exciting opportunity for all of you to be involved in those deals so in a nutshell, it's a tracking company. Um, so he did $17 million the year before he bought it. Um, then when he purchased it, he did $13 million in the last 12 months. So the business numbers went down. Um, but that's what allowed him to get such a great deal, right? So it was $1.2 in EBITDA. EBITDA, uh, basically pre-tax profits, right? He didn't use a broker. So he found a deal using one of our strategies. Um, he created automation. He saw a lot of deals. Then he picked this one. He put nothing out of his open pocket, nothing. So some of the money came from institutions, some of it came from the seller, where they were able to structure a deal where the seller puts the rest of the money, basically. Let me talk to you about Cliff. He's another great, great story. So, yeah, so the situation with him, he owned a staffing company for over 20 years before joining us. And unfortunately, he lost 90% of the business due to COVID. Um, now he's looking at uh, purchased two businesses, making 1.8 million in revenues, uh, 450 in profits, and he bought it for just 1.1 million, basically just 2.4 multiple. Uh, business has grown up by 18% last year, um, and the owner was willing to stay for five years in the business. So that's super exciting as well. So just to give you kind of a few notes about Cliff, and we also have an interview with him. Um, I think the biggest thing for him, for me is that he came to us after the business went down 90%. His, his, his last business went down 90% uh, from COVID. So he had the motivation to go out there and do the work, right? He really had to go out there and replace his income, pretty much. Uh, at first, he was looking at like four or five different sectors. And then he decided, you know what? I don't care about the sector. I care about the numbers. So then he looked more about and he became what I taught you. Go and be sector agnostic if you're not sure. So he looked more about the size of the company, the motivation of the seller, the location, and focused on those things and the cash flow of the business, of course. Um, he found a great business. Uh, there was basically, he said there were two friends uh, owning those businesses. Um, and yeah, he was able to pay, really uh, pay, yeah, 1.1. Sorry, I'm just looking at and reminding myself about the notes from the interview I've done with him, but you can see it in front of you. Great multiple it's going to bring him after, by the way, after all, um, paying all loans and all that. He's going to take home like $300,000 in net income after that, which he can obviously take to himself. Obviously, he's going to pay himself some kind of a salary, an extra, because the owner won't need to be paid a salary because he's going to run the day to day right now. Um, so it's an amazing opportunity. He told us, look, man, like I remember he told me um, after we stopped recording the, the, the interview that, look, man, he told me I'm so grateful because, you know, this deal, without this deal, I wouldn't be able to, to make any money because my business pretty much, I had to shut it down uh, due to COVID. So those kind of stories are really getting me inspired to continue to do that. You know, um, when you are out there putting yourself online, you're getting good, good, good people who love you and also people who hate you. But I think that the hate is definitely worth it when, when I get people likely for going out there and really change their life with um, an acquisition. Um, so... 
yeah, he also had obviously an attorney, a, a CPA that that um, he's going to pay at closing. He paid at closing for this deal. Um, and the beauty with this deal is said that they're doing no advertising. So he, he is then able to create a new website and, you know, do some better marketing to grow the business even further. So that's the goal. His goal is to b- double the business um, as soon as possible. And then eventually his goal is to exit and sell within five years. We're going to talk about um, some exits today. Um, let me talk to you about Jeff. So Jeff did a $30 million, uh, $30 million a year deal. Let me see if I can move to the next one. Yeah, so oops, sorry. So that's Jeff's deal. Um, yeah, so publishing business turning over 30 million a year, um, was losing at first few hundred thousand dollars a year, um, big warehouse, some office included, both for 2.7 million, no money down whatsoever. He used family office, SBA and mezzanine financing, and now he's working on bolt-on acquisitions and it will improve profitability. Um, Jeff is now also, uh, one of our, um, members that help us with with uh, with our uni members um, with more information so yeah with, with with this business it's pretty fascinating so the seller dad actually started this business 75 years ago um, so think about the brand the, the legacy all that right um, and what's even more interesting is that they found the deal on a wall street journal advertisement so you know you can never know where you can get those deals from um, and as you can see in those notes, I'm just trying to see if there's something that in my notes that we didn't share in those bullets. But um, he also said he talked to more than 12 financiers before anyone was interested. So just to show you that if someone's telling you no, it doesn't mean that, you know, others might uh, might accept it. You know, if even if someone's telling you no, obviously you got to know how to position yourself when you talk to them. You got to know how to talk to them the right way. Um, said that the deal fell through three times. They were about to close the deal and they fell through until they found the right one. Uh, they used the family office that gave three million on closing. Um, they used kind of like a one day loan structure. Then they had to repay it back with a very nice interest uh, for the loan um, for that family office. Uh, they had pretty high legal fees because that's a pretty high deal, uh, big deal. And they paid all of it at closing from the business acquisition cash flow. So uh, it's all good. So those are type of deal sizes that are possible as well. I don't suggest all everyone to start with those deals, especially if you have no experience whatsoever in business. Uh, but when you have the experience and capabilities and you've done at least your first deal, then you'll find out it's the same process in every size of a deal. And, you know, if you have the skill set and you have the confidence, then you can go for larger deals as well. So that's Jeff. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about Suhail. So Suhail, as you can see, is closing his third deal right now, which is pretty, pretty exciting as well. So with Suhail, he bought a hair salon with uh, products, which you want to probably split into a separate business. It's a business doing 750 in revenues, 150 in EBITDA. Um, He also built himself uh, a a deal team where he shared 26% of the equity. We also have a great interview with him. He financed the deal using 60% debt and 40% deferred payment, which we talked about. Um, and he made about 1,200 calls to close this deal, just to show you what's possible. And working on two more deals right now. So it's pretty, pretty exciting to show you what's possible in such a short term. Um, he came to us, no business whatsoever. He just picked this sector because it was like, okay, let's just run on something. He cared more about the motivation of the seller He said that for him, it was super, super important to make sure the seller is motivated. His first offer was actually, two offers got rejected. So the first one, he actually made an offer 50% of their asking price. Um, Then second offer got rejected and third one got accepted. So just to show you again, what's kind of, um, you know, what's possible, what are the options and oh yeah. And I think we talked about well yesterday, but is a great, great example of, you know, what's possible. Just to show you some of it, it's just like understanding how to position yourself, how to structure things. Um, and it's just one, one, one deal example of some of our clients who are getting amazing, amazing results. Um, again, no one of those people came with, you know, years of experience in any business. Um, so it just, it's just amazing to see what's possible. You know, if you're committed, if you have the 
you're willing to be resourceful, you're willing to take action, because again, this is not a stay on the couch and become wealthy thing, right? This is go out there, do the work, be consistent, don't give up, and then those results are definitely possible. Let's talk about Lyle. So Lyle, um, yeah, so he's an amazing, amazing case study about someone who was able to do a supplier rebate, right? We talked about those. They gave him six figures in down payment. Let me go through that. So yeah, nine months, 87 businesses to find the right one. He bought a five-star restaurant with a bowling alley and 1.6 million revenues. Can be scaled to 2 million easily. Food supply vendor loaned him the money for a down payment, which we talked about. Uh, the business will pay him $30,000 cash a month. And Lyle is currently looking at 12 other deals. And for Lyle, he also was able to pivot his business um, even during COVID to make even more money because he did a lot of cool things with his space and he also was able to create uh, the delivery uh, side of things in the business that before that he didn't really have. So that's amazing to see as well. Let's talk about Alaric. So he had several businesses before in the online space. He acquired equity in businesses in exchange for service. And I'm using those testimonials specifically because those are the people that kind of like did similar deals to the deal structures that I shared with you in, in this program, in this uh, masterclass challenge, um, to show you that people can close deal this way, people closing deals this way, just in the, you know, same information, nothing crazy. So they, he got equity in businesses in exchange for his service. Um, he's turning around small e-commerce businesses and increasing their valuation and sells his shares to investors that's that's kind of like his process he's taking equity then resell it and refinance things back to investors um, his biggest skill sets are sales and marketing and he's using that to get equity in companies as well so those are a few lessons about some of our guys who get results that's what's possible guys if you're going out there you're committed you have the full process you know the nuances you're not afraid to make mistakes you have someone to watch your back so you can move faster you can get a seven figure deal done pretty fast. Like, and heck, even if it's gonna take you like some of those people that I shared here, like six, seven months, which we have people who close deals within two weeks, but I don't wanna share them here because I don't wanna make the norm. I don't wanna show you that, like, hey, everyone's gonna do that because you know, there's work involved. But if you're willing to be committed, I am more than comfortable to say that if you'll do the work, you can close a deal, at least one deal in the first year. And like I said, we have guys who close six, seven and 10 deals in one year. So, and again, go, go and look at our acquisition site. We have some great testimonials of some of those people, but here I wanted to share very specific ones to show you kind of like what's possible uh, with some of the deal structures we already taught you. Now let's talk a little bit about post deal wealth and kind of like, you know, what, what is our plan with all of this? So, Remember, our goal is to get you to be an entrepreneur, which is kind of like a seven-figure business owner, and oops, so entrepreneur to wealthy, and now the question is, what do you do after you acquire your businesses, right? So. We have to answer that question, right? What do you do after you acquire your own business or a few of them even, right? What's the plan there? We didn't really talk about it so far. What do you do with the business? Uh, what's your plan? Do you want to continue to grow it, sell it? I want to talk about some of those things as well because I know some of you are interested in that topic. So let's talk a little bit about post deal stuff. Um, so how to make sure the acquisition serves your future, all right? That's super important. Getting or keeping things running smoothly, that's super important making sure you're in the right seat based on your skills, your vision, uh, find areas of opportunity and leverage them. That's super important. And even more important is use the transition energy to shake things up, All right? So let's talk a little bit about that as well. So let's, let me expand on a few of those things, right? So after you bought the business, you made an offer, you do your due diligence, which you talk about, uh, you close the deal, you're not the owner. What is important? So in a, Based on my experience and what I've seen, uh, the most important things in business are, first of all, what I found out is that the business is very much a reflection of the owner. So show me a bad business, I'll show you a bad owner, right? So and what, 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 what's going on with the owner? What should you look in the owner? So usually it comes down to his vision, his values and his beliefs, right? 
So when you're the owner, you got to ask yourself, what, what are going to be your vision? What's going to be your vision? What's going to be your values? And if it's just like, hey, I just want to make more money, I'm sorry, but employees are not going to, you know, run after you um, with, with, with a lot of enthusiasm if your only goal in life is to make some more money, right? So your vision got to be about something bigger, about being the best in your sector, about connecting the world, impacting the world, empowering the world, or specifically your sector, right? About creating better health, better wealth, better like, like serving, having a business of serving others. That's how you really create an amazing vision with great values and great beliefs. And that's how you can really attract the best employees out there. That's the only way. Um, so that would be my suggestion to you. As soon as you go and own the business, start to look at yourself. Like what's your vision? What are your values? Where do you see yourself? Are you doing this just for money or you have a larger vision? Can you see something in your vision that you know, entail a bit of a service and giving back and, and impact. Because that's how real big businesses are being built. If you're looking at Facebook or Apple, their goal is not just like, let's make money, right? At least that's not the way that they attract great employees. They have larger vision. They want to be, you know, unique companies. They want to change the world. That's, that's kind of like their, their mission. Um, and that's how you need to look at things as well. If you really want to create great results in business. Uh, so when you go into the business, also start to look at the organizational charts. Think what, with yourself, what can you improve? What can you improve in the processes? What can you improve in the leadership that maybe, you know, wasn't there before? What can you do to make sure the employees are happy? What can you make sure to make sure that, to do that, to, you know, to talk to the employees, to make sure they have some development paths, to make sure that there's some kind of a way to, to ask if they're happy, the employees and the clients, right? You've got to check everything, everything in the business. Like you got to be the master. You got to find out every little nuance. You got to check every money that's going out of the business and, you know, ask yourself, what, what can we stop, right? Find the giraffe. You remember the giraffe story? You got to find the giraffe. Ask yourself, what can we stop? What can we negotiate? What can we defer in terms of payments? Where can we ask for discounts? Those simple things are super important and can make or break a business. In the end of the day, you want better cash flow situation in every business that you buy, even if everything is all right, if there's something you can improve, that's what you want to do. Business in the end of the day, there's no end point to a business. Business is all about constant improvement. So that's your goal as the owner as soon as you bought the business, right? So try to do all those improvements, improve your relationship with the processes, with your employees, with shareholders, with suppliers, with the, like figure out what's going on with the inventory turnover, with customers, like you got to do all those things, right? You got to figure out what about marketing? Are we doing something with the existing marketing base, right? Can we sell some different service or products or add more value to our existing customers? Can we look for maybe complementary services or maybe even complementary acquisitions and companies that we can buy that will help us grow this business faster, right? So you really got to ask yourself, what can we do? Marketing to become more profitable, to create better margins. Ask yourself those questions. Sometimes you've got to ask yourself, hey, what about the price of the product, right? Can we do something better? Can we outsource some stuff and save costs? Can we sell things that we don't need, right? Like, I don't know, think about office space. Do you really need an office space right now? You know, some simple things like that that can really increase your profits much more. And, you know, when you increase your profits 10, 20% for a business doing a few million year in revenues, that's a nice chunk of money that you can either take home or reinvest into other areas um, in the business to grow it even further, right? Um, think with yourself, what can, you do, what can we do better? Can we create a better marketing process, a better sales process? Um, maybe have different marketing channels. Can we increase the communication between our team members and create a better uh, culture? What about technology? Can we bring in softwares or maybe a advisor that will help us to you know, improve everything? Um, in the end of the day, you also need to ask, like, like you, there's only three ways to grow a business, right? Like, if you know Jay Abram, he's got this thing of, uh, you know, you can either get new customers or you can spend more in each, get customers to spend more in each transaction, or you can get them uh, to get back more, basically, on a, ideally as much recurring uh, period as possible. So that's what you want to ask yourself. What can you do to bring in more customers? What can we do to uh, do our best so every customer... Um, increase the order value, right? It's like when you go to McDonald's, it's like they immediately ask you, hey, do you want chips with that? What can you do to give them some, some extra chips, right? Or some extra product? Uh, what can you do to get them to come back to you again? Are those discounts, coupons? Like you got to think about those things. 
Um, so in the end of the day, when you're going into a business, you got to ask yourself, what can I do to bring in more profits, right? In the end of the day, business is about like, you got to ask yourself, what can I do to bring in more revenues or kind of like have less expenses, basically. And one of the best things you can do is sit with your team, because when you go into the business, at first, you won't know as much. Remember, by definition, the seller knows more about you, um, more than you about the business, right? So you got to come in and ask the owner, ask the employees and sit with them and everything that I just went through and much more. You can go with the employees and ask them, hey, what can we do? Go through line by line in the profit loss statement and the balance sheet statement and ask, and ask them, with them, build a plan together to improve everything in the business. That's the only way to grow a business. Businesses in the end of the day is about execution. It was about people. It's about having a great vision, great values towards the same, you know, everyone working towards the same thing and executing better than anyone else. Business is simple. I think people are really overcomplicating things and the more you can simplify things, the better your business can be. So really think about those things, right? Now, a lot of people ask me, what about um, exit? When should I exit or should I continue to grow the business? So it's kind of like the keep or sell question, right? Um, so there's a lot of ways to look at it. You can keep the business for more cash flow and future kind of like appreciation of the value of the business. Um, if you sell, um, you know, kind of like, you need to ask yourself, do you want to sell? What's your goal with selling? What are you going to do after you sell the business? Let's say you got yourself, uh, you know, right now access to seven figure in cash um, after taxes. Do you want to do that? Or maybe you want to continue with the business because that's your life purpose and your life work, right? Um, like if you look at some of the richest people in the world right now, they work not necessarily for money. They work because that's their life work. But you also need to remind yourself that if you sell a business, you basically earn yourself kind of like a few years of income, right? So you earn time. So you really got to ask yourself, what's your life work? What do you want to do in two years, three years, five years, 10 years from now? And maybe for some of you, the answer is, I don't want to sell a business. I just want to run my business and continue to grow it and make even more impact. For others, it might be, you know what? Uh, I, I'm just here for the money. I want to make some nice, whatever, seven, eight figures exit. I want to take it home and I want to live for my interest and, and kind of like live a super chill lifestyle, maybe. Uh, and what most of you are going to find out is that when you have that super chill lifestyle, it's going to get super boring really fast. And I know that because I've been there. So um, I'm asking you those questions because I wish someone gave me those type of questions years ago, right? When I had an exit and I had like the opportunity to either get money and kind of like have this kind of semi-retirement lifestyle, um, which led me to, to craziness, to boredom, to depression, to... You know, to like, like in the end of the day, we're the most fulfilled in life when we work, when we give, when we create an impact, when we grow, when we share, um, when we create. So I think those are better questions to ask yourself. Where do I want to create? Where do I want to impact the most? Um, you know, so those are, I think, some great questions to ask yourself. And again, there's no right or wrong, but I think it's great to ask yourself those questions and asking yourself, like, do you want to exit? Do you want to continue to grow by acquisitions? Do you maybe want to create a roll-up in one sector and buy more companies in that sector? Or maybe you want to create some kind of a conglomerate and just for fun, buy random businesses in different sectors. There's no right or wrong, but you got to know. If it's just money, I would tell you focus on one sector. Don't look into other sectors because in the end of the day, when you have uh, uh, one large company in one sector, it's going to worth more than uh, a conglomerate in terms of multiples of exits. So, uh, those are some, you know, kind of like overall general questions to ask yourself when you own the business on what's your exit plan. Um, there's no right or wrong, but you got to ask yourself those questions. Everyone here is in a different situation. Some of you think that when you will get X dollars of money, you'll be happy, you'll be fulfilled and everything's fine. But I can tell you, it's not the case. Like when you get there, it's like, if you're not happy now, you want to be happy then. So you got to find a way to be happy now, to be fulfilled now, to have an impact now. Um, to be of service now that's the best way in my opinion to to live this life is to to do something you not necessarily love but your own purpose you want a, a path that is a path of mastery where you have those ups and downs but you're doing it for a, a much larger cause than just your own pockets so yeah um so yeah what let's talk a little bit about buyers if you're doing some exit so when you exit a company um it can be people like you just people who want to buy their first deal or grow their business by acquisition um you know, can be anyone just want to look at new type of businesses or investments, um, can be financial buyers that are basically people who are just looking at 
uh, financial performance of companies and looking at numbers solely. There are strategic buyers, which are basically companies um, in that sector who have more uh, synergies and complementary services to your to your business. You can also sell to private equity firms, sometimes family offices, um, potentially even venture capital firms. So those are some of the people um, you can look for. Now, in terms of valuation, like I, I said a few times in the program, in the end of the day, business is worth what someone is willing to pay for it, right? Um, it, it, like, I don't care how many models or Excel sheets or discounted cash flow modules you're going to show me, you know, every other valuation model are just justifications for prices that someone was willing to pay, right? So, like, and again, think Facebook, Instagram, they bought Instagram for a billion dollar. Um, so what was the real valuation there? Depends who you're asking. What, what was it worth? back then depends who you're asking right so you, you want to ask yourself some of those things but those are some of the um, kind of things to be aware of um, in terms of how to increase your your exit price uh, some of the ways to do this is basically to look for a strategic buyer because they're going to pay more usually because they have some better upside when they buy you um, ideally you want to find few of them at the same time so if you're about to sell the business make sure you talk to a few of them um, like in the end of the day, the more you can reduce the risk for the buyer and show him, hey, there's no risk for you, the, the better it's going to be, the better is, the more he's also going to be willing to pay. Um, so the more products you have, the more services you have, the more customers you have versus relying on just one or two customers, uh, the more locations you have, the more, um, you know, the more you can show an amazing upside in the future for the business, the better it will be. The more uh, whatever proprietary tech or IP you have, the better. Uh, the less the business is reliable on one person, the better the more it will be worth. Uh, the more clean the financials are and there's a data room with all the files and maybe even audited financials, the more people will take you seriously and might pay you more. Uh, the better processes you have and SOPs and you know an easy way to basically replace all the employees, the more someone will be willing to pay. So those are some of the things you want to think about when you're about to um, look for an exit or optimize your business for more profits and growth. Um, and yeah, be prepared for those things. There's also the way of looking at growth by acquisitions, which, which I uh, mentioned in a bit. But basically, <clears throat> yeah, you can either grow by doing more acquisitions, by merging with someone else, by creating a bolt-on, which is basically a second acquisition to your existing business. Um, and when you do and grow by acquisition, you just always want to negotiate kind of like who's going to do what with the business that you're buying, right? So um, ideally, also look for similar values, culture, and personalities when you're looking for a business to buy because the last thing you want is, uh, like we said, to to work with assholes in, 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 in general, right? You want to work with good people who have similar values, who look at the world in a different, in, in a similar way. And ideally have similar vision as well. Um, yeah, so those are some of the ways to grow by acquisitions, right? It's either merging or growing and buying others. Um, you can also go for an IPO directly or with, uh, with a reverse merger. Uh, but this is outside the scope of this training. So if you understand the post deal wealth, like once you get to this point, you're really going to be able to get back your time. You know, like, you know, time won't be an issue for you. You'll get the business, money will work for you. You'll have either a team that's doing most of the work that you don't like to do. Um, like you won't work for money. Money will work for you and you'll have a team helping you with whatever you don't like, or you'll just sell the business and, you know, live from the interest. Um, but then again, coming back to going, like, what's your life work? What do you want to do? That's a really important thing, in my opinion. Uh, but you won't have money issues. Like when you know how to do the post deal wealth stuff, when you know how to grow by acquisitions, how to optimize a business and, you know, how to own business that, that's making you a nice, a nice amount of money each year that you can issue with dividends or even pay yourself a nice income. Like at, at some point, I think there is even nice studies about people that, that says like, I think, uh, what was the number? I think about 80,000 a year or so. Uh, people who make more than that are not becoming necessarily more happy. So you got to be aware of that if you're not there yet. If you're there yet, um, then you also need to be aware of that and to look for happiness and fulfillment outside of material things, right? Uh, I think for me, it was a big, big, big lesson in my life to not look for my value in the money that I make, but more in the value that I give and the impact that I have. I think that that's a much healthier way to live life in general and, you know, waking up and feel on, on purpose versus um, stressful for no reason. Um, but when you really know how to do the post deal wealth stuff, that's where you can really get back your time if you want and reinvest yourself in things that, you know, are really 
can make an impact, right? Can grow your your empire if you want to call it, or you know, you can even obviously spend time as much time as you want with the family if needed, and all though, and, and and so on. Um, but if you don't get this right, um, you basically acquired yourself um, kind of like a different bad job that hopefully is paying you something um, and you'll ultimately be trading time for money. I've seen even worse. I've seen people who trade and buy the, the wrong business. They bought a business that makes them, make them no money. They spend their life fortune of their own money um, and now they stuck with a business that's worth nothing and they need to go every day to that job. So you got to be really aware uh, that you know how to do this the right way. So that was a bit about uh, post deal wealth stuff. Now let's talk about action steps. So right now it's really decision time guys like you pretty much have few options at this point right you can either continue to gather information uh, but do nothing with it right nothing changes you accept what's going on with your life right now probably going to feel worse and worse because now you really know what's possible and you know things can get better um, but they won't if you want to step up if you want to change yourself if you want look at yourself as someone you want to be and not the person you are right now like at this point you know what's possible you can go back like you know you you took the pill you 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 know about the metrics stuff like like this is like, like you know it now you know what's possible you know you can buy a seven figure business pretty fast and you can't really get there from scratch you can't really get there by doing better sales better marketing like this is the way like this is the way where the real wealthy people are doing it and now you know it so like and it, again, it might feel like a huge risk, but to get massive rewards in the end of the day, you really need to step outside your comfort zone. You got to do things that feel scary sometimes, you know, that you're not used to do, that are outside your comfort zone. But to change yourself, you got to change the way that you behave. You got to change your identity. You got to change who you are internally first. And it might feel, you know, a bit scary. But ask yourself, like, like if you're hearing this challenge, I'm sure you thought for a second, hey, what would that feel like to buy that business? So that's what you need to ask yourself. What would that feel like to buy that business? What would that person that already owned that business that I just bought or about to buy would do right now? Would he step up? Would he be afraid? Or would he, you know, take action and be committed and be certain? That's what you need to ask yourself. Are you willing to be certain to get those results, to be that person that you see yourself that you can be?